Under this scheme, seed funding of up to 25 lakh rupees is provided to each beneficiary or supported startup based on the innovativeness of the idea, the novelty of solutions and strength of the team. These initiatives and efforts will transform our country into a software product nation and will help in economic growth and create ample opportunities for the youth. STPI is poised to catalyze the ecosystem in the decade of opportunities. The story of STPI is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and technological excellence. Together, we shall continue to shape India's tech future. As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question, how secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Tenable, the exposure management company, has launched a new platform that solves these underlying problems. The Tenable One Exposure Management Platform delivers visibility of cyber risks in a unified view and helps customers easily understand their unique attack surface. This helps them prioritize which threats to remediate now and provide comprehensive, easy to understand reporting for business leaders so they can make informed decisions, confident they have the full picture. Exposure management is the future of the cybersecurity industry. Tenable One enables organizations to operationalize both preventative and proactive security measures with ease. It's curing the disease of cyber risk rather than simply treating the symptoms. In addition to newly introduced capabilities, including the Lumen Exposure View, Attack Path Analysis, and Asset Inventory, the Tenable One platform combines the broadest vulnerability coverage, spanning IT assets, 
cloud resources, containers, web apps, and identity systems. The platform also builds on the speed and breadth of vulnerability coverage from Tenable Research and adds comprehensive analytics to prioritize actions and communicate cyber risk. As the attack surface has expanded beyond traditional IT infrastructure to include public and private cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications, identity, and more, our customers are faced with new and expanding challenges that we need to help them solve. Tenable One is that solution. Tenable's best-in-class vulnerability management capabilities make it the natural leader in the exposure management market. Through acquisitions and organic growth, the company has built the platform to help organizations across the globe secure their unique attack surfaces and focus on reducing cyber risk. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force and it gets some speed. Give it purpose and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change, momentum, bringing about intelligence and agility to cope with ever-changing business landscapes and expectations. Connecting global ambitions with local approaches and digital experiences with human perspectives. It's this Velocity that offers a car fleet management company wings and an aerospace engineering giant nimble feet. Or for that matter, it's what eliminates bank holidays in banking. And it's this very Velocity that's offering our clients the access to smart connections and the confidence to find fresh directions. But more importantly, the unique ability to outrun the present, to outsmart the future. Come, witness Velocity transform the way business is done. Zensar, think Velocity. Salt Lake Sector 5, or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital, is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of three kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Think Tank, which was one of the very first intelligent IT-empowered workspace in Sector 5 that revolutionized the landscape of the area and ushered in an era that raised the benchmark of infrastructure and brought in smart integrated business parks all around. A slew of cutting-edge smart green buildings with a futuristic design and robust engineering followed, such as Infinity Benchmark, Godridge Watersite, Infinity IT Lagoon, Martin Byrne Business Park, Merlin Infinite and Advance Infinity. Infinity Business Center is housed in the award-winning Benchmark and Godridge Waterside Building, having state-of-the-art co-working spaces at the heart of Sector 5. Fully furnished plug-and-play model, which is scalable at any point of time, Infinity Business Center will offer every single modern amenity and convenience needed by you to crack that million-dollar deal.
India, a land of innovation and technology, has witnessed a remarkable journey in the field of software development and IT services. And this transformational journey has been possible because of one organization known as Software Technology Parks of India, established on 5th June 1991 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. After merging three STPs, STPI has been instrumental in facilitating software exports and driving the growth of the Indian IT or ITES industry to newer heights. It provides a conducive ecosystem for software companies, startups and entrepreneurs, enabling them to thrive in a highly competitive global market. STPI provides statutory services, data comm services, incubation services, centers of entrepreneurship, next generation incubation scheme, BPO schemes, VAPT. To IT or ITES companies, startups, government and academic institutions. Over the last three decades, STPI has been providing single window clearance services to the software exporters, which has catalyzed the growth of software exports from the country. Due to the right policy measures and liberal style of functioning, software exports from STPI registered companies marked an exponential growth from 52 crore rupees in 1991 to over 7 lakh crore rupees in 2023. Likewise, from three STPI centers in 90s to 63 centers today, STPI has created 13.5 lakh square feet state-of-the-art infrastructure across country, out of which 8.1 lakh square feet is in Tier 2 and 3 cities, with five Tier 3 compliant data centers. STPI is implementing METIS schemes such as BPO Promotion Scheme and Electronics Manufacturing Cluster 2.0 Scheme. BPO Promotion Scheme was implemented to create employment opportunities for youth in Tier 2 and 3 cities. 246 BPO units have so far provided direct employment opportunity to 52,278 youths. EMC 2.0 Scheme for building a comprehensive ecosystem for electronic system design and manufacturing. Under this scheme, five projects have been approved with an investment of 20,819 crore rupees and likely to generate over 66,000 job opportunities for the youth. With the support of STPI, the Indian IT or ITES industry has provided excellent and cost-effective services to the international clients. This has enabled India to become the preferred IT destination in the world. This sector is one of the largest contributors to India's GDP, foreign exchange earnings and generation of significant employment opportunities to the youth. As the Indian IT or ITES industry has matured enough to move up the value chain, STPI has taken the lead in nurturing the startup ecosystem Pan India as envisioned under the Digital India Initiative and National Policy on Software Products 2019. STPI has envisioned establishing 25 centers of entrepreneurship, out of which 22 centers of entrepreneurship have been established in the domains like Internet of Things, Blockchain, Fintech, artificial intelligence, gaming and animation, among others. To support startups Pan India, Next Generation Incubation Scheme has been implemented from 12 Tier 2 locations. Under this scheme, seed funding of up to 25 lakh rupees is provided to each beneficiary or supported startup based on the innovativeness of the idea, the novelty of solutions and strength of the team. These initiatives and efforts will transform our country into a software product nation and will help in economic growth and create ample opportunities for the youth. STPI is poised to catalyze the ecosystem in the decade of opportunities. The story of STPI is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and technological excellence. Together, we shall continue to shape 
India's tech future. As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question, how secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Hello? 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 Madam, can you hear us? Hello? 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 Madam, can you hear us? Hello? Hey, Zoom to the watch. Not on mute. Hello? Customers are faced with new and expanding challenges that we need to help them solve. Tenable One is that solution. 
Tenable's best-in-class vulnerability management capabilities make it the natural leader in the exposure management market. Through acquisitions and organic growth, the company has built the platform to help organizations across the globe secure their unique attack surfaces and focus on reducing cyber risk. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force and it gets some speed. Give it purpose and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change. Hello. Madam, please unmute yourself. Oh, yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Do you want to level it up? Yes. Okay. Okay, madam. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Velocity. Salt Lake Sector 5, or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital, is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of 3 kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Th So good morning, everyone. So here we are at the 14th edition of the Bengal Chambers Business IT Conclave. And this is a precursor session. And we have uh, uh, Ms. Ili Ilana Golbin, uh, who's the Director, Emerging Technology and AI, Global Responsible AI Leader, PWC. She's joining from US, and she'll be speaking on the future of AI. And the session would be moderated by Mr. Prashun Nondi, partner PwC. So I believe Ilana is on screen with us. Hi, Ilana. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Hello, Thank everyone. You. So Prashun, I would Hi. request you to please join us on the stage and take the session forward. Thank you, Angna. And uh, a warm welcome to all of you here at the 14th edition of uh, this conference. Uh, we have an interesting day ahead, and uh, this is a precursor session to set the theme for the day. There isn't any doubt that uh, AI has started to touch our lives in various different ways. Industry has also found its way to embrace this emerging technology and embed AI applications into various products and services. Not just products and services, we have also seen in the recent years, uh, even a lot of industry bodies, industry uh, uh, you know, organizations have also embedded or adopted AI applications in their operations and sometimes also into their people management. 
There are companies who have emerged as disruptors based on AI-powered products and services. Uh, and, but then this is going on for some years now. And what uh, we at PwC calls it as like wave one of AI. This wave was hitting our shores over the last decade almost. Uh, while that is happening, in the last few months, we have seen something like tsunami hitting us called uh, GPT-4, chat GPT, generative AI, and so on with different names. This obviously has opened up a complete different dimensions of how AI can augment us humans at work. PwC have been working on AI and its associated technologies for the last several years, helping our clients to not only adopt these emerging technologies, but very importantly also realize their sustainable return a lot of times, AI gives you a sporadic return, may not be sustainable. So I think as consultants and practitioners of AI in the industry, we must look for a sustainable return given back on that investment, which is uh, obviously have a lot of doubts in people's mind to start with. And therefore, uh, PwC obviously has come up with a very robust AI governance framework and with this context, let me call upon today's speaker, uh, Ms. Elena Golbin. She is a director with our global PwC AI practice. Uh, she leads our global responsible AI practice. And she's going to speak uh, and give us insights about how the future of AI is looking like. Over to you, Elena. And thank you thank for joining you. us uh, from there. Thank you all for having me. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to join you and, and gr I guess greet you all into, into the hall for what I imagine will be an amazing day of, of conversation and sessions. I have some slides that I, I'd be very happy to walk through with all of you. As, uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, I, I lead our, our, uh, our firm in the space of responsible AI globally and I've been a practicing data scientist for over a decade for PwC, meaning that I've been uh, participating and seeing the the uh, evolution, the wave one, so to speak, of AI, but also know this new wave, that, this new wave that's certainly coming into a crescendo. So let me share my screen, and hopefully this comes through within the system that you all have, and you can see it. Please let me know if you can not see my screen. What I was hoping that I would go through with you all today is a little bit of a brief primer on what generative AI really is in the context of our other artificial intelligence applications. Um, clearly, you've all had an opportunity to play around with some form of it via ChatGPT or pick pick your web-based version of choice. But there are many different applications that fall into this. And um, there is a little bit of a danger here as well where we, we need to really understand what this technology can do for us so that we can identify the appropriate use cases. And there certainly are many in, in the connectivity space and the security space uh, use cases that would be relevant to all of you. But Moving forward with any type of emerging technology requires us to appreciate the, the risks associated with them and how we develop robust governance processes. And so my hope was to go through some of that with you as well. Now, we don't have a lot of time together. So moving to, to the first page here, um, it, it, artificial intelligence broadly as a topic has, has actually been around for a very long time. Uh, it, it's not new. It's definitely not even 10 years old. It's much, much, much older than that as a discipline. Um, but what we typically talk about when we think about artificial intelligence systems are machine learning and deep learning systems. That was prior to six months ago. Uh, machine learning and deep learning systems are uh, structures that allow us to uh, learn off of an awful lot of information and define effectively a series of rules or patterns that computers can then make further decisions on. And those have been uh, becoming increasingly more powerful over the last decade that I've been involved in this space because of uh, better access to compute, because of more and more data that we've been collecting. Think of all of the sensors that have been deployed everywhere or all of the data that we've been migrating to data lakes in order to access for having more consistent information about individuals, about products, around services. 
Um, but there's also been a very active open source community and a very active dialogue um, to share ideas, share patterns, share code, which has really accelerated the adoption of this space. And again, the computing piece of this cannot be um, uh, underemphasized. It's been a significant benefit to the, the rapid uptake and the rapid increase in performance of these systems. Deep learning really differentiates from machine learning in the sense that its, uh, its architectures are best suited or better suited for unstructured data, text, audio, sensors. These are our data sources that were very difficult to make use of with more traditional machine learning or statistical techniques. These, um, these innovations though have uh, produced the baseline of what we see in the generative AI space. It's because of all of these innovations that we now have these class of technologies that are um, enabling us to create new content, new information um, off of information that's provided. The other big dis uh, distinction or differentiation we've seen around generative AI, especially over the last six months, is that these systems have been now designed in such a way that anybody can really use them. Whereas the previous incarnation of, of artificial intelligence systems were really the domain of data scientists or, or very deep technical practitioners. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting because when I reflect on, uh, we mentioned GPT-4 earlier, but when I reflect on ChatGPT, when it was first released, I'll, I'll admit that I didn't think it was a very big deal because the model itself had actually been around for over a year and we had been working with it already. So I didn't think that, oh, cool, you put a chat interface on top of it. What difference is that going to make? But that uh, that reduced such a barrier to friction, such a barrier to entry for individuals, alleviated a lot of that friction, and now um, it's a lot more. This technology is a lot more accessible, which allows us to become a lot more creative as well when we think about what the use cases might potentially be. So I just wanted to provide some of that baseline before we started to talk about what some of the use cases might actually look like. Uh, I, I do think it's important, given some of the the, the discourse around these technologies, to really emphasize that. Uh, generative AI and artificial intelligence. Actually, I think artificial intelligence is somewhat of a misnomer because these models are not actually intelligent. They don't actually think. Uh, they're just very good at parroting and reproducing content or information that we give them. Uh, basically, they are trained on how we speak, on how we write, on how we, um, how we interact and engage, and they are trained to replicate that. Um, and we've seen amazing use cases that have already been um, incredibly impactful for organizations in, in all spaces. Um, Text-based use cases are the ones that seem to get the most um, uh, 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 press, mostly because a lot of these generative technologies are actually our language models. They use our natural language in the form of a prompt, and then that prompt is used to then um, provide effectively instruction to these models to do something, uh, which is why there are use cases around contact centers or um, or summarization or um, other types of, of question and answering within that text space. Uh, code is another area where we've seen a lot of uh, incredible innovation and uptake. Uh, actually, one of the, the first generative AI models that I was really excited about was one of the first versions of Copilot, which was released for programmers to create code blocks for us. Um, basically, you would type in, I want a Python script to do A, B, C, and D, and it would generate a script. It wouldn't be perfect. It's actually far from perfect, but it provided a really good first start. And generally, I think of generative AI as a really good first draft creator. Um, rather than a full automator, it's creating a first draft of something that we can then use. So code is an area where we've seen a lot of organizations starting to adopt some of these technologies. Um, in the image space as well, that I think there, there are so many use cases that we've seen from a marketing perspective. Um, and then data is also going to be an interesting one. Um, data is very imperfect. As, as you know, um, we, we don't have uh, often very complete information. Sometimes data is incredibly sparse or really, uh, really dirty, not well suited for, for specific types of techniques. And there's been a push to utilize generative technologies to, to help with that, to fill those gaps, to um, allow us to interact with data in a way that we haven't been able to before. So all of these are very exciting use cases and at varying different degrees of maturity. Um, something that that um, person mentioned earlier, which I think is really important, is the ROI of, of these technologies. So really thinking about what the value is that we need to be getting out of these systems that um, uh, that rationalizes the investment that we're going to be making in them. And 
therefore, we've seen a lot of organizations prioritizing use cases that follow specific types of patterns so that they can see some more repeatability or reusability around them. Meaning you have a lot of documents you have to process and summarize. There's a, that's a pattern that, that emerges. Um, a repeatable process to then process documents, extract information from them, summarize them, and potentially put them in a reporting template. All very exciting stuff. But generative AI is, um, is, is, is you know, it, I think it's one of those technologies that seems like, at least right now, it has a lot of potential to Im impact us in our in our daily lives, not necessarily in our work lives, um, in spite of some of the use cases I had on the previous page. So just thinking about what some of those use cases might look like for for um, for you guys in the audience here, a few listed on, on the page. Um, in the cybersecurity space, there have been um, organizations that are, are testing how to use generative AI to come up with different types of uh, threats and attacks that they would want to test their systems against. The counterpoint to that is it's also a lot easier for malicious actors to use these technologies to create these types of attacks. So this is a, a, an interesting space to see evolving. Um, another one that I'll point out here is uh, this, this uh, notion of using generative AI to create much more immersive experiences. We already have um, augmented reality, virtual reality headsets where we're doing a lot of work in, in extended reality. So really trying to create truly immersive experiences with generative AI, we can now create agents that are more adaptive and more personalized to even our more basic or, or um, uh, more simpler reactions. So if you make a slight movement with your arm, well, can you create an entirely new backstory to an uh, some type of an agent that you're interacting with in a VR space? That That's pretty cool. Definitely something that is being explored right now. But again, I think some of the, the best um, the best use cases for generative AI are allowing us to interact with technology just using our natural language. Um, and that's typically been a significant barrier uh, for, for many is uh, really trying to translate what they're trying to do into instructions that um, are interpretable by a machine. And this type of a technology does alleviate a lot of those challenges by allowing us to engage in natural language with those props. Um, there's a, an interesting space of of uh, um, research and training as well called prompt engineering, which is really uh, a, a thread to try and um, upskill individuals, domain experts, not necessarily technical experts, but domain experts to speak the language of a generative AI even better so that we can get better results, better uh, interactions out of these systems. Uh, and that's that will certainly continue to evolve as well. Much of the other use cases in, in the connectivity space tend to fall into the more traditional AI um, universe. And I do think it is important to uh, recognize that in a moment where we are right now, a lot of the generative AI use cases or generative AI technologies uh, seem extremely promising, but they might also be overkill for some of the use cases that we have. So it is an important time for us to take a step back and think about what is the problem that we're really trying to solve? What's the opportunity that we're trying to achieve? Um, and how? what technology will help us get there uh, in the fastest way, in the most reliable way, and in the, the least risky manner? Um, so I, I sometimes like to say that generative AI looks like a very sparkly hammer for all of the nails in the room. It's, it, it's not going to solve all of our problems. It's an incredible tool that we've added to our toolkit, but other, other technologies, other techniques are still incredibly valuable and still have significant uses for us. Um, and, and in many cases, I think the simpler, the better. It's easier to govern, easier to oversee, uh, also easier to explain how these systems operate. So something to keep in mind, which gets me to this, uh, this topic of responsible AI. Um, I've I, I care deeply about building systems that are, are reliable and can be trusted. Uh, I, I firmly believe that if we don't uh, if we don't implement effective governance processes, if we don't have structures in place to oversee our our systems, all of our technology, we don't think about how things could potentially go wrong, um, and we don't uh, uh, we don't devise practices for effective monitoring and testing, then systems are doomed to fail one at some point or another. So a responsible approach is really necessary in my mind to building reliable, repeatable, reusable, sustainable systems in every sense of the word. Um, it, I, it's almost a, equated to how we have seatbelts and brakes and cars, which allow us to actually drive faster. So 
having an effective governance process, thinking about how we how we um, oversee technology allows us to move forward. Part of that is by enabling a structure for um, balancing risks and rewards associated with technology, evaluating that trade-off. That trade-off is going to be different for every organization, for every different system. But having a structure to consider what's my opportunity, where's the real value of the system, um, how can I achieve that value, the ROI, which we just talked about, and then also what are the corresponding risks, and is there a pathway for us to move forward as an organization that's repeatable and justifiable. One of the, the newer risks that we see in the generative AI world that we haven't really seen before is that the technology is so widely available and moving so quickly, the scale and the speed is much different than what we've seen before. And a lot of organizations um, have to rethink their governance practices to accommodate for that speed and that scale. And that is um, certainly a new um, a new aspect for, organ for, for many of the organizations that we work with. The other aspect to that is um, when you transition from a more specialized workforce that interacts with technology to um, a more democratized workforce that interacts with that technology, there is a potential for misinterpreting what the technology can really do. And that that type of a, um, of a risk requires there to be effective training processes in place and other types of mitigants to help us uh, uh, alleviate some of those challenges. Generative AI is a creative technology. It's not perfect. It doesn't work well in all circumstances. Um, it's not a, a fact-based engine that will always give you a right answer, but sometimes information is presented as if it's um, authoritative, and that could lead to misinterpretation or misunderstanding of, of what you're really getting out of these systems. Um, there have been an unfortunate number of instances where uh, in, in incredibly incredibly public ways, uh, individuals and organizations have learned that these technologies sometimes make make things up. And that's not um, a flaw. That's a part of how these systems are designed. We have to use them appropriately, though, so that we can mitigate those risks. And an enterprise-wide governance framework helps us devise those practices. We we have to think at the highest level, what's, what's the strategy of the organization and its use of technology, including artificial intelligence? What policies, practices, and ethical principles fall out of that, that strategy? Governance has to be aligned to an organization's strategy. Otherwise, it's it's not going to have teeth. It won't be effective, and it won't be viewed as, um, as a critical piece. Um, you know, the, From there, we have to think about what practices or governance structures need to be um, developed, and then ultimately how that translates to the technology choices that we make. So if I, I, I kind of zoom into this a little bit more, uh, the way that we see some of these responsible practices evolving are by uh, equipping us with standard methodologies for determining what interpretability and explainability, for instance, looks like for a specific system. In the context of one particular model, one particular system, who do we need to explain that, that system to? What's an effective explanation? And how do we yield transparency that supports effective decision making. And that follows through to all of these other factors that you see here. Uh, bias and fairness, what does that mean for the system? We know that a lot of these technologies are trained on public data sets or data sets that are drawn from primarily the internet, which is not always the friendliest or most representative place. So how do we think about how that translates to the performance of these systems when we talk about people, as an example? Uh, or safety, uh, we're increasingly pushing for artificial intelligence and more broadly algorithmic decision-making to become embedded in physical devices, which means that there are risks in the physical world, not just in the digital world. What does that mean? How do we mitigate those risks? What are those What are those that we can, uh, 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 safety concerns that we need to mitigate in which systems to what degree? Um, I was just at I was I had a massive delay and I was stuck in JFK, which is a New York uh, a New York based airport, and they had this um, automated machine that was going by and cleaning the floors, and it paused every time it approached a person. So there's clearly some type of a sensor in there that that um, it detects the people and people's movements, and it would beep very loudly until the people moved or or um, or it could find a way around it. That's a safety control that was implemented for this type of a system. What are the uh, analogies of that or the, the the parallels that we can draw to other technology that we're building that has real implications in physical spaces? 
And a lot of this to me comes back down to having standard processes for how we think about what this what a system is expected to do, problem formulation. What does good look like? Do we have metrics that we want to evaluate against? Do we have success criteria? How are we thinking about uh, what what it would mean to have this this thing operate um, on our behalf for us or with us on a specific use case? Can we articulate that? If we can't articulate that in in fairly concrete terms, we're likely to build systems that at some point in time will miss the mark. So all of this is important to think about. And a governance process is intended to uh, orchestrate these critical decisions, incorporate the appropriate people, streamline decision-making and make it repeatable, justifiable, so on and so forth. So I know we're we're getting up on time, wanted to um, leave with a few thoughts and then potentially open it up for conversation. But uh, for, for those of you in this room, I think there are a few elements to take away. One is that uh, there, there are risks to technology. We talked through quite, you know, quite a few of them, um, and many of them will express themselves in different ways for different use cases. But it, given that we're in the connected services space, we're, we're working a lot with uh, in, uh, sensors and embedded devices. Uh, that means that we are deploying devices to collect information in largely three-dimensional spaces in the physical world, uh, which has a lot of positives in terms of using that data to train effective models, but it also lends itself to questions about um, surveillance and how that data will be used and whether or not we have the appropriate uh, privacy or, uh, privacy protections or permissions to use information, especially when it touches people. So think about that when we're thinking about how we want to leverage sensors for data collection. It's certainly possible and we see that in many spaces, uh, but again, with the appropriate types of protections. And then that lends itself as well to the explainability piece. Um, how do we build trust in the systems that we're building? Is, is, is it sufficient to have an explanation? What types of testing do we need? Who needs to have a, a, to be told effectively that there's a model or that their data is being collected or data is being used in a certain way? Um, it, so much of this is also cultural or so, so socially dependent as well. What are people's expectations? What are our community's expectations? for the use of technology. So that's something to, to think about. How do we want this technology to serve us best? And then when we think about the use cases and making, again, this tech work, um, can we think about where it makes the most sense to incorporate this technology in the lowest risk way with the highest amount of potential? So would you take it over, Prashant? Hmm. Hmm. I think technology has uh, come to its terms. Uh, uh, of course, we were hearing very interesting uh, perspective. She has joined? Oh, thank you. Let her complete. I apologize, everyone. I think I, I cut out. I'm not sure where I where I broke up, but um, th thank you all for for having me. Yeah. Yeah, Ele Elena, we just lost you for the last two minutes. Uh, I'm hoping that you're doing the closing statements. Yes, yes, yes. I I was just leaving with a few a few thoughts. Hopefully, you all saw that. Um, 
uh, you know, just just think about what the appropriate use cases are that make sense. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I think, thank you all for having me and, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, um, I think we heard we heard about the different forms uh, of AI from from its initial days of artificial intelligence to machine learning to deep learning and now uh, this new uh, technology called generative AI. And we have also heard from her how some of the global organizations are leveraging them. Uh, PwC in India also seeing a lot of Indian companies are taking giant leaps to adopt and embrace these emerging technologies. Apart from, the, apart from some of the new age uh, uh, tech powered companies that we have seen coming up as startups or otherwise, there are sectors uh, like the FinTech, HealthTech uh, and few others are obviously being an heavy adopter of AI and technologies like this. And as she said, you know, AI applications are, are quite embedded. It forms an interaction layer for the users to interact with a plethora of technologies behind the scene uh, while AI tries to put up another layer on the top to give you that bit of intelligence output. Uh, we have also seen how the consumer goods are quickly catching up uh, in the market with this, these technologies. Manufacturing firms have started also realizing a lot, lot of benefit from these digital transformation programs that are powered by AI machines. Uh, and we are going to talk a lot more during the day about the connected services and the communities. Now having said so, uh, many of these initiatives that we see are practiced in the, in the industry today are backed by the traditional AI forms like the ML and the deep learning. The wave two of AI has created a renewed interest, no doubt, in the Indian industry with generative AI becoming a boardroom agenda for many, many organizations. That is what we are, we are seeing and hearing. However, uh, many of these organizations are in the state of exploring the right use of this particular technology. There are many organizations which are doing pilot projects, hoping that some of these pilots will actually take a shape that is going to deliver them the results that they are waiting for. But as Elena alluded that we need to find the right balance between the risk and the opportunity. No doubt there is, there is opportunity, but at the same time, it also brings a lot of risks that we need to be aware of, act on it, and hence a governance framework becomes extremely important. We all understand that generative AI is going through a phase where uh, some of these security and reliability related questions remain unanswered. However, we still feel that it is only a matter of time when the techies will find all the answers to the satisfaction of the board and AI will become even more prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, thank you, Elena, for joining us uh, from the US and giving us a lot of insights of what uh, we are doing in this space. Uh, thank you, thank you, BCCI, for inviting us. Uh, and thank you all uh, for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prashun, for not only moderating this session, and of course, uh, Ilana, thank you for, you know, from different time zone, coming out time and joining. We really appreciate. And uh, we have a small token of appreciation for Prashun, as he is at the venue. Uh, so I would request our president. Uh, Mr. Shubhi Chakraborty to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Proshun Nondi, partner PwC. Thank you, and I would request my colleagues to change over for the next session. So this is the formal opening session. We have with us our chief guest, Sri Rajiv Kumar, IPS, Principal Secretary, Department of Information Technology and Electronics Government of West Bengal. With him, we will have on the stage, Mr. Shubir Chakraborty, President of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and MD and CEO, Excite Industries Limited. Mr. Arnob Basu, Chairperson, IT Committee and Senior Vice President of the Bengal Chamber and Advisory Leader, PwC India. 
Mr. Ranganath Sadasiva, Chief Technology Officer, HPE. Mr. Shanjay Kumar Das, Managing Director, West Bengal Electronics Industry Development Corporation Limited. Dr. Chironji Bhattacharya, Co-Chairperson IT Committee and Chairperson IT Entrepreneurs and E-Commerce Committee, the Bengal Chamber. And CEO and Director, Wiser Tech Informatics Private Limited. Uh, we'll be joined soon by Mr. Surinder Kumar Gupta, Chairman Come Managing Director, MSTC. So I would request Mr. Shubhi Chakraborty, our President, Sri Rajiv Kumar, Principal Secretary, Mr. Arnub Basu, Mr. Ranganath Sadasiva, Mr. Shanjay Kumar, and Dr. Chiranjay Bhattacharya to please join us. And I believe Mr. Gupta is close to the venue and he will be joining us very soon. So the part A of the opening session is with our chief guest, Sri Rajiv Kumar. And part B of the opening session is the CEO's roundtable with Mr. Gupta, Mr. Sadasiva, and Mr. Das. I now request Mr. Shubit Chakraborty, our president, to please deliver the formal welcome address. Sri Rajiv Kumar, IPS Principal Secretary, Department of Information Technology and Electronics, Government of West Bengal. Mr. Ranganath Sadasiva, Chief Technology Officer, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, India. Mr. Shanjay Kumar Das, MD, West Bengal Electronics Industry Development Corporation. Dr. Chiranjeev Bhattacharya, Co-Chairperson, IT Committee. Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. <coughs> My colleague on the <coughs> Bengal Chamber Core Committee, Mr. Arnob Basu. Participants and dear friends. <coughs> on behalf of Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it is my pleasant task to welcome you all to this very meaningful summit, which is the Business IT Conclave 2023. The theme of today's address or today's summit is Connected Products and Services Transforming Business and Competition. IT or IT-related activities have taken a different kind of hue in the last decade or so, particularly with the digital revolution which has taken place globally. I do not think there is a single person out here or anywhere else who has not been impacted by this revolution which has touched our the very core of our lives. To me, IT really affects us in multiple ways, particularly in a business context. And I will restrict my observations to business because today's meeting is about business IT. The first thing it does is it drastically increases the efficiency of the system. Wherever you apply, wherever you digitally uh, apply any digital or intervene digitally or adopt any digital means, first thing it does is it increases your efficiency. So right now, the difference between a leader and a company which is not in a leadership position is essentially a function of the adoption of IT in the system. What it does is it throws open huge avenues in terms of cost reduction, in terms of other efficiencies which you can build into the system. Next thing it does is that it increases your reach. And this is not limited to the business sector alone. As we all know, 
IT has really impacted the social sector in terms of delivery mechanisms to the last denominator in our economy. Today, the various government programs which are implemented centrally or even at the state level, the delivery mechanisms are all enabled through the Aadhaar mechanism and so that the person who is supposed to receive the benefit receives it in full measure and receives it instantaneously. So this is a big change from the earlier system in which the incentive or the benefit used to traverse through multiple hands with possible leakages in between. The other thing that IT does is that it causes an information explosion within whatever system you adopt uh, IT. To the extent that once you have fully adopted any, any kind of digital intervention, you really do not know what to do with so much of data. So there is a need to organize this data and to actually understand as to which data is relevant for which person. Otherwise, one can get totally, uh, you know, drowned with the kind of data which is today available at the granular level. Because once you implement any of these uh, systems, uh, there is no dearth of information. Whatever information you want can be on your table. You can make whatever dashboards you want. The difficulty is sometimes we get so overwhelmed by this data, then we suffer from analysis paralysis. So it is important to organize this data in meaningful patterns for relevant hierarchies so that uh, decisions can be taken effectively. The latest thing to impact this particular arena is the generative AI, which has been the topic of discussion uh, not only across boardrooms, but also at the individual level as well. Uh, there is a lot of fear psychosis around what to do with this genie which has suddenly come out of this bottle, whether to you know, work with it or to put it back into the bottle, and how does one treat it, what happens, how does it impact the education sector? How does it impact the business sector? So a lot of questions now and not enough answers. But I'm sure as we you know, traverse this path, we should be able to utilize this effectively uh, for our own good. Now, what all this is doing at the macro level, I think we need to understand is that in terms of job creation and job av availability, what all this will do in the future 10 years from now is the character of jobs which will be available in the economy, that is going to change drastically. A lot of repetitive jobs, even in the IT sector, like writing codes and so on, may be taken up by AI. And different kinds of jobs at a higher skill level will be available. So therefore, I think it is important for us to appreciate at a macro level as to what this will do and then accordingly design our curriculum, our courses, and the way we impart our education so that we do not have a mismatch between the talent which is available and the talent which is required. In any case, I think, uh, thank you all for coming here, and I think all of you must be looking forward to very meaningful discussions today. And we have a galaxy of uh, panelists out here who are very knowledgeable on the subject, and I wish you a very, very engaging morning and afternoon ahead. Thank you. We now request Mr. Rajiv Kumar, IPS, Principal Secretary, Department of Information Technology and Electronics, Government of West Bengal, please deliver the inaugural address. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chakravarti, 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think uh, the, you heard the precursor event and also the talk of Mr. Ch Chakravarti. It was basically revolving around AI, if I could say. Although he talked about, he raised certain points about the IT, which could easily apply to AI. He said that uh, there are, uh, all of us are impacted by the IT. There is no one. And in a couple of years, there will be no one. And even now, no one who would not be impacted by the AI. So that seems to be the uh, new keyword. But uh, I will slightly elaborate and elaborate in a sense that we can have a forest view rather than a tree view. So uh, if we go back to the, the, uh, the title of the precursor event, it said future of AI. I would like to say we should rather think about future of mankind in the age of AI. So that's the, how, do, how do we perceive ourselves in the age of AI rather than what the future of AI. It is going to be there. We just can't uh, fight with it. Its time has come. So it will be there all around us. So uh, as I was saying that let's have a forest view rather than a tree view of it, what does it mean? It basically, if you see around half a billion year ago, there was a, uh, 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 four billion years ago, there was a Big Bang, as they say, and the half a billion year ago, there was a, a Big Bang of a species. And the most accepted theory is that it happened because that time the, organi the biological organisms, like the amoebas, they started developing eye. So that development of eyes kind of exp uh, the, the preys started looking at the predator. They started to, and there, there was a, a big bang of species. The species multiplied of dif and the different kind of species got generated. That's one of the most uh, accepted theory. And uh, Around uh, when the Homo sapiens were coming of age, the issue was that they started learning a formal language compared to the other. Uh, they were able to communicate in a better way. There was a formal language. They were a, instead of a sign language, or it was a, uh, or it was a very uh, language which the animals use. There was a shifting of these. These two things. They say the first was a uh, big bang of species, and second was this learning of language, formal language, where they could communicate with each other, they could plan better, they could move better, they could transfer cultural values to next generation. This all started. Now, as we stand today, after November 22, uh, 22 that generative thing which we saw, a generative AI thing, uh, this chat GPT and all, when we saw the power of large language models, people are saying that the computers have now eyes and have started understanding the language as they understand. So these are the two things they are trying to see in a evolution pattern, which the the how the planets have come and how uh, the, how the, uh, the life evolved on the planet and how the computers, the machines are intelligent. So now we have to live with machines which can see. It's not seeing is not taking a photograph. They can understand if there was a photo taken of this room. The, comp the machine would be able to tell that there is some kind of conference going on. So it's not uh, they are just seeing the picture, they are able to understand the picture. The, and uh, chat GPT, we all know, not only chat GPT, the other uh, things with BERT and all, we are able to communicate and it's uh, like there used to be a Turing test, all people would know that how would some, how, when we would classify the machine as an intelligent machine. They used to say, if you could talk to it, if you could say something, it could reply, and you couldn't make out whether there is a human sitting behind that uh, curtain or there is a machine, then it's an intelligent machine. I think it passes all these large language models pass uh, these tests by, uh, they're, they're just, uh, you can call them intelligent in the Turing's uh, way. Now, as I was saying, that future of AI, the AI will reach its potential, its full potential. There is no, let's not kind of uh, think that we would be able to restrict it, we would be able to regulate it. Let me also touch on the point of regulation. You see, the, some of us are saying that maybe uh, the regulation, uh, like we uh, were able to regulate the nuclear uh, weapons, we would be able to regulate the AI, but we must understand that uh, there, for this AI, this basically this all this, uh, 
AI is a part of that machine learning thing. So there are two uh, phases. One is a machine learning part, the training part. Another is a usage part. When a model is there, you can use it. You can you can kind of you can make out whether it is a good model or a bad model, whether it is a biased model. It's not a biased model. You can you can regulate that product. You can regulate, but training. If somebody wants to train it for a bad behavior, bad this thing, it's difficult because it's not like a, there is no enriched uranium here that you could control the supply of enriched uranium and ensure that there are no nuclear weapons. The, the, the training happens on the GPUs and TPUs, which are uh, many millions of them are already in the uh, this thing, are uh, in the uh, market. So what I'm trying to, for the business leaders, why I'm saying this is that mechanical uh, revolution, which came or it took 60 to 80 years to take root and we got, it caused a lot of pain to businesses, to people, to society. There were a lot of jobs lost. There were a lot of this thing. But we learned to live with it. And we came out, uh, we kind of uh, are enjoying the fruits. This kind of, the kind of buildings we see, the kind of other products we see couldn't have been done, couldn't have been possible without the, that. But AI, the, the issue with AI would be that it, we have to adjust only to in next 20 years or so. We need to find a way that we, we need to adjust within the next 20 years to what can say align with the world which is uh, which will be basically AI driven. So as the, the famous uh, gentleman of uh, OpenAI, Mr. Eltman, he says, the cost of intelligence and cost of energy both are drastically reducing, in will reduce in coming years and businesses need to learn how to make good use of those things. So uh, the issue which I want to uh, tell is that what sometimes we say what AI can do, AI can't do. Now there are two things, there are certain things which man can do that also AI can do. There are certain things which humans can't do that the AI can do. But we seem to be, and rightly so, more worried about the things which the humans can do and AI can also do. Because we first time we see that there seems to be a, the the mechanical uh, revolution caused uh, uh, some pressure on blue collar workers and this is the first time the white collar workers as Mr. Chakravarti also pointed out that some of the code would be in the next couple of years only would be written by AI, no doubt about it. So as a business person, as a business entity, you need to take into account that paradigm shift and uh, uh, and the and you people are the best people to take the society forward in the sense because you are by nature more planned, risk taker, and people who are able to deal with the uncertainties of life. So society looks up to you in a sense that you will uh, guide, the, uh, guide uh, us all in ensuring that we align ourselves with the, uh, with the AI dominated word. So some of the thoughts which I would, uh, all of you can have a uh, look at is, uh, I have uh, borrowed the thoughts, these are not my uh, thing, is uh, uh, I'd like to mention two names is Professor Fefe of Stanford and Professor Abu Mustafa of Caltech. All this is available in a uh, public domain. Uh, but uh, my la last thoughts would be that uh, we need to learn quickly to adapt to this AI dominated world and it will increase uh, uh, this is on an exponential curve so it's going to increase on a daily basis and uh, and the quickly we do it the better it is wish you all the best thank you very much So this being brings us to the end of the first portion of the opening uh, session. And I would request our president, Mr. Shubhi Chakraborty, to please present a token of appreciation to our chief guest, Sri Rajiv Kumar. <clears throat>
and we'll be seamlessly moving on to the second part of the opening session that is the CEO. Member and advisory leader uh, PWC. We have with us on the dais in the round table Mr. Surinder Kumar Gupta, Chairman and Managing Director, MSTC Limited, Mr. Ranganath Sadasiva, CTO, HP India, and Mr. Shanjay Kumar Dash, Managing Director, Webel, that is West Bengal Electronics Industry Development Corporation Limited. Over to Mr. Basu. Thank you, Angana. Good morning. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here uh, moderating this round table. Um, already we heard from the President of the Chamber and also from Mr. Rajiv Kumar uh, about the topic of the day. And as we created the topic for the Business IT Conclave, this is the 14th edition of the Business IT Conclave. Please go ahead. Uh, I think uh, one of the things which we felt was that the focus on technology can't be only seen in the light of impact of technology on business. We wanted this year to focus of the impact of technology on humans. And hence, this year's curation has been done with that in mind. I would probably like to kick off with a you know, few thoughts of my own. And, you know, I think Mr. Rajiv Kumar touched upon a few very, very important points which I wanted to highlight, which are not only important from a technology perspective, but also from an India perspective. The first thing is that I think the world that we see for tomorrow is definitely going to be tech-powered, but at the same time, that same world is going to be human-led. And I think we do not see a world where the human ingenuity can be totally taken over by the ubiquitous tech that we see everywhere. And I'll tell you why I think so. We had a session uh, on AI, and Prasun did a wonderful job. But I think my own personal view is that in AI, while there's a lot of hype, we are probably at the stage in AI like we were in internet in the late 1990s. People like us who are talking about AI today have no clue what AI will become in 10 years' time. People in 1998 had no clue where Google would be. They did not know what TikTok would be in 2020. And I think in AI we are at that juncture. Yes, it is a hype, but I think for all practical purposes, I would say it is not overhyped, but it is underhyped. AI is going to change our lives, but at the same time, to say that we know how AI will change our lives is kind of going a bit too far in my mind. We heard about um, things like AI will solve some of our bottlenecks it will bring in huge efficiency in some parts of a business. I think one of the things which we need to keep in mind is that while it will solve a bottleneck, if the entire supply chain is not driven by AI, it will only shift the bottleneck to another part. It is like creating a super highway suddenly in the middle of two places. You can take that highway at 200 kilometers per hour, but then you will go into another side and you will again get a, you know, traffic. The other thing is something which Mr. Rajiv Kumar talked about, this entire need of GPU and CPU. I think as uh, technology is becoming more and more available to every one of us, I think we as a country would face GPU shortage and when we get the GPU, if we do not take care today, we as a country would suffer because we would share, you know, we would be facing power shortage. The amount of power which these GPUs suck is humongous. And as we try to use more and more AI in our lives, I think India needs to solve the power crisis if it has to ride the AI wave. 
Right now, the power can become the more limiting factor for our AI growth as a country than just the access to GPUs. India has, of course, done brilliantly, and we'll hear today, you know, from uh, Mr. Shanjoy also about what we have done on the IT side. But overall, India has done a brilliant job of creating an IT super way. I think the way we have been able to bring digital into each of our lives is amazing. But at the same time, you know, if we do not solve some of these broader issues at a policy level, at a regulatory level, we will struggle. India will take some time before things which are already happening in the West, like autonomous cars. You know, we have cars running around in San Francisco. They have completed about 50 million miles without any, you know, fender scratch. India will take some time to get there. But if you look at India, which is having so many languages, so many different cultures, latest technology around multilingual, generative AI-based frameworks where it can not only talk to you in different languages, it can also talk to you in different, you know, with different feelings. You want them to talk a bit aggressive, you want them to talk a bit more softer, you want them to talk, their, you know, talk in a more supportive way, in a more empathetic way. All these are realities which can come into India in a big way and I think uh, Mr. Chakraborty talked about it, that it will solve the reach issue for us. And definitely it will change the jobs of the future. I think some of the jobs which are coming up now, like, you know, prompt design manufacturers, prompt design managers, visual artists, I think these were not even heard of, you know, probably just a few years back. But the coding needs will remain. I think. AI can probably at this stage be more of a companion, more of a co-pilot, and some of these terms are being used by some of the large, you know, cloud providers in the world. But as a co-pilot, it will not yet become the pilot. As a companion, but it will not yet fully do the coding. And to that extent, the coding needs would continue. Yes, some of it will be taken over by AI, but we are looking at probably close to 500 million apps which would be created over the next three years in this world. And to that extent, the jobs will change, but some of the jobs will also remain. So with that as a context, maybe I'll, you know, move around this August panel. We have uh, Surinda Guptaji from uh, MSTC. Mr. Gupta, maybe I'll start with you you know, your views around the e-commerce revolution and what you think would probably make the change in the next one to 18 months, one year to 18 months. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basu. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, topic today and uh, Mr. Rajiv, uh, Principal Secretary, IT West Bengal, has taken us through the basically evolution of, evolution of mankind to mechanical revolution and now the IT revolution. Mr. Chakravarti has very well said that none of us is left untouched by IT this time when we are sitting here. Not only we, even the last man in the country is perhaps some way or other affected, connected with IT as on date. There's a lot of discussion as uh, Mr. Basu has uh, put us across that AI, what it will be. I agree that still we are at the tip of iceberg as far as the AI is concerned. And we never know where it will finally reach, evolve. But one thing I'm sure, any system designed by human being, human mind, cannot match the human capabilities. So 
whatever technology, whatever systems we develop, it has to be controlled and it has to be led by the humankind only. Of course, in the press process of evolution, there will be ups and downs, there will be uses, there will be misuses. So everything will be taken care of as we progress further, the mankind progress further. From this, uh, being in government sector, MSTC is an e-commerce company. And we have seen the changes it can bring in the processes. We have spoken about the, how IT impacts us as far as the reach is concerned, as far as the efficiency is concerned. Apart from the efficiency and reach, IT is a big transparency tool. Fairness is something which is built with the use of IT. And that is what government is trying to bring today that more and more IT in everybody's life so that the delivery to the end mile delivery to the person standing at the end of row gets the benefit in a transparent way, fair way, and it has minimized the corruption to a larger end. So the petty inconvenience that a poor man, an illiterate man had. So those are slowly vanishing. If we see MSTC, the, com uh, the company was set up for import and export of scrap. It was a canalizing agent for scrap. Subsequently, it entered into selling agency business for scrap when the scrap was put, on, put in under OGL. And in 2002, MSCC took a very, I'll say, baby step. Physical auctions were changed to the manual auction. If we all know the, how the scrap is sold and dealt, Perhaps the scrap dealer are one of the most, I mean, I'm talking of 2002. The scrap dealers were mostly illiterate person. They had a lot of money, but very limited education. We could see many of people were put there, thumb impression, they couldn't even sign. But that was the kind of community who very well accepted this change, their next generation came. Now the situation has come and in country there is hardly any physical auction, not only scrap, perhaps each and everything is going through e-auction mode only. Even Supreme Court has said that any government resource has to go through the auction mode or e-procurement mode. So that is the kind of revolution the use of IT has brought. So from 2002, when we started the scrap auction, after that, almost everything, minerals auctions, mines auctions, were put under scrap. We have seen a lot of controversy around the allocation of coal blocks, and after the Supreme Court judgment, MSTC was engaged as a service provider for allocation of coal blocks. And there is absolutely no controversy around the process now. All mines are being sold by MSTC platform, on MSTC platform, without any kind of allegations. 
there are bidders many times who have gone to courts but the court has established the transparency that the processes have brought about in the auction methodology so that is the strength of it e-commerce that the processes can be built in a very fair transparent way today mstc's volume of business in auctions and e procurement is more than 3 lakh crore and mstc's business is primarily for the government sector so that is the kind of resources being put on under auction and e procurement by government so that's a huge step by the government for making the total processes transparent all kinds of minerals the agri products agri products is another uh, area where we have very i mean the people who are very end mile people the farmers who may not be their education level may not be that good so they are also very well adapting to this kind of it based processes because as the computing power has increased the processes have been made more and more customer friendly as mr basu spoke then language multilingual so all the applications are slowly being converted to multilingual platform so the person knowing whatever language is not important so it's not only the english or hindi so the person can talk to the it systems in the language of his preference so that is the power of it and uh, another thing is now with the spectrum auctions going on uh, where mstc has contributed uh, by uh, allocating the spectrum 4g as well as 5g now government is in process of allocating satellite space based auctions s band c band ku band ka band where the end mile will be much more important today we have the it highways cable lot of cable lot of data transmission speeds are there but the user sitting at the end so there are the problems could be the connectivity i expect at my home at my factory is sometimes not as per my expectations so with these uh, space bands last mile bands after the auctioning after the its use in the field will be able to connect everything every machine in a factory every equipment in a home will be connected sitting in your office you can see what is being what is happening in our uh, homes we can switch on the ac we can switch off the ac all the machines in a factory can be connected so sitting in a office everybody can monitor the performance my car if i am driving a car so the my oem company manufacturer can see that which are the systems which are not working in order which are the system which need repair so perhaps they can give us a input that your vehicle needs to go to a workshop for a checkup or some kind of repair so that is the kind of power it is going to bring in our hands so these are the things the, some things we can visualize as on time as on date but there are things which as mr basu pointed out we cannot visualize and it they may become reality in due course so what i can say is uh, 
very interesting time ahead for the people of our generation and especially the people who are young, our kids, our grandsons, granddaughters, definitely they will see the much better time ahead. And I will compliment the Bengal Chamber of Commerce who has organized such a beautiful concla conclave. I'm sure by uh, all the networking and connections will have a lot of input in the technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. So maybe we will, uh, you know, go over to a technologist and uh, Mr. Sadashiva, uh, maybe would be good to hear your views about, you know, as you hear about the business side of things, the necessity of, you know, I would say moving to hybrid cloud deployments, how different industries are, you know, sort of adopting that. And, you know, some of your thoughts around the best practices maybe of such deployments, maybe if you can elaborate a bit for us. Thanks, Anup, and good morning to everyone. <coughs> so interesting conversation. Uh, I just want to start with what happened in the morning today. Uh, I was taking a flight out of Bengaluru and coming here, and there was this elderly gentleman who was talking about ChatGPT to one of his uh, grandson, perhaps. And you know, he was saying, is there an app for all of this? And you know, can I download this? What can it do? It was a side conversation. But that triggered a thought, <coughs> right, in terms of where technologies are really coming into play today. Uh, we are talking of a lot of AI-based capability in the uh, in, in technology space today. And the number of use cases are tremendous. You know, infinity is the number of use cases that you can really have. So in that context, uh, you know, I just want to throw back uh, a few things in terms of the other changing paradigms, right? As we speak about these front-end technologies, whether it is IoT in the car, or whether it is uh, digitization across the board, or whether it is an AI tool that we have, uh, I would go back to about four fundamentals that really kind of shape up all of the activities that we are going to do. You know, I call it the DEX, D-E-C-S. Uh, the D stands here for the data part of it, right? Any artificial intelligence is as intelligent as the data that you would provide to it. And today, uh, looking at data, there are multiple things that you need to worry about. One is the volume of data, the variety of data, the veracity of data. There's so many things that one needs to look at when you're really coming to the active data that you need to put into use. An interesting stat that might astonish you is uh, out of whatever we generate, uh, it's, it's only about 4.7% of data that's really been put into usage today. So imagine if you've seen the movie Lucy, you know, you put your brain to test and it really scales over a period of time. We are actually not doing justice to the amount of data that's there and, you know, you could use it for intelligence. Intelligence meets innovation, in innovation meets time to market, so, you uh, know, long, long uh, activity around it. The second fundamental I see is around uh, the edge Edge here, I mean all connected devices, you know, be it the hundreds of IoT devices that you find in a car to whatever edge that you have in your planned devices. What's growing here is uh, you, when, you, when you kind of look into that digital world between what is uh, virtual and what is physical, you will find that you will get connected and you're creating a lot of experiences around it, you know. How do you know uh, that you're going to reach home early today is not by your virtue of staying in this, in this city for this long, but what Google Maps tells you, right? You know, your conventional wisdom is thrown out of the window and you're looking at a map, right? You better well say that. Uh, so, so, or you could be challenged by your wife when you say you're going to come home at 40 minutes and it says, you know, one hour there. So you're going to create a lot of experiences, be it AR, VR as a technology or XR that we saw as a use case here. All of this essentially means that experience quotient and the amount of data that you're going to create at the edge is lopsided. You were creating a lot of data using structured data, SQL, and you know databases and stuff like that. That's out of the window today. You're going to create a lot of data at the edges. 60 to 65 percent of your data is going to come out of the edge. So that's a foundational change that I see. Uh, next is uh, the experience that you have around consuming IT, IT today. I think many of us have uh, seen the cloud evolution from being something like procuring few uh, devices, going through a life cycle there, you're essentially doing self-service, you're getting whatever you want at the, at the click of a button. So that is an experience that's here to stay. 
it's going to not uh, go down the drain. Everyone would want to do it very, very differently. And the last part around uh, my tech strategy is around security. As in when we open up a lot of our devices, the landscape really grows very, very big. So it's important for us to look at that landscape and figure out how you can secure your transactions across the board. Right? It's good to get an access to an application, but remember you're opening up a port right, into, that, uh, into your device. You know, data could be, you know, anything and everything can happen. And in India, it, the entire landscape around threat and security is really, really growing. So these are the fundamentals that actually crossed my mind, uh, Arnab, when you look at uh, the new age experience that we need to have. This also leads to one more thing that's uh, happening today and very pertinent, I would feel, because Arnab brought up the word hybrid. Hybrid essentially means that uh, your IT landscape today is moving from edge devices to the cloud. So anything in and around it is, is your IT landscape. The boundaries are diminishing. And a business requirement today is that your applications and data needs to reside everywhere. You, you can't say, I will go to the bank to get your money today. You would want the bank on your handphone. And you know how many of us have really gone to the bank in the recent few days? We have never gone to the bank. So when you're talking of a spectrum like that, uh, you know, you're essentially talking of your IT landscape to have spread from the edge to the core and to the cloud today. So, so that's, that's the given situation uh, as, as we speak. But what do we have today? What do we have is essentially a public cloud experience or an on-prem experience, right? These are the two experiences that we carry. Uh, the need today, however, is to have something that manages both of this together. You know, your multimodal IT, as we call, your ability to work with what you have and also have the experience that you get on the cloud is becoming very, very important. That's a significant change that I see as we look at, and you know, organizations are looking at getting that hybrid experience. So it's not the cloud, it's the cloud experience that matter. How do I buy my provisions today? I carry a bag. My son would use an app to do it. So that's the cloud experience that we have bought onto the IT table as well. So we are talking of self-service capability. We are talking of un unlimited scalability of resources. So that's another chain that I see as we speak of the new age applications, Arnab, uh, in terms of how all of this is really, really transforming our lives. It needs to happen on these fundamental changes as well. So, you know, thought towards looking at your own strategies of enabling that experience to be very good depends on how you develop your dev, uh, you know, dex strategy, right? How do you ensure that your data is relevant, you're collecting all the edge data for the right insights, how do you retain the cloud experience and how secure you are? I think that's the big fight as we speak today, right? You know, that's where the hybrid world comes into play. Um, a lot of players, people coming in from the cloud side who would want to give you the cloud, you know, hybrid experience. People who are coming from the on-prem side who want to give you that experience. So that's the battleground. That's the new Kurukshetra that you're going to see. And you'll have to decide, you know, who's the person of choice or a vendor of choice who's going to make the appropriate decision for your business. Arnab. Thank you, Sadashiv. And I think uh, very interesting thoughts and uh, something which we can possibly even think as this, you know, revolution keeps continuing, uh, how this will start morphing even more. Uh, but with that, I think uh, I'll come over to Mr. Sanjay Das. Uh, Mr. Sanjay, tell us a bit about Bengal's foray into security and the security infrastructure that we have been able to create, uh, the kind of use cases which you are you know, looking at and uh, the kind of use cases which you think will help build this digital public infrastructure in a big way because security is something which, you know, it is always discussed but probably the least invested in many cases. So, would like to know about that. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I hope it is still morning. So, have good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, you know, I would start with a catch line called Daag Achche Hai. So with that, you know, with the, with the advent of especially India's as well as uh, particularly this uh, state's journey towards a secured uh, infrastructure in the IT domain, 
It all started when in 2016 we were actually engulfed with ransomware attack one after another. Between 200, 2016 and 17, we witnessed ransomware like Petaya, not Petaya, and WannaCry. Just like uh, you know, I hope WannaCry was middle, and then there were two on the both sides. So, uh, and still today, people are really uh, worried. Uh, what were the IOCs? That incident of compromise. Uh, how long that each of the organizations took to respond. So I'd go back and you know uh, tell you a real story. Like United Nations in 1952, 1954 actually created disaster management vertical. So they thought that the global change with the global changes, you know, after Second World War, a lot of industrialization was just around the corner happening, on the verge of happening. So they understood that you know, the world will not be the same. By the time Hiroshima, Nagashiki was there, so a lot of you know, global warming and other uh, threats to the environment were looming in every possible manner. So they thought that there should be a proper standardized process to deal with disaster. So the disaster management vertical was created in United Nations. You might be thinking why I am referring to this. Just imagine in 2004, that means after 50 years, they created the vertical called disaster risk reduction. So it took United Nations and the you know, unity of nations 50 years to understand you cannot manage a disaster. It is far better to actually try and reduce the risk of it. So as we are speaking here, sitting here and talking about information technology, most of our you know, devices are connected to multiple networks or redundant networks. If it is connected to my dongle in my pocket or to the free uh, internet Wi-Fi being provided by Taj City. So, you know, it is, it is continuously uh, identifying. The same with my, uh, you know, intent to remain connected. So the, the whole thing actually was the real reason behind those ransomware because people actually went ahead to get connected without taking due precaution or didn't think twice to reduce the risk of what is going to come. So disaster risk reduction is the only way forward. Just Mr. Sadasiv ended by you know, enumerating a lot of points, but he ended with security. So when he ended with cloud security, I would like to pick it up from there. Because today, not only the OEM-driven cloud that we are seeing, we are also witnessing an avalanche of hybrid clouds. So there is, you know, the, the, everybody is trying to enjoy the best of the both sides. So if you, if you go and see uh, even in the state governments and the central governments, you would see even when people, you know, the governments are having their own data centers, they would rather prefer for some applications the private cloud, some application hybrid cloud, some would only take, you know, uh, database as a service for high computational value. You know, multiple types of things are happening. So in West Bengal, we are having a clear idea of what we are doing. Post-2016, we have been bringing out you know, structured policy in every aspect. And with regards to security, we thought that if we do not actually take it as a business case, the security orientation will not grow in this state. So in the year 2017, we created Cyber Security Center of Excellence. It is nearly six years old. So immediately after creating it, we created, we uh, had the first national level conference on cybersecurity. And post that, we completely act focused our attention into development of professionals in multiple fora. That means we actually invested heavily in, in uh, developing startups in security, then supported lot of professionals working individually with actually assessing the use case in the government, then handshaking with them to create solutions 
for those government use cases, then allowing them to conduct POC with the government data. Coming to that, you know, government is actually sitting on tons of data, captive data, without understanding the power of it. Everybody is saying that. You know, every organization is trying to actually use the data, but consent-driven data usage is a threat to that. If you read GDPR, if you read CCPA, you would never touch data. Because GDPR says our rule follows our data. So if you go to CCPA, it is only penalty, penalty, penalty. So there is nothing else. You know, in every line there is penalty. So if, if you really read those rules, you are not going to touch the data. So where do we stand? We have structured IT, uh, you know, act. Even when everybody is waiting for the privacy act to come up, I would rather ask all of you here and beyond, please go back and read the IT Act and the associated rules with that. There are many, many, you know, places which if used properly, we can very well ensure that data privacy could be, you know, uh, actually handled in a more pragmatic way. To that, state government of West Bengal has been the pioneer in launching a hackathon on data anonymizer. What is data anonymizer? As government is sitting on top of, you know, huge and, you know, great lake of public data or public transactional data. For that matter, let me tell you, most of the, you know, startups today are failing because they are unable to access the live transactional public data because they are actually, you know, conducting their POC on legacy data. When they are bringing out that solution and allow the users to work upon that, then they are not getting good results. Because by that time, usage variance led to change of data. So it is high time we shared our public transactional live data with our children who are creating, you know, this, this uh, startups and all. So how to do that? So that's why it comes anonymizer. Data anonymizer is a tool which actually identifies the attributes in an information which are you know particularly person oriented or personally identifiable they are being identified and strained that means just like a you know strainer it strains just like tea leaves from the tea and the anonymized data is created in a data lake let me give you an example of data lake the aadhaar data is a data lake you are not giving access to it, that does not mean that it is an anonymized data. Because on the other side of it, it is not an anonymized data. At the same time, we used, without knowing or unknowingly, the data lake of uh, during our corona period. Because the entire health data was collected uh, and, and uh, given to the industry for usage and community to use. And that's why, well, that's how we fought with it. So. This anonymized data lake will actually provide the government data for the startups. And to, for your information, on 12th of uh, August, we will be holding the final round of it. And before that even, we have received first, you know, this patent from our 836 participants. So those solutions will enable our startups and organizations, industries, to use government data, the data that the state government is having in its 52 departments. So these are the things that businesses can take actually note of and then start building solutions upon it. When we talk about business insecurity, often the solution providers forget about the expanse of a state government. Let me tell you, our state government has more than 3,600, that means 3,600, you know, gram panchayats, 343 blocks. Each of the blocks is having nearly 3 lakh population, 69 subdivisions, 23 districts, and more than 10 crore population. The highest amount of personal consumption in internet, the highest number of dual connectivity in telecom, the highest number of, you know, rural uh, women folks using internet. So we are actually at the threshold 
of a situation of, of, of a you can say of a, of a time where if business is actually generated upon this uh, you know key performance indicators security will be another key factor to enable it securely so that's why five years back there were actually there were there was no one no solution provider no one who has an or had an office in kolkata today most of the solution providers are having good offices here and not only that they understood the you know expanse of it only three two three days back i sat with mr shudeep das of tenable and understood how exposure management system could do wonders for you know the entire network and you know data centers and 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 the connected systems and devices so it is high time that government talked to the industry industry came and participated with the government efforts and collaboratively the you know business ecosystem develops and that is what is happening in bengal and thank you mr das so i i know that we'll come for maybe a final comment to all of you but before that if you have any questions for our panel uh maybe we can take a few questions yes please go ahead just tell us who the question is for please and then give you ask your question hi uh, i am amar agarwal and i am a business consultant uh, this anybody could answer um, uh, ai or in fact when we come to securities um, you know small firms small people they use just plain simple antiviruses right but when it comes to see even they have 10 people 15 people in the organization and there are leakages data man financial transactions all, all sorts of things now i have these questions coming to me i am not an id person and it becomes very difficult for me to you know help them because whenever they go to a higher category software company their charges are 25 lakhs 50 uh, lakhs maybe a crore or something like that now how do medium size companies small scale companies take care of all these issues that we are facing today and now ai has become something you know again it's a big thing uh thank you so much i forgot to tell actually in 20 just uh, have a seat uh, in 2020 uh, nascom brought out a report wherein it it wrote actually if i am not wrong that around 25 lakh you know security professionals were needed in the country between 2020 and 2025 and we don't have 2 lakh professionals so you understand why we are not having the 2 lakh profit more than 2 lakh because those who are actually getting graduated post graduated or you know special uh, specific certification in security they are working for mnc's other countries work from home has done that so most of the msmes just like you are talking about or startups they don't have proper type of you know security consultancy the thing that i am you know referring to here similarly in case of ai and others so right now what it is needed and that's where west bengal started the you know you can say revolution 3 years back west bengal created diploma in cyber security and it got aict approved and this year you know from two colleges two polytechnics you know 60 60 120 uh, this polytechnic pass outs are coming up and all of them have been taken up or lapped up by just you know startups msmes mid size companies of our country so and today after 3 years around 1000 polytechnic sector across the country they have adopted this you know cyber security diploma course similar things have to apply you know we need to bring in you know this this type of course curriculum specific industry centric courses in the polytechnic or vocational trainings so that organizations like yours need not go to such an expensive you know company to actually attend to that and with regards to privacy i would say that if we do not collect unnecessary data we need not protect them but if we collect 
unnecessary data just like if you ask my father's name it is of no use to you but you have the you have you know in explicitly given consent to protect my father's name so that is how we should look towards privacy without getting frightened at you know how to how to comply do not accept or collect the data so need to know basis if you do not have any need to know don't know so that is one thing in about privacy and for you that if we start you know creating courses curriculum in the school colleges or 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 polytechnics vocational level they the, the products will definitely attend to organizations like yours and and course of others thank you uh, any other questions Hello, uh, I'm from LK Mindtree. Uh, well, I have a question for, for all the people around here that uh, the theme being that we are actually looking for connected devices and we'd be presenting them to our business for acceptance. Now, in this forum, actually, we are all talking about AI, isn't it? Now, now suppose I present a scenario to you that uh, a, f a company comes up with a product where it can fit it to their automobiles, which will uh, sense using their proximity sensors, and it can trigger whether an accident is imminent or not. Okay, And it's going to give you a beep. If the person sitting behind the driver's seat is, is not careless, then he has to manually switch off the beep so that system understands that he has taken the manual control. If the person is not switching off the beep, then the system is going to park his side, uh, park his car to the service lane, and it's going to dial the emergency services. Now suppose this is a scenario and this is a product which has been created by a company. Now suppose we have got five more companies who have also created product in the same lines. Okay. Now these companies goes to uh, a set of business person. They say that, sir, we have got products from five companies. Now you being a business person, now suppose you don't have that much expertise in IT right now, but we have got the hunger for acceptance of technology. Okay. So what are the yardsticks based on which you would be actually accepting the product, given that there are five providers? Okay. Why I'm saying is because suppo uh, in case of our Androids, we have a score known as Antutu score, so which actually qualifies the overall rating for an Android device. So when we're talking about the products which are created by AI technologies, uh, don't you think there should be a, a consortium or a, or a body who should be giving the rating to the product so that the business who is coming, they should be actually looking into the ratings of that product instead of trying to digest the knowledge of AI and then trying to understand that what features are offered. So this concept of rating of AI products should also be there, isn't it? For, for a layman business to uh, accept the users. It's as good as, uh, suppose you go to buy a car, your wife say that, I want the red color car. How about so you, you say have that? To, you have to keep the question short. I would like <laughs> to take a few more questions. Okay, okay. So I think I've understood your point. Uh, so I think the, maybe I'll attempt to give an answer and you know, Sadashiv, if you can just add on. See, the technology has to mature for regulation to come in and ratings to come in. Uh, as I said before that AI is very new and I think it's, you know, even the use cases are being found out uh, as we go along the journey. So there would be different products coming in, different products trying to compete. Some would remain, some would die. Uh, some would get, you know, sort of swallowed up by another uh, product company. Uh, that's how we have seen most of, you know, the digital technology innovation and the digital revolution happen, where you know some companies would grab over some others, and it is a very acquisitive environment for technology. Uh, but I think we are all saying that we need regulation. We are all saying we need ratings. But for ratings to come in, the benchmarks have to be you know decided. It needs to decide what we want. I think as of today, the world itself is divided as to what we want. Um, so, but Sadashiv, if you can add on. Yeah, <clears throat> a few things uh, with respect to autonomous cars. <clears throat> I, I know very closely uh, Zenziac, which is a Volvo company, who's doing autonomous cars globally. 
and uh, the kind of work that's going there. <coughs> so, you know, firstly, it, it's about what you're going to deliver. While we're looking at AI per se and regulating it, uh, you have ADAS versions that are available and conformance to those versions that really matter when it comes to technology that you really spoke of. So it again goes down to what is the requirement and what is it that you would want to achieve. And the ways and means could be varied, whether it is through AI or whether it is through intelligent data that you've co collected, or it is the host of other things that you look at and then bring that intelligence onto it. So, and, and in, in terms of maturity of technology, yes, it's still a long way around. You know, we spoke about some regulation that's going to happen, but till then the kiosk is going to be there, right? So in, in that context, you will have to kind of work that through. But um, let's focus on what's the outcome. You know, instead of regulating AI and doing what it needs to be done, how is it really delivering autonomous car capabilities or ADAS capabilities is what we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Sadashiv. Um, I think, uh, okay, I'll take one last question, sir, from you in the green shirt. Can I take the question? Okay, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, I have a question related to the certification regarding the reliability of AI systems because some time back I was quite shocked to hear that there was a case, the Stephen Swartz in, in the North, uh, New York who was uh, penalized legally because he used ChatGPT and they came up with false cases. So how can this happen in an AI related uh, environment and how do we know when we're using something like ChatGPT that the information we are getting is correct and not false. I think this is a very critical part of AI that we need to look at. So yeah, what think, are your thoughts on that? I think with generative AI, I think you will probably have more and more situations where you can not really look at a video or look at a report or look at a document and understand whether it's true or false or whether it's, it has been completely generated. Even pictures are, you know, fully digitally generated in generative AI and uh, I think regulations around reliability are still quite a distance away uh, in my mind. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, we are running a bit against time because we have speakers lined up and I think, uh, as you were saying, that in the IT conclave today we have sessions on connected systems, we have sessions on robotics and automation, we have uh, sessions on infrastructure, another session on generative AI which is going to come up. So I would probably say that, you know, stay on, enjoy the day and listen to some of the speakers who are coming up. Uh, many of your answers would be answered, uh, questions would be answered in those sessions because those are more specific uh, to this, you know, different topics. We also have a session with our uh, colleagues from Bangladesh. Uh, we have a, a delegation from there who are also going to discuss some of the issues which they see in their country. Uh, but with that, uh, Angana, if I can bring this session to a close, uh, handing it back over to you. I, I will come over to you and we'll get, take the question offline. Thank you. So, <clears throat> we have come to the conclusion of the formal opening session and I would request Dr. Chiranjeev Bhattacharya, Co-Chairperson of IT Committee and Chairperson of IT Entrepreneurs and E-Commerce Committee of the Bengal Chamber and CEO of Wisetech to please uh, share with us the way forward. Thank you so much. So, my sincere thanks to the learned speakers for the wonderful insights. Sincere thanks to the distinguished guests for your patience. So, just to add uh, one point on the way forward, the evolution of uh, products into intelligent and connected devices, which are mostly today embedded in broader systems, has created a radical shift in processes, in organization structures, and uh, relationships. Industry boundaries getting blurred, competition getting redefined. Uh, as uh, one of our distinguished guests was speaking about. See, today, a tractor manufacturer does not compete only with a tractor manufacturer. Tractor manufacturing has evolved into farm management, leading to seed optimization, for example, soil and water conservation, irrigation drainage, and analytics. 
So, so tractor companies are actively into analytics, and the days have come when they are also competing with analytics companies. Today, uh, an entertainment provider at home, or an AC manufacturer, or a security device manufacturer, does not compete only with the product. He or she competes with a smart home provider. So with industry boundaries getting blurred, competition getting redefined, in my opinion, the way forward should be rethinking of strategy by companies. When we talk of rethinking of strategies, we need to appreciate the fact that uh, platforms are becoming key instead of products. Competition is between systems and not between products. Connectivity is becoming more and more critical, and therefore collaboration becoming most critical. And hence, it's important for companies to start reimagining their business models, reevaluate their value chains, reconnect with customers, and rebuild organizations in terms of skills. Now, on behalf of uh, the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we would uh, like to continue our commitments to enable and encourage MSMEs and startups. The Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry has evolved from being a platform of networking and collaboration to hand-holding businesses today. And therefore, our endeavor would be to connect MSMEs, startups with larger organizations, create support, connecting them with VCs, PEs, and other interested stakeholders. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, Arnav, would you like to conclude? No, I think uh, we've had quite a few deliberations. I think, as I said in the beginning, it's been my privilege uh, to chair this session. Uh, also, I think we have a few sessions which I think would be very, very informative for the audience. Would request you to listen to some of those. We have curated some focused discussions on AI, on connected systems, connected platforms. And uh, the focus is, of course, technology for humans. I would probably finish by saying that I still believe that the future is going to be human-led, tech-powered, and not the other way around. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I would request Mr. Arnab Basu to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Surinder Kumar Gupta. To Mr. Ranganath Sadasiva. I would request Dr. Chirunjib Bhattacharya to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Shanjay Dash. Thank you. So we are closing the opening session here and the next session, very interesting session. Uh, it is on security, what's next beyond Nessus. You are requested to stay seated, please.
দিচ্ছিলাম রাজু ওই স্ক্রিন পে একবার দে তো
फेसबुक लाइव इज रेडी लेट मी नो Ladies and gentlemen, you are requested to please take your seats. We'll be moving on to the next session. So we are live again. Thank you. Welcome back. So what's next beyond Nessus? Presented to you by Tenable. We will start with a short video of the presenting sponsor. The particip the participants and the guests. You are requested to please take your seats. As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question: How secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Tenable, the exposure management company, has launched a new platform that solves these underlying problems. The Tenable One Exposure Management Platform delivers visibility of cyber risks in a unified view and helps customers easily understand their unique attack surface. This helps them prioritize which threats to remediate now and provide comprehensive, easy to understand reporting for business leaders so they can make informed decisions, confident they have the full picture. Exposure management is the future of the cybersecurity industry. Tenable One enables organizations to operationalize both preventative and proactive security measures with ease. It's curing the disease of cyber risk rather than simply treating the symptoms. In addition to newly introduced capabilities, including the Lumen Exposure View, Attack Path Analysis, and Asset Inventory, the Tenable One platform combines the broadest vulnerability coverage, spanning IT assets. cloud resources, containers, web apps and identity systems. The platform also builds on the speed and breadth of vulnerability coverage from Tenable Research and adds comprehensive analytics to prioritize actions and communicate cyber risk. As the attack surface has expanded beyond traditional IT infrastructure to include public and private cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications, identity and more, our customers are faced with new So it is my great pleasure to share with you. I have with me on the dais Mr. Shudeep Kumar Das, Head Sales Engineer, uh, India and Sark Tenable. So over to Mr. Das to take the to you know take forward the session on what's next beyond Nessus presented to you by Tenable. In the meantime, our IT committee member Mr. N K Ghoshal will be joining him and will be engaging with you uh, in the in interaction. Over to Mr. Das. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll, my session will be the first after lunch, or before lunch, or after dinner. So I'll, I'll try and make it a little faster. Uh, but let me start off with asking uh, the show of hands. While I put that, assuming that word makes sense, but let me just ask: For how many of you that word "nessus" makes sense? Okay. so there is significant number who for whom nessus doesn't make sense but you know being an oem it like it feels good to say that okay this word nessus is synonymous with security and that is what i thought that uh nessus as a tool uh, had a is, is quite a long journey so let me I, i don't have to to go there so let me start explaining what this uh you know nessus tool is about and why it makes a lot of sense in the modern world of ai and in the modern law world of things changing so rapidly right 
so, what it is about let me start off with that. So, the first uh, you know version of Nessus came out in 1998 a long long 25 years back when most of the security tools was all about firewall not even antivirus, but this was a tool which came out in 1998 as an open source tool and lot of us who have started our career at security this would have been the first tool that we would have used. What does it do? It finds out if there is a problem in the system. One of the major things that one needs to understand within this security paradigm while we talk about security you know in such a uh, you know alien kind of subject, but all the attacks or the breaches that one sees are actually based upon known things mostly. More than 90 percent of attacks happen based upon things that we already know how to stop just in the physical world right. Uh, so, now that we know based upon what we have seen all this uh, news items that you keep on seeing on the newspapers all of them are actually preventable right. You do not need to. Now, based upon you know just to take this story a little ahead and to make it a little more conversational. Let us assume your child is falling sick every other day and mostly he has stomach problem. You will take the your child to a doctor and take a medicine. He becomes okay, he goes next day uh, next month he again falls sick. You will give him another medicine. The third time next time you go will you again give a same medicine or you start thinking what is going on? Are you going to start thinking about maybe he does not have good water, maybe he is not having the right hygiene, maybe there is a problem, the medicine might not be the problem, the problem might be more platform more environmental in nature and you will start thinking how to prevent, how to make the child more healthy rather than react to a medicine. Would you agree with me that just a little quick show of hands if you are feeling sleepy you know ok good. So, we know from our own you know how we work out things we know the benefit of having a healthy environment right. So, in the IT world as well there will be many many such evolutions that will keep coming, but the benefit of a healthy environment a healthy environment that I already know how to build is paramount. And we all know a stitch in time saves rupees 9. So, which means in the IT world as well from a security perspective if I create a healthy world before an incident happens I most probably will be incurring the least amount of cost. You know I heard we heard uh, I think one gentleman 25 lakhs 1 crore is what is the security cost? It is not. If it is preventive security like an antivirus there are certain other things which are there which are not really costly. What is costly is incident response ok. Now, coming back so, Nessus or the idea of Nessus was to find out these weaknesses in the environment what is that, right. Finding out weakness to put simply in uh, words what is this meaning of weakness? There are two weaknesses that we are we can very easily generalize. One is there is a software bug. We all understand even though we are not IT guys many of us are not IT guys, but we all know what is a software bug and that software bug can be compromised to create malware and all those kind of things right. And the other one is a misconfiguration. I have a firewall but I put all all rule on it that is the misconfiguration. So, I have the tool, but I am not making the tool work the way it should be. You all with me right ok. So, it is a simple thing again security can be made very complicated or it can be made very simple to gain the maximum top 
impact sorry yeah. So, we are talking about any of these systems whether it is a generative AI based system or a traditional rule based system each one of them will either have a software bug or will be misconfigured and we know what these bugs are because it is published and we know the configurations because it is there in the user manual nothing unknown about it. That was the idea with this which this product was created. I already know the software bugs I know already know the weaknesses can I find out these weaknesses and misconfigurations and start solving those problems right. So, that is what we started off, but at that point of time in 1998 when people started doing this the idea was if I can remove this weakness in the environment attacks can be prevented right. Not that if I am healthy I will not fall sick, but the probability of me falling sick would be very 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 low if I am healthy right. So, with that idea if I can remove software bugs and misconfigurations in the environment I can prevent attacks. So, that was the idea in 1998. There were 200 800 such software bugs which were published across all the IT systems across the world. At 1998 there were not too many and we heard uh, I think uh, Mr. Rangnathan talked uh, or Arnab said there will be 500 million more applications that will get developed each one of them will have a misconfiguration each one will have them a vulnerability right. So, things are going to become bad. So, what we happened at that point of time when there were just 800 software bugs known to people in 2023 the change thing has changed drastically and how those things have changed drastically we have different kind of we talked about hybrid cloud we talked about generative AI based systems hybrid uh, cloud deployments and so and so forth. So, the technology platforms and we also talked about IOTs and connected cars and so many things we all have heard how a normal server in 1998 is now being done with so many different other IT or edge systems we heard about that as well right. So, technology platforms have changed technology assets has changed we starting from on prem and remote IT. Now, we have this APIs and web applications and uh, you know different IOT systems which is a hybrid of those two things as well. So, the communication things have happened. Many of these systems are connected to the outside world where you are allowing anyone to connect to those systems. So, internet facing systems right. So, more people are able to access your digital assets. Then we are seeing of course, we heard about it adoption of public cloud inevitable we will be adopting public cloud which means it is a shared security responsibility. Earlier the security responsibility of removing misconfigurations and software vulnerabilities was entirely yours. Now, it is a shared responsibility of the OEM and you it is becoming more complicated right. And then of course, we have opened our factories up the factories where the uh, you know temperature control systems and the and so many more other systems which are all controlled by devices which were very well protected with the boundary, but now that boundary is gone because you want to manage those PLCs right from home which means the idea of Stuxnet, Stuxnet how many of you have one just one ok one two three the entire nuclear reactor came down, but it was not a remote attack. It was physically somebody planted the malware in their environment. It was important it was necessary then so many years back because that struck that Iranian nuclear reactor was not internet enabled. Today pretty much 100 percent of our factories are internet enabled which means I do not need to send a spy to put a USB. Stuxnet can happen and it is happening across the world where the factories and the manufacturing lines are getting compromised right. We have heard about this California water and all of those stuff it is quite well known and it is going on right. So, OT systems are getting. So, attacker motivations threat types are changing attack techniques are changing uh, and ultimately 
you just need one phishing attack to compromise the entire <laughs> thing, right? So you can safeguard everything, but you have a bad, uh, you know, a bad food. Your food poisoning will kill you, and that's that's it, right? Now that's not a very good corollary, but. If an identity is compromised, all this good work can simply be compromised because that guy anyway has the privileges, right? So, identity compromise is again another massive, massive problem which has led to so many regulatory frameworks, uh, people are moving around. So, 800 vulnerabilities with which this solution was created in mind now has just exploded. But interestingly, Nessus still is one of the first tools that a security organization will buy, right? It is still a, one of the most go to products to find out weaknesses and to find out things. The problem is now, when at that point of time it might have been 30, 40 lines of activity, that same tool now is now giving you lakhs and lakhs of activity to be done. And that is where that one crore comes into picture. Because the reality is there are lacks of problems to be solved. What will you solve? So, you give a consultant to solve all of them one by one by one by one. And that translates to a crore. Now, the problem is well understood now. So, what do we do? <laughs> right? So, what is it that we uh, needed to do? Uh, so, that is what? So, we still need to prevent act attacks, right? That use case is still not gone. What we need now is a little different approach towards that same problem statement, right? So, what we have done is added up this vulnerability management with plethora of other techniques. We are still producing that 1 lakh lines, right? So, we have got OT security. But we have started putting numbers on these 1 lakh lines. We have started prioritizing them. We have said this 1 lakh is good, but it is only this 5 that might compromise you. The others are problems which may not get compromised and so and so forth. So, it is just like I have a lot of problem in my body, but if I do not take care of my cancer first, the others are immaterial at this point of time as of today. Tomorrow, it might be something different. So, prioritizing with everyday problems, right? So, that is what we try to do. We put a risk based vulnerability management solution, but then after that, another explosion came with cloud, with OT. So, those lines also. So, we added up what we started doing was no single weakness or a no single vulnerability is going to compromise. It is always a sequence of things that together makes life very, very bitter. It is not just one problem. If it is just one problem, most probably you will still survive. But you have got a, you know, good multiple connected problems, you are dead. What are those multiple connected problems? That is what we call as attack path analysis. So, once I look into that 1 lakh problem areas, try and connect them and there is only a few of them that connect to each other to say, ah, ah, this really is something that I have to take care of. So, what we call as attack path analysis and uh, attack surface management, again I will not go to this. So, ultimately we came up with this platform which we are now calling instead of a vulnerability, we are trying to say that you are exposed to a particular problem. Now, essentially the raw data is still the same. Why we needed a new word? For example, we needed generative AI to be a word metaverse to be a word, they are all built on AI, but we needed a new word to be, so that our human mind can associate with it and start thinking a little differently, right? So, it is still vulnerability management, but we want to call it as exposure management because now inherently you are measuring it and prioritizing it. So that is what we would like you to associate the word exposure management to. It is no more just lines of vulnerabilities or lines of software bug, but a reason or a point where you can compromise the system today, not something that is, you know, hawame, right? So, that is what is the idea of, and you know, again, of course, people have said if you form this approach of exposure management, one, it will be cheaper, second, it would 
reduce, you know we heard Sanjay sir uh, talk about disaster management is almost an unsolvable problem, but disaster risk reduction is a solvable problem, right. So, this is what we want to do, we want to reduce the risk to a manageable level where I can start working on it, okay. Uh, so, and another thing that we heard about was these all these problems really are interconnected as I talked about attack path analysis earlier right. It is not a software bug, it is not a misconfiguration that is a problem. It might be a problem like food poisoning, everything you know, but most of the time it are multiple related things together which creates a problem. And so, here we are talking about application level vulnerabilities, software level vulnerabilities and so many so. Again these are deeply IT oriented in nature. Right, and it becomes difficult for people who are business to really understand. That is where you need systems which will do this correlation, tie this whole thing up and be able to answer this simple question, am I secure? Now, there is no single way of answering this question. So, we came up with an idea of how can I answer this particular question, under what boundaries can I say? am I secure or not my, from an IT perspective right. Is it a security from data loss or security from availability or security from I know, there are many such risks. So, am I secure that simple sentence which the board keeps on asking I am sure at some point of time you would have asked yourself also am I secure and there are so many different angles to this particular word. What we are trying to say is that there is one way of defining am I secure and that is through the lens of vulnerability and weakness. Do I have a vulnerability which is known? Do I have a misconfiguration which is known? If I have then across all my IT assets and all the misconfigurations and all the vulnerabilities if I take them up and I start correlating them of other things I come up with this idea of exposure right. Take up all the data you know we heard about good data is there, it is a matter of using this. So, we took up those lakhs and lakhs of findings from Nessus, put them into a correlation engine. It is a big data lake that we have used, we are using snowflake for that. We have correlated normalized all this data, tie, try to tie them up into an attack path, try to attack point this out to an existing malware system or an existing attack system and come up with this simple statement, what is the context of this findings and how can I tell the board. So, the last part if you the first part we talked about uh, visibility, every system vulnerability and misconfigurations are picked up, we put it into a context and we are able to communicate it to business as well as IT people in a simple language. What is the risk? right. So, people who have used Nessus earlier would only associate with, with an excel sheet of findings, an excel sheet of patches that has to be applied. Now, instead of that we are now putting it up into a single matrix to tell this is how I am improving my system right. So, give actual what is the key performance indicators, give out the context so that it is uh, you know, so I will try and be a little uh, thing. So, again a lot of, so we have a booth if you want to know more about it please come and visit the booth I will talk about this technology aspects a little bit more uh, and uh, well. So, what we did was all of these were pawn products, we put all of them together into a particular platform so that it is easier to deploy, it is more hybrid, it is more governance related stuff and ultimately we are saying that you will have one single score, a global exposure score that the board can monitor and the exposure score will tell you are you secure and what is the level of security that you have, what is your security level, what is the industry security level and what is the world security level from the lens of vulnerabilities and weaknesses. If you, if your numbers are lesser than the population hackers most probably will be targeting you 
even if you are a little difficult than your peer, it would be you know that adage goes right, it does not matter how fast you run, all that you have to run is faster than your nearest competitor. Right. So, from that perspective if you are a little more secure than your competitor, you will have an advantage and that is what is the idea of a unified uh, view of global exposure. So, uh, the use cases again to ray trade, there are hajar findings, hajar misconfigurations, put them into a context, find out which are these most probably is going to get attacked and that is where AI helps us to reducing or predicting what attack can happen to you, so that you start acting only on them and not all the problems that you have, right. A risk based decision and communicate, so I will just uh, click through few of them, right and, and be able to un understand what do I have enough number of people to handle all my findings, what is the prioritization, should I be reacting to incidents or can I work proactively from those incidents, right. So, those are the insights that I am able to give, I uh, will again skip through this particular stuff which is talked about an attack path analysis, uh, I think uh, and guess sir, I think this attack paths will not be very more useful, right. So, I am just uh, skipping, so the idea is pro do not focus on the problems, the problems are automatically cre uh, you know assessed and given to you, you will have the list, you know you can run Nessus on a daily basis, today we do it every 6 months, many of us do for every 6 months or every 1 year, you actually can run it every day, because vulnerabilities are created every day, it is published every day. When was the last time you heard about a newspaper claiming that a lot of people are getting compromised, which was the last one and when? Uh, very old, that was like prehistoric times, last year that is prehistoric, <laughs> sorry, okay. Ames, these are all prehistoric, a lot of things last week it was club and move it vulnerability. There were a lot of energy companies that got compromised all over, ransomware attack happened last week, right. Nowadays, we really do not start talking about uh, things, but really speaking if you just look into the number of people that have got compromised and number of organization that has compromised this year alone, it is mind boggling. It is every week some or the other malware strains, I mean you heard about the Ukraine and Russia, there were things, even last week there was news of hackers targeting educational institutes of India and they were all these are all real, I mean it is not that it is a newspaper clipping, these are real people getting real attacks and it is happening. It is just good luck of ours that you yourself may not be a victim or you might have been a victim and you have gone past that you know incident response time, right. So, it is just like amazing the way the attacks are getting probably and that is the reason most probably why in every conversation security is talked about, but it is just talked about without a clear plan of action and Sanjay sir said we have a clear plan of action, we are executing it. it this is a need not at just at the government level, but at so also at the private level and it is not costly if it is done before time. If it is done after an incident, super costly and that is where things are a little bad, right. Uh, so, then again you know what, so we talked about log 4 shell, very clear what was the problem for me as far as log 4 shell is concerned. I should be able to define the problem with metrics, define the amount of time I will need, provide metrics to handle security. Today security is more of a feeling that there needs to be security, we do not go past that. We need to be able to define security in A this person will go on to this system and do this, this, this task. It should be as clear and most probably when I am able to define it, I should be able to do automate that particular process and take care of it. So, that humans are focused more on risky stuff rather than this redundant stuff which we already know about.
right? So when we start thinking about it, this problem becomes a solvable problem. It is solvable today. It is just that we have just not sat down to do this extremely, extremely mundane and boring task. Today it is very, seems to be quite, uh, what to say, uh, glamorous to be able to say I hacked a system. It is not glamorous to say I protected a system, right? So we need to be able to inculcate this idea that protecting the system is also an extremely glamorous work, more productive work, right? And, and that is what I am trying to you know explain in through my these slides out here. So this, this idea, you know, what I talked about, how can I communicate? So this particular picture, if you see, talks about am I today going to get compromised if I am targeted by, let us say, log 4 shell? In a clear, definite answer to my board, I should be able to do it based upon. So I can say for in this example, if I were targeted by the sandworm threat system, there are six different machines which will get compromised if I am targeted, right? Most probably I will not be because I am not that important, maybe. But there are six. For log 4 shell, none. For move it, none, right? I mean, you know, you can come down to my booth and I will show you all of this, right? So the, 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 diag the screenshots and all are never too good on a things. But you should get an idea that I can answer my problems in a definitive, in a very, very quantitative way, right? Uh, that helps us create up uh, the, the, the plan of action, right? What I have also tried to do again, very, very difficult slide, but this is one of those benchmarks that the community has built to say or document every attack that is known to the security world, which is called as the MITRE framework. Right? Uh, in the MITRE framework, every known tools and tactics is documented. Every tool and tactics that is documented also has an underlying technology. If that particular technology has a vulnerability, then you can very well say that if, if the world of attacks is this, there are seven different attacks that will be uh, applicable for me. And in those seven, these are the 15 different activities that I have to do and so and so forth. So again, the definition or the communication of security and if I have to do this 15 attacks, I have one person, I can't do this. I need one more person and that person needs to be at this skill level or this level, you know. So again, to define the need of what is the investment that I need to do in security today this kind of health. It is exactly something like if I know my health lab reports, if I have done my dental checkup, if I have done my blood reports, I know exactly how much money will I be spending to do good dietitian or a physio or whatever. Until and unless I know what is the problem, I can't define my plan of action or the budget that I need, right? So again, these kind of analysis helps identify what are the problems, what is the kind of investment that I need to do. When you have the investment in place, you will be secure at the end of the planning or end of that action plan that you have, right? But without these kind of systems, it will, I'm, again, I am picking up on that word because that is the reality. It will be worth crores and hence no budget, hence no action. That is plaguing our world of IT environment. It is, uh, yeah, it is just snowball, snowballing. Today there are five vulnerabilities. I did nothing about it. Tomorrow another five came out. Today it became 10. And at the end of the month it is 100 vulnerabilities and now it is unmanageable. Let us not do anything about it. Let us just accept the risk and go forward. That is what is happening, right? Right. My last slide. And if I do not know if I have time, I would like to do a demo, but that is what we are talking about. We take up every bit of system, whether it is a camera in my IT environment or a fridge which is connected in my data center or the server or the mainframe, 
whatever is the IT system which can be compromised in my environment, scan them for misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. Take them all together, find out which is exposed to the internet, prioritize them, put them in a simple to use remediation plan and track whether the remediation plan is being executed in the right time frame or not. Repeat this process, you will have the cheapest security control in place with the highest ROI, right? Well, that is what we feel that can happen, but when it is executed, it is a different world, but you need to start taking that step, right? Uh, so, another thing that it is, so this thing is by itself not going to do anything. It is going to use the entire security ecosystem, the communication with your SIM, communication with your patch, communication with your CMDB, etc. So, again the IT part of things, there is a whole bunch of communication that need to happen with this number, so that the data is disseminated in a meaningful manner, in a timely manner, right. Um, one slide about who are our biggest partners, a whole list of partners that we have. This is around 300 plus odd systems with which we connect, so to make sure that our reach is the best uh, things. Okay, that is all that I had. How much time do I have? Do I have any time for demo? 10 minutes, I do? Okay, perfect. By the time I am picking up this, if there are any questions, please feel free so that I can, uh, you know, get my demo up. You can take this off. Ah, okay. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the amazing session. Uh, having uh, myself used Nessus, I can vouch that it's a great product indeed. Uh, but having seen the entire slide, I am wondering. Uh, so it protects uh, almost uh, many genres of the technology that we have in place right now. And uh, you might be aware that we are already have started categorizing it as Web 2. So, what is, do do Tenable have any plan uh, using Nessus or any other products to secure the Web 3 platform that is going to come, which is uh, entirely born out of the blockchain technology? I haven't seen in the slide. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. We have to define a little bit more. Are you saying blockchain as a technology? What is our approach towards it or web applications? Uh, no, sorry sir. Uh, so the question is about the web 3 in particular, web 3 uh, if I may explain. So it is basically. No, see, again, yeah, sure. uh, a mode of whether it is web 2 or web 3 or web 4, uh, industry 1, industry 2, industry C, the point is at the end of the day if I simplify the thing and say this is a technology item. Do, does it have a vulnerability? Of course, if it is a software behind it, it will have vulnerability. If it is a configuration, it will have configuration. So, one of the slides you would have seen web application security as one. Under that, based upon the OASP guidelines, we have checks and balances. Whether OASP today is ready for web 2.0 or not, that is a thing that we have to evaluate. But Based upon the OASP guidelines, we have those checks in place. Uh, I, I don't think OASP currently um, controls this uh, Web3 domain already. So Web3, the prime difference is that it is distributed in nature. So this concept of having the company, having the server, which needs to be protected, uh, is totally lost because it's all the nodes that are running. So that's why it's an entire domain altogether. So I'll uh, have to I talk to you to understand this sure, more. Definitely. It's not a specific. So I'm sorry. Thank you, Let's talk about it. Right. So again. If there is a benchmark of testing, we are investing in it. If it is a completely new one, it is in you know discussions. One of the power of Nessus which you might think is all driven by community. So, when people like you push up these suggestions, so go ahead and put up the suggestions on tenable.com, it becomes a line item for us to look into. As more people ask for it, we develop it. And who is developing? The community is developing anyway, right? So, I hope that gave you a satisfactory, I know it did not give you an answer, but I hope it gave you a satisfactory response. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, let us, let us, can we switch to the thing? Right, so, uh, so what we are saying 
uh, we, we talked about that the three different things, right? One is visibility across all IT systems in my environment, right? So that is the thing that we are trying to say through this asset inventory use case. When I click, uh, when I do my assessment and when I do my discovery, any and every element that can be compromised is brought under a single system. Now, you will ask why do I need this if I have got my CMDB, I have got my so many different systems where I am tracking all my assets. So, why is this different? This is different from the perspective that I am finding, it is not just a, uh, can you put on the net, my Okay, but 5G will work I hope. Check it, check it. Thanks. Yeah, five G seems to be still working. So, let me see. Okay. So, what I was saying was asset inventory provides a reconciliation point through an independent mean to find out which assets are there in your environment, both from an inside view as well as an outside in view, right. Everything that the internet is seeing, you should have a view of that. Surprising fact, most IT connected internet facing organizations have a view of around 10 to 15 percent of the asset that is actually on the internet. That is the statistics across the world. What is the case for your organization only you can assess and tell. But the idea is if you think you have 10 systems which is connected to the internet, the reality might be 100 systems. That is the statistical benchmark. Any of you would agree with this kind of idea that if I know 10, I actually have 100? Have you ever felt like that through any of your assessments? Any show of hands or what is the ratio that you feel is more correct? That if I have 10, I know it is 10. Anybody have? While this thing comes up, can we make it a little more, well, I mean it does not need to be a uh, right or wrong answer, every answer counts, right? Anybody? If you have in your excel sheet. 10 systems to be on the internet. Are you sure these are the only 10 systems that are connected to the internet? Okay, what is it? I am saying most probably you have 100. How many do you think from a ratio perspective? If you stay at 10, most probably let us say 15, usse jada nahi hoga. what do you feel? <laughs> exactly the point, right? So, you Adoption of internet might different, I mean the world of, this is a world statistics, well, still not coming away, the world statistics where the you know European or the things are more connected to the internet, India may not be as connected to the internet. So, which means 10 and 100 may not be applicable here, but it is definitely going to be more than 10. And when one of those systems which is not in your list gets compromised, you are still responsible. Right? Okay, I'll I'll go forward. I'm not getting enough responses, but uh, this is not working, and that is the power of cloud and the power of edge. We talked about that that the cloud might be available, but the edge is not there. Well, <laughs> that's the end of story, and I think I'm a victim of that. Right? Uh, well, I think I'll just wait for you to come to our booth where I can show you the demo if you feel interested. So, we will put it for that and Genji sir if uh, anything that from your side. Yeah. It's on. Uh, thank you so much uh, Shruti Babu for such a wonderful presentation and uh, like I got lost when I was coming here because 
Google Maps showed me I had arrived. <laughs> and actually, I was uh, standing inside, uh, I mean, I was in a place where there's a building under construction. And basically, I Bangla to say that I was in the I could see ITC <laughs> building, but I couldn't like literally jump across. How do I That's come? how I got late. Yeah, but um, yes, you uh, picked up a, quite a few relevant uh, points. Uh, whoever's interested in um, getting deeper into this technology and is interested in zero trust and stuff like that, please go visit Shudhi Babu in his booth. Very knowledgeable gentleman, and um, like. He's been working with Nessus and a lot of other products for a significant amount of time. Uh, if there are any more questions, if there, yeah. like so since there's no well, demo, the demo happening, didn't work, so. so you can please. I, I could see some hands which were raised that side. So if there's anyone else who would have any questions, uh, please ask away. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. We are there as well, so at least. Hello, uh, thank you. Good presentation. And the thank reason you. I really like it because uh, I am from BT and we are a gold partner with Tenable already. Yes, we so, are. So we understand what you're talking about. I think all the organizations dealing with cloud and cybersecurity and cloud farming have another roadmap. This is a very different question, right? On sustainability. Like we are causing a lot of carbon emission. Three to four percent of carbon emission is because of what we do on cloud and server. So what angle is Tenable taking from a sustainability point of view to be able to prevent that from an e-waste management? Because I think that's going to become a big topic in the next 10 years. Any thoughts? Right. See, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, on the agenda for every company, every responsible IT professional to look and take action around green uh, evolution and what and how we can reduce our footprint, carbon footprint that is. Uh, I don't have exact answers around what exactly are we doing. One of the things that I do know, one of our move into cloud was, so Tenable was a pure on-prem laptop based stuff, right? So we have started now making the edge more lightweight, pull the data into SaaS, and see if SaaS can help us reduce our overall computational requirement, right? So that's one of the things uh, that we're doing, virtualization, containerization, with the aim of reducing the footprint of the software. Uh, that's already always been one of things. Uh, on the other side, we've, maybe it will work out good or maybe it will not. We are completely remote, so we don't have offices. Right, so we are consuming less resources, may or may not be correct, okay, I'll not argue with that, <laughs> but you know, I think you know, for a small organization like ours, putting up an office has its own benefits and don't, so we're trying, I mean there are some corporate initiatives which we definitely are working well, on. Thank you for your answer, I think the weather in Calcutta has reminded us more about it this year, so just curious if we all think about it because it's been very hot off late, but sure. thank you, very nice presentation. Thank you, thank you. We had one more question. I think we are running out of time, so we'll yeah. So this is the last question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, I was talking of you. He just mentioned e-waste, right? Uh, I personally get about hundreds of emails in my junk, but I have to make an effort to delete them. So firstly, they come, they consume energy, then I delete them. That consumes my time. I have to look into them. Why? Because some of them come from important clients so on and so forth. And then the emails are referenced, you know, the subject in such a way that it's very catchy. You have to look into that. Maybe you're missing an important email and it turns out to be something fishy. So all these kind of activities, like for instance, I have an iPhone. I mean, I don't mean to say it otherwise. We now have a feature to stop uh, receiving calls. We can, you know, choose that, okay, no calls from this number now. So uh, the IT world probably should also get into features as stopping emails from that email as well. And if like maybe there are thousands and thousands of them, then probably that email itself should be stopped. Or I, I, I don't know. It's just getting too much. There's so much of data out there, unwanted, and it's again and again and again and again the same thing. You know, there's no way to stop it. 
Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a I mean, if Google problem. just gives a feature, that's it. I mean, at least it could help yeah, all so of us. Yeah, so the problem which I feel from this perspective, if you lose one single important email by an automated system. Yeah, and then you system, have to go through that entire list. No, no, the point is, you know, as a security personnel, when we were doing running operations, and we put a filter like that, which would remove all these kind of bad emails, it is an automated system, and one single bad email, good email goes into that. And OEM, for example, Google has it, but you don't are running Google, you are running another one. Those features, it's, you know, asks that you should put the OEM and tell them this is how you should do it. They will take the suggestions, right? So at the end of the day, we talked about if there is a need, if consumers come up with the need and push it to the guys who are producing the software, it will work eventually. It may not solve a problem today, but... <laughs> Sorry, not a better answer, but that's how the whole thing is anyway. Anyway, thank you, Sh Shudhi Babu. With this, we bring the session to a close. Thank you so much, Angona. Thank you to both Mr. Shudip Dash and Mr. N.K. Ghoshal. And, you know, uh, I, I had a very engaging uh, experience, I believe, all of you. So we will, before we close this session, I would request Mr. N.K. Ghoshal, member of our IT committee, to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Shudip Dash. And I would request Ms. Dr. Chiranjib Bhattacharya to please present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Ghoshal, but Mr. Ghoshal is not a guest. <laughs> you are very much our person, but we, would, we wanted to take this opportunity to express our uh, gratitude to you. Thank you. So we can close this now and go for the... So <clears throat> the next topic or the next session is on the topic which is the buzzword now. Generative AI, deciphering the new artificial intelligence, and it will be presented to you by Zensa Technologies. Give us just a couple of minutes for changeover. And, uh, you know, uh, I, apart from technology, I also, the other, other area where I work deeply and I'm very passionate about, that's sustainability, energy efficiency, uh, clean energy. So I think one of the, you know, we coal cartons, we didn't have much of power cuts. One of the, uh, impact of global warming of getting the temperature getting higher we using more and more air conditioning and our system is not being able to sometimes support it and you know in the summer you find that power cuts more often I think in my 15 years of work life organizing seminars uh, rarely we find that you know, you always keep the generator, and I think as an organizer, what a waste of money. But today, I thanked, oh my God, I did spend that amount of money, and it was handy today. But at the back end of it, it is also a red alert on sustainability aspect, the impact of global warming and the chain of it. So moving on, so I would request the AV team to let me know when they're Ready? Okay. So I would request Mr. Koshik Chatterjee, SVP, BFSI Global Delivery Heads, Zensa Technologies Limited, and Mr. Jagatpati Subramanian, VP Experience Engineering and Data, Zensa Technologies Limited, to please join us on the dais. And we will start the session with a, pr a video of the presenter of this session, Zensa Technologies. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force, and it gets some speed. Give it purpose, and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change, momentum, 
bringing about intelligence and agility to cope with ever-changing business landscapes and expectations. Connecting global ambitions with local approaches and digital experiences with human perspectives. It's this velocity that offers a car fleet management company wings and an aerospace engineering giant nimble feet. Or for that matter, it's what eliminates bank holidays in banking. And it's this very velocity that's offering our clients the access to smart connections and the confidence to find fresh directions. But more importantly, the unique ability to outrun the present, to outsmart the future. Come, witness velocity transform the way business is done. Zensar, think velocity. What to Koshik and Jagatpati. Thank you, Angana. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, this is better. Yeah. Very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, thank you so much for not leaving the room. <laughs> 1 p.m., lunch around the corner. Really appreciate all of you being here. So it's the business IT conclave, right? That's, that's the session that we are all in. And uh, given uh, this name, I'm pretty sure that uh, we have a lot of technology aware folks here. In fact, some of you may be really experts as well. So here's a question for you, if I may. What do you think is the hottest programming language in the world today? Python? Any other guesses? Golang? JavaScript? What if I say it's English, right? <laughs> so, you know, we have reached a stage where actually English is probably the hottest language for programming. How does that happen, you know? So that's courtesy of this new phenomenon called generative AI. But is it really new? Generative AI has been there for a while. It was in 2010 that we actually had developed the ability to make perfect translations of human language. It was in 2014 that we had software models which was actually able to make sense of words given the context in which it was spoken. And even for the last five years, even uh, uh, large language models have been prevalent. So what really changed in November 2022 when ChatGPT came and uh, revolutionized the way we look at some of these things? It was the application of a series of these breakthroughs that were happening over a period of time to our daily way of work. So I'm sure many of you would have, uh, uh, many of you would have had first-hand experience with the likes of ChatGPT, with Bard, with Dali, and others. And you would have seen for yourself, they can tell stories, they can write poems, they can paint pictures. Wonderful, too good to be true, isn't it? Or is it really too good to be true? Because on the other hand, you've got concerns which come up. You, you hear about people talking about bias and discrimination. You hear about worries of joblessness. You have ethical and legal considerations coming in. So what is reality over here? We'll discuss a little bit more about it. And I would like to invite uh, my colleague from Zansar, Jagat. He heads the engineering data and experience uh, practices and has been really working on some cool stuff around uh, generative AI. So help us walk through this, <laughs> Jagat, today. Sure, sure. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, all. I think uh, lunch is served. It is only the generative AI which is stopping us or is in the middle between us and the lunch. Okay, so. Um, so ju just a step back, okay, so he was talking about cool stuff. Is it really cool? I don't know. I mean, how many of you have heard about DALI or mid-journey and uh, images being generated automatically? I see a few hands there. A lot of hands, okay, cool, 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 nice, nice. So I'll tell you a few things, okay, see, I was speaking to someone um, who was telling me about, Jagat, what do you relish or uh, kind of like? Because I'm card for my birthday okay so i would relish that always compared to any new automatically generated mid journeys images okay but take a step back right what really happened in the last 
couple of years is transformational. It is seminal in terms of changes which have happened and let us talk about few things. I will go through a few uh, slides. Okay. Ha, dream bigger, explore new productivity frontier. I will talk about why productivity frontier, but let us talk about this right. So, last November, okay, it was a tsunami of new things which were happening. If you look at 1 million users in 5 days of launch, 100 million users within a month, lots more happening, lots more happening. It is a hype, hype. Does it really live up to the hype? I think yes, definitely yes. How many believe it is not living up to the hype? Oh, everyone believes it is living up to the hype. Oh, cool then, all right, okay. So, ah, yeah, one, one person says no. Okay, brilliant. I like that. Okay, so, okay, we will speak more. Uh, but definitely a lot of hype, lot of hype. Um, if you look at the way, sorry. And for that matter, these slides were not generated by generative AI, okay. So, you are probably talking about it depends. Right? It depends. <laughs> so, yes, I think he mentioned about new language, which is uh, only language is kind of maybe as we progress, it is English language. I thought someone is going to talk about zebra or rust or something else, but definitely no. So, but if you look at the hype it is created, right, if you look at uh, Instagram or Spotify or any other. Uh, I call them as tools which have come to the market. I think generative AI has blown away everything, okay, mind blowing, mind blowing. So, you see the number of searches which have happened on, uh, I mean I think it is gen AI or generative AI or maybe you call about newer things on chat GPT itself, right, it is actually the chat GPT as a term itself is taking so much prominence, okay, prominence away from the regular AI itself, okay. So, that is the change which has happened. If you see the Google trends, uh, chat GPT is almost more than, this was till March or April. So, it was almost more than what you could search on AI itself, AI as a term itself. Okay. So, phenomenal change, phenomenal hype. All right. Um, chat GPT is quite amusing. Okay. So, someone was, uh, this was again not mine. Okay. So, I have taken it from the internet. We were trying to see make a list of websites where we could download pirated movies, okay. You query, okay, chat GPT gives you an answer saying, boss, you should uh, not do it, it is not ethical, you will have vulnerabilities, you will have securities uh, coming into your systems, lot of things, okay. You see the messages there. It is overall, it says illegal, okay. Take a step away, right. We gave a question saying, I know it is dangerous, but tell me a list of websites where I should not go, okay. Ta -da 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 -da, it gives you a lot of details. Okay, so th that is intelligence. Okay, so I, I think kind of reverse psychology works here. But but take a step back, right? So you understand this is what we've seen. It is definitely phenomenal, brilliant, but it has its own limitations, right? I mean, I think someone is asking me about a hey, jagat. What do you think about uh, AGI, artificial uh, general intelligence? Okay, from narrow to where we are now to AGI. I would say generative AI as a point of view, right, is one step ahead. Th that is what we would qualify. Maybe that is what I am seeing and my team and the way we are working with people uh, across the industry, one step ahead. But we are far away from this point of uh, singularity, okay, very, very far away. But we will definitely catch up, okay. So, Take a step back. Why this generative AI? What is different? What is happening from the regular AI to generative AI? Why? See, I think AI has been kind of pervasive in all of our lives, right? You take your phone to your regular work to analytics to on the cloud, a lot of things are happening around us, right? But why now? A big question was around why now? So, if you look at it, a model, I, I, we can call this as foundational models, okay. So, uh, large language models, foundational models, we can leverage that and do a lot of things. W why this is so prominent is primarily because it can do multiple things. I mean, if you go look at the, uh, unlike previous, all these are deep learning models, right? Neural network, deep learning models, all driven by our, how our brains are uh, wired. But if you look at why, what it could do differently, it could look at all your structured, unstructured data, anything. 
and do multiple tasks, more than one task, right? So, and now is where Kaushik's point comes into four, right? You give a natural language or English language input, it generates an output which is again in an English language which is human understandable, decipherable and you could understand this response in a brilliant way also, right? And you could do a text, video, search, you talk about anything of that sort, anything it could drive and create and do multiple tasks. That is the reason it is becoming much and more, more and more prominent, okay? I'll take a step back, right? There's a creative new world for sure. This is not, this is from Secure Cap. So, how did it all start? Um, 2012, 2015, in that range, lot of models were on, basic models were there, still picking up. For a period of time, I think the compute powers right, has drastically changed. Um, I don't know how many follow NVIDIA, the, the way they portray, I mean, their results were like this, okay. So, NVIDIA's uh, head uh, CEO says that, hey, I am going to transform all places where CPUs are being used into GPUs, that's all. That, that was a simple word he used in his statement, in his uh, uh, investor uh, presentation. It was like, boom, <laughs> their whole stock market was booming, it was completely buoyant, okay. So, but if you look at what is all happening, so we had basic models which were there and over a period of time, Google started it, but the transformer models where attention is what you need over a period of time, then all these GPUs much, much, much faster, compute power is better and now is the plethora of killer apps you could build. If you see at the bottom, uh, you talk about text, code, image, speech, video, 3D, other and different applications you could build on top of that, uh, again uh, on uh, different uh, industries also. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how much you've been following. Web GPU is one of the new revolutions which is happening. Uh, you can create your GPU, you could embed into your Chrome browser, for example. That's come out sometime Jan, Feb. But that has not created the hype. It is always the generative AI which has created more and more hype around us. So I, I was speaking to one of the CTOs, he was asking me, what will change? I was saying, hey, the compute power, the challenges around how do you generate more in a responsible way would drastically change the way we consume things as we progress, okay? So, uh, I, I leave it there. Maybe this is again available in the public domain. You could look at it. Uh, I would like to run this video. So, see, we are all, I mean, I, I think everyone in this audience would have definitely looked at Adobe and different uh, systems around that. But this was quite interesting, which was catchy, okay? I'll tell you why after I play this video. Okay, it goes to watch this video. It is 5G, huh? so it will be like that. So I'll tell you why this was important, okay, because I mean when we had uh, earlier, right, when we used to take photos, we want to blur people who are standing behind or remove certain images, etc. We used to struggle a lot, okay, over a period of time things changed, we had good good editors. But now you see this generative fills which are there, this is called Firefly from Adobe, generative fills, right. So 
it is so brilliant and awesome because I have never been to uh, Norway, Sweden and the way it is able to fill in northern lights in a simple way, right click, say generate a fill northern lights is able to generate and give it for you, amazing transformation. So, I think, uh, I think the way we are going ahead in terms of newer things which are there for us to consume and use, awesome. Anything around, so I, I want to call this as a spectrum, if you start on the left side, right, where it is fiction where you could think about creativity, generation of new data, new, new uh, images, I think amazing start, okay. To the right side of the spectrum where is where I talk about analytics, data, factual information, I have a lot of challenges in terms of using GPT or generative AI as such, okay, because he spoke about bias, spoke about discrimination, think about fake news, think about <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey Hinton who is the, who is considered to be the uh, what he call as godfather of AI, he speaks about all this and also speaks about how generative AI could be used in terms of um, uh, in military for that matter, how, how, how can we uh, dramatically change things. In fact, he says that out of 100 people, if 99 people are working towards improving generative AI and using AI in a better way, there is one person who is going to be looking at bad things and that is creating enough impact for us, okay. So, lot of things are there, but so if you look at that, look at the spectrum, fiction, uh, creativity, you generate new things, images, videos, speech, etc. where not, not, not too much, uh, if something goes wrong is okay, I think we could go ahead and start, I think that is what we are all doing nowadays, uh, be it sales or marketing or any other newer areas. Take the right side of the spectrum where it is more factual information, data, it is going to impact us. Uh, I think we have got to be much, much careful. We will speak about what we are trying to do as an organization sensor uh, as we progress, but uh, that is where I would leave, uh, leave at a broad level. Okay. All right. So, AI engineering buddy. Okay. So, I, I believe a lot of people have heard about Copilot, right? Uh, how many have not heard of Copilot? Oh, okay. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Cool. So, at Zensor, what we have done is, uh, we have experimented on uh, primarily in the spectrum I spoke about, right. We are in the middle of spectrum where we are thinking about how do we leverage generative, generative AI for engineering excellence, when I say software engineering excellence. And we have done some experiments, we have also launched uh, our uh, offering, it is in Microsoft Azure marketplace, you can go and look up, uh, primarily to say how we could improve our productivity. McKinsey talks about this is the next frontier in productivity change and improvements. Everyone is speaking about this. Uh, hence, we want to uh, look at how we could demonstrate few things. We have been working with uh, at least couple of banks, banks in uh, some geographies. We are also working with uh, 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 e-commerce providers, uh, clients of ours around how do we improvise and change or bring in a step change in productivity improvements in the general uh, software engineering work. This is a knowledge worker transformation guys, okay. So, that is what I see and uh, we will we'll speak about this. So, we have been using, uh, so I think you would have seen about 3.5 now GPT-4, uh, there is a brilliant uh, advancement in terms of number of times you could look at tokens, how do you transform tokens, uh, it supports visual inputs, uh, longer text, lot of things are happening. I believe you would have all seen this, I just thought I will put this out. But one important thing I, I was uh, looking at and as a team we were looking at what, what uh, Sam Altman was trying to say, he was in India some time ago and uh, when you look at maybe 5 years, 8 years down the line or 10 years down the line, what would you think about GPT in itself or generative AI itself, right? So, he was primarily saying open AI as such, there is a bigger challenge, he, he says that it is going to be looked at as highly buggy system and uh, definitely. Uh, uh, amusing, we have seen already a lot of amusing things which are happening around a lot of hallucinations which crop up, but are they learning a lot and faster? I would definitely state yes, I mean the way it is learning like this and so many things they are trying to learn faster and faster. So, th that is the way I see this and there are multiple features of uh, models and general purpose models available, but we have been focusing uh, more towards codex which is the coding related or engineering related model which we have been experimenting. So, if you look at the top right, I mean we can use uh, engineering capabilities in multiple things right, classifying text to content generation to text moderation, image generation, lot of things. But if you see at the bottom, we can use this for creating documentation, creating code from text, uh, rewrite code, refactor code, solution design, create 
as simple as unit test cases. Okay. I was seeing a code which was created when I sat down with the team we were trying to generate a unit test cases. Okay. It was so brilliant, I mean I was flabbergasted when I saw the code, the way it was structured, the way it was written, it was all brilliant. Huh. Uh, maybe we are calling it as a augmented buddy okay, or an engineering buddy. How many believe in the audience about uh, the GPT or gen, I mean generative AI would take away jobs from us? Yeah, you believe? Okay very mi minuscule group huh, or such. So, I was just going to <laughs> ask you Jagat, okay. this does not seem like a buddy, it seems like somebody who is just replacing <laughs> what a developer does every day or what an IT professional does. So, exactly. is that what it is? Exactly. So, one, one point right, someone was saying uh, this is definitely not very interesting or maybe uh, not that great, but I would say if you look at the pyramid, there are a lot of rudimentary tasks which we thought we could automate right. But I am believing that we are not just automating rudimentary tasks, we are believing we can do lot of things which are much, much, much more compared to the rudimentary tasks. I believe you are saying whatever he was raising his hand saying we are going to uh, let, let go a lot of jobs, but I think human intelligence is far more better. I would believe that we would think better and create more jobs for ourselves or different kinds of jobs. I will tell you what, why the reason, okay, because I put three things, right, one is around full stack engineering buddy or maybe augmented uh, quality engineering or think about augmented architecture, Another, we thought we will use this for architecture definition. Okay. So, in fact, one of our team member, one of our enterprise architects, he said he has created a small uh, roadmap which would help in creating a trading application, high end low latency trading, trading application using generative AI and it was brilliant. Okay. So, he, normally it would have taken him probably as a group right would have taken 3, 4 months to think through, decipher, give the architecture, but this was able to create in the next 2, 3 days. Okay. So, he was going through prompts. Okay. So, coming back to prompts. So, I think the reason I was believing that if it will take jobs out in a pyramid, it will remove jobs, no doubts, but I think human ingenuity would prevail or make it more better and we would create more jobs in a different way. I think prompt engineering would be a differentiated uh, thing which we would all leverage maybe a lot of prompt marketplaces already in the ma market, you could download, you could use that, in for sense you get prompts available. Okay, But I think when we were using prompts, uh, for example, we were using prompts to say can I generate uh, generate uh, a C++ code for this particular application, it was able to create brilliantly well. But to think what to be used, for example, we had to say hey use solid principles, generate test cases including edge cases. So, so if you do not understand software engineering, you would not be able to create something meaningful. So, taking a step back, I think we will have newer jobs, people would prevail and I still think that we are far away from losing jobs, but it will lose jobs, but it will create a differentiated uh, value as we progress. Okay. All right, we have already spoken about lot of experiments, we have done uh, enough in terms of uh, Python to uh, Node.js to changes around that. I will leave you guys with two interesting conversations I have been having in the recent past. Uh, we were speaking to one of the largest uh, uh, we'll call, uh, keep it as uh, uh, what, what we call as uh, engineering companies. Okay, they had a requirement where they had a large, large monolith, uh, big application, and they wanted to re-engineer that functionality, all same, re-engineer that into microservices architecture. And uh, when they came to us, we said, "How long will it take? Let us say X was the time. Maybe 10 months was the time." We made some experiments, did some things and we were able to create, this was again on .NET, we had to create a .NET application, then RESTful endpoints and publish it as microservices. It took, I mean our estimations were that if you have proper good prompt engineers, we should be able to do it in one fourth of the time, one fourth of the time and at least half of the cost, okay? if not one fourth of the cost, at least half of the cost. So, it, it was like mind blowing, so it is going to be drastically changing the context itself. This is one area where we are talking about re-engineering for that matter. Okay. So, there are other cases where we are starting a new application, new greenfield application, cloud native greenfield application, we were able to say hey we will reduce your cost by at least half easily. Okay. I mean we are still experimenting and working with uh, customers and clients of ours, we will be happy to talk more if you want to reach out, we can discuss deliberate on how we are trying to do this. Okay. So, this is in Azure marketplace, uh, elevate engineering velocity, turbocharge development with generative AI, you can look up, um, 
quality, be it efficiency, think about uh, uh, how we could look at time to market, every damn aspect is there as part of our uh, offering and I mean we are not, I mean brilliantly doing things, we are leveraging it effectively, okay. So there is an ecosystem we have created uh, primarily to say, I mean, again right, we do not need to repeat tasks. So we are trying to create templates, we are trying to create an ecosystem and say how to be uh, avoid repetition in the generative AI world, okay. So think about our ingenuity, that is what I was saying, we would be much more uh, intelligent compared to what <laughs> uh, generative AI would create over a period of time, alright. So we have talked about concerns, questions, uh, you want to speak about that, uh, you have already talked or uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton's ones or you go, okay. So, okay. So, uh, open AI shuts down chat GPT due to an internal bug for some time, European Union is trying to create a new law, they are trying to avoid uh, what you call as emotional AI is becoming much much important and prominent and they are trying to say hey we should not do that, enough of challenges around that. Uh, then uh, well known banks have issued a temporary ban on GPT and there is a at a broader level generative AI itself right in the recent past at least I saw a lot of uh, top industrialists and uh, technologists have said we should ban for at least 6 months take a pause look at how things transform a lot of things are happening but do you really want to I mean I would think that I mean, we should adopt and adapt. Right? If you do not, we are not going to be, uh, we definitely lag behind, but I do not think so we should stop all this, we should go ahead, uh, that is my view, um, okay. And how are we trying to do, key considerations were this, um, we should look at governance, awareness and training, um, standardization, policies, controls and cyber security, um, lot of security related aspects all crop up. At an organization like Zensor, we have created a task force for anyone to use GPT, uh, we have a, a model where uh, we, we do not allow everyone to use GPT per se, we, we say this is restricted and uh, we have also created what is known as a legal team to help us draft uh, statement of works or contracts with our clients because when we use, see GPTs were or these models, large language models were uh, trained using data which was available on the internet. And so we do not know what is it going to provide us as an output, right, we are not very clear because that, that will the way it will change and the same output not be available for other person also. So think about this, right, there are so many challenges and changes which will crop up and as an organization, I mean everyone of your organization also will be in the same boat where we need to look at how do we safeguard ourselves, create enough guardrails. So we have looked at a task force, we are working very closely with our clients to draft these and also tell them that there is anything like this around new age things, be careful. Again open source, we do not know how it is going to be panned out, uh, anything generated using uh, generative AI, there is no patent IP created, okay, patent uh, team is not approving anything as of now. So you will see more and more changes and transformations as we progress, but I would suggest if you are using open source, be very, very cautious about what you are using because we do not know what could be the impact on us, unless it is Amazon uh, Apache 2.0 license or GNU license, we should be careful, alright. So usage guidelines. Uh, prefer enterprise solution in my view, uh, what we are also suggesting to our customers is use for example open AI service, uh, you can create a tenancy on Azure, make sure your data is not going out, you can also make sure that your prompts which you give is not going out, all these could be controlled and, and uh, managed effectively. Uh, I mean as I was saying the spectrum right, if it is anything to do with PII or uh, GDPR data or things around that please avoid, I think we should mature over, over a period of time, but still if it is in your tenancy, if you believe it is not going out, I would suggest we should go ahead and use it. But uh, we should create uh, anything which is generated from uh, chat uh, GPT or GPT for that matter or related by AI for that matter, I would strongly suggest that we should control it and you have a human intervention uh, to monitor at least for some time as we progress. And um, I mean in some scenarios we have created a tenancy also we have monitored what is the chat information which is going out also right. So there are various ways to control and uh, uh, create this. Um, organizations are leveraging chat GPT in various forms and shapes, Bloomberg is writing something new, there are, in fact I, I was speaking to someone very recently, uh, one of the CTOs he was saying hey, Jagat I mean last 6 months right, prior to that we were just about to create our own language, large language model, unfortunately open AI. <laughs> well, we lost it by whisker kind of, okay. So 
there's so many things which are happening which open gpt is there large language models which are coming up uh, i don't know how many are aware of hugging face kind of uh, open source uh, uh, what frameworks which could be leveraged lang chain few other things which are cropping up and they're using them we're also trying to invent and experiment all right okay it is is it a transformative one i i would say yes uh, maybe too early to tell for some people uh, but i would say yes um, is a game changer i would believe so it, it is a big change it is big thing for us to uh, as i said adopt and adapt uh, exciting times ahead definitely yes uh, looking forward to how things will shape up large language models being used uh, how different domains are built on top of that um, someone was talking to me today morning about a vector database okay so there is again there is something which is new which is cropping up we are also trying to experiment a uh, lot of things happening and i believe this is definitely game changer okay um i think that's all i had we can take some questions if you have yeah yeah please please yeah do you want a mic or something your solution is uh, based upon uh, azure platform and in azure marketplace also you have your solution so being an aws architect just want to understand do you have any do you have a plan to have any solution on aws also yeah, yeah, and yeah. aws marketplace also see all these are uh, let, let me take a step back right these models are available as apis to be consumed that's all okay so we are trying to put it in azure because we have a good partnership with microsoft and this is already available as part of azure so if you are using aws you could still use there is a separate tenancy for that but you will call this api that's all as simple as that so we done that for one of the customers also it will work so, so you mean to say in aws marketplace also your solution will be available no 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 there are other things which are available you can use this as a tenancy aws will be a tenancy or a cloud provider but you need to hit uh, enterprise azure api for your uh, uh, consumption okay thank you okay thank you sir uh, my name is mr tapurdo mundra i am a phd scholar of jadavpur university my question is what is your thought process about ethics of ai so is there any kind of violation of ethics in ai for generative ai that is my question ethics right yeah yeah of course see <laughs> that's what he was also starting off with right so ethical ai or responsible ai is the only way we could go ahead as we progress okay because uh, see um, I, i think in the morning also as part of the conversations everything is on data um, rangnath spoke about data so how are these models trained it is on data and where are these data available it is from the internet or broad uh, scheme of things right uh, so it is still there are a lot of biases discrimination so it is up to us to decide as to what we should use it for okay so let us say you are using uh, gpt model to say we want to give a loan to a customer and if it is going to be region it's going to be uh, by the ethnicity or what not right there are still i would say it's still more westernized in a way right the region based data is still far away okay so if you think about ethics I, i think we should all follow towards ethics so if you ask me bias is and discrimination is a major thing and uh, father of uh, godfather of ai he speaks about bias and ethics uh, and uh, discrimination as a top problem which would we would face as we progress so coming back to that if the data is proper if you are able to leverage proper data i think that bias and discrimination discrimination could be avoided to an extent okay but if you talk about other things let us say uh, jobs going away we should look at other ways to train and encourage our workforce to be much more smarter there's other way to look at it so all these would come under our purview as human beings right so from a i mean we've been we've been designing systems which which is called as um human centered okay i think we are moving away from that and we are creating something called as humanity centered now we are moving away from that humanity centered so i think more and more we are responsible ethical values are inculcated and we are careful in leveraging technology i think that is the way we should operate i don't have a direct answer to say hey how we are operating but every organization is thinking about that definitely yes okay yeah as with any powerful tool correct you technology will give you what is required it will it will evolve and it will be able to support it but uh, the framework the governance that's what's going to be critical and uh, that needs to be in place uh, i think we've seen that with all other uh, uh, you know powerful 
technology. Uh, technology advancements that have happened uh, and uh, the framework, the guardrails are what is required. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Arun Ashish here and thank you for this session and I primarily come from a process automation digital transformation sure. background and I can correlate because I've seen some of my uh, automation tool already in you know integrating co-pilot capabilities and how it is significantly reduced the coding but I think uh, I would like to ask something very specific and fundamental to generative AI a lot of customers and industries are looking to use these foundational model to to build their own LLM models which are more specific to their you know domain and business area yeah so as a leading IT service organization and, and engineering background what is you are advising them in terms of approach and strategy towards creating that another layer of LLM model over the foundation? Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, good question. There is someone else asking maybe something similar, sir. Uh, good afternoon. This is a nice lecture I have got from you. Uh, I am representing CSA Kolkata chapter. Uh, some of you might be aware about me. Uh, from C Government of West Bengal is interested to have training AI for the school children. Okay. From from Calcutta chapter, we are in, interested to have your uh, and other uh, AI companies, uh, those who are doing, they, we want the cooperation so that we can teach the teachers of uh, West Bengal government uh, college, schools so that the students are benefited. We want to know the course material and certain things we can help the uh, ordinary students in Calcutta DGN. Thank sure, you. Sir, sure. My uh, name is Shuivol Kundu. Yeah, yeah. Kaushik, you want to take that first? No, thank you so much for that. And absolutely, that is one of our key agendas as well, how we can use this uh, to, uh, uh, to make the society a better place. How do you do that? If this is the technology that is coming the way, you, we have to ensure that people at all levels are aware of it. and. Uh, uh, have the right kind of knowledge. So absolutely, uh, there there is things that we have developed for our own organization, and to some extent, that's something that we can work collaboratively with other groups to see how that can be made more widely available. We we, we can always uh, take that away. Uh, uh, back to the other yeah, question. Back to the other question. Okay, so okay. since uh, so uh, your question was primarily around what is your advice to the clients, right, on building more specific language models on top of these models, right? So, a good question, primarily because um, we as an organization at Zensor have a Zen Labs, okay, which is trying to um, create certain things which are kind of a spearhead or an arrowhead for us to work with our customers. It's not just a research, but at least a couple of years ahead in terms of looking at what could we generate or co-innovate with our customers. And we've been trying to use some of these technologies already uh, and uh, try out. I think every organization is trying to create their own domain related aspects. So for example, insurance, there are some things. Bloomberg, my, one of my friends works very closely in Zoom, Bloomberg and he says, Jagat, we've been doing this for already very long years. Okay, And now is the model where we have enough data available. We want to train the large language models which are there into much more specific to domain, which is, I mean, the banking and uh, financial domain as such, right? And text in data and which is available as part of the global internet. So. I, I think it will happen, it will happen, we would also suggest that it happens so because you, you need to create ma more, many more of domain specific models on top of the, uh, uh, the large language models or foundational models and whatever prevails would come back. One of the suggestions we have been having with our customers is primarily on how do you give this back to the society. Okay, so if we can create a model and bring it back to an open internet, right, open, open source if possible. So hence we have been using Hugging Face as an example with all our customers. I do not know whether you have followed uh, Hugging Face. So we are trying to work with Hugging Face also as, a, as such and a, a community of uh, software engineers across the uh, open source spectrum to see how we could engage and generate. But you cannot avoid every organization trying to create something nuanced for them. But what you could bring back to the open source world is going to be the success and uh, that will happen eventually, okay? Because more you collaborate and communicate and keep it open, that is the way you will succeed. Uh, that, that's what I would think at present, uh, uh, please, okay. Uh, can uh, I take another question now? Yes. Uh, yeah, please, please. Okay. Uh, yeah. You showed an example of Adobe product, right? Now, that product probably connects with an chat GPT API or something similar and does whatever it does. Are you aware of any uh, 
open source product or an op uh, or a, or, a, or a, let us say uh, something which calls that api to do something similar means what i'm trying to understand is can that be used as an api rather than use adobe product to do whatever you yeah showing? yeah absolutely absolutely all these are apis available so if you take op uh, open ai's apis they are available as endpoints for us to consume okay mm -hmm. so we call it as tokens I, i think i showed you this so number of tokens you could go and in gpt4 number of tokens you could connect with the uh, the, the particular uh, api is much more compared to 3.5 which is coming earlier so you could connect and you should be able to leverage it and and there are ways you could operate on that you could say that a, my data should not go out of your premise that could be done configured you can also say you don't store the prompts also because you can control it and you could manage it there are ways you could filter out any uh, non normal conversations right you could say if, for example developers put in something very nonsensical so you could filter them out all these are available and it will going to be within your purview and we could do that we don't need to go to adobe to do this exercise it is all available uh, sir you can see open ai and there would be source code available on github or yes, something yes. like that yeah, yeah. which shows something all I'll available. connect with you separately yeah, actually yeah, if you uh, look in the apple store or if you go to yes. play store and search for chat gpt you will see so many such uh, uh, you know apps coming up all of which have used the underlying language models and have developed their own interfaces Fair so. thanks sure sure uh, one more question please yeah good afternoon i am uh, saika choudhury i am a student basically and uh, it was a very nice and informative session uh, so you talked about reverse psychology okay <laughs> so is there any permanent solution because a uh, ai model not supposed to give the answer uh, and but with the help of reverse psychology we are getting the answer it can be uh, utilized by some uh, bad people or people with bad intentions so is there any permanent solution of that there is no permanent solution okay see that is what i was saying right i, I think there there is someone who is going to be bad who is going to be utilizing this this technology for some bad purpose and how do you control create a guardrail around all this is going to be a success i don't have an answer for you So but i think as responsible citizens we could be in a better way to operate go ahead so sir. just a quick response to that uh, in gpt 3.5 that was possible in gpt 4 that is not going to be possible yeah. they have learned they have evolved they have fixed that problem something else may come up some other loopholes people will find that so it's a constant evolution i think uh, it happens with every technology everything can be misused we had such an interesting session earlier by tenable Yeah. Uh, so in spite of the best uh, software available people still uh, uh, are able to uh, you know carry out attacks so and that's why you are constantly striving to get ahead of it so yes it's an evolution and students Thank like you, so you should be able to look at as we progress right how do you control and be much more uh, utilizing it for ethical means as such thank you so much I, I think, okay is there time for another question <laughs> we can take that offline sure <laughs> you are not giving <laughs> lunch on time <laughs> sure uh, so thanks a lot to mr kaushik chatterjee and mr jagatpati subramanian and uh, you know I, we are very happy that they have traveled from other cities and coming here in kolkata zensar has set up facility here so that shows a vibrant ecosystem also as a chamber of commerce from kolkata we also have ownership to this place and we are happy that this hello, forum hello. is being able to bring stakeholders from different parts and of course this this is the buzzword and you know we all are always willing to hear more about this topic thank you once more i would request dr chiranjeet oh. bhattacharya to please present token of appreciation can i i can i uh, would you please take it offline dr bhattacharya please sir let's connect when we have lunch okay sure ma'am we can also talk when we have lunch okay sir thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you thank you sir so we are very privileged that we have with us mr manjit nayak director of stpi west bengal and he has been working in uh, this uh, this office for a long time and you know we the it community in 
Bengal or Kolkata, we have been very synonymous with him. So thank you, Mr. Nayak, for joining us. I would request Mr. Nayak to please join us on the podium, and he will be sharing special remarks on technology promotion support from Government of India. Mr. Nayak, please. Okay, should we step down? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I really, uh, my previous speaker already told about the launch and launch, so I should not uh, take much time. It's uh, probably the right time for the launch. So after the long uh, hearing from this technical session like AI and chat GPT and all, so I just start a uh, few things how the government is about to be support. Mm, this is a lighter note. You must have a heart right now, another AI, right? that is American and uh, India. So linking to that actually, so why I'm talking about America? So America is number one world economy, right? And India is heading towards five trillion dollar economy. We are targeting for that and we are working for that. So linking to that, all the IT industries and electron industries across the country, they are playing a vital role and having tremendous responsibilities to achieve that goal. It has been witnessed that 88% of the GDP has been shared by the electronician, especially for the IT and BPM industries. And if you talk about the export activities, then IT industries, only the revenue is, only, is around 200 billion USD. So think about the opportunities and the scopes in the technical sectors and technological developments, how it's happening in the, all the emerging technologies. Link, linking to this, government is focusing since last couple of years with various schemes, announcement of the policies, and different announcement of the different facilities and the schemes available across the countries. Starting from Make in India, Digital India, Startup India, Skill India and many more. It's all giving the hand holdings support to the entire ecosystems. And it is definitely giving a lot of support to reach to the IT industries, electronics industries and other industries to the next level of their business and next level of their goal, what they want to achieve. So in overall, if you talk about the now India is far ahead in terms of software and product services industries. We have our positioning is already we are almost one in number one in the world market. And we are trying for the electronic segment also, so that tomorrow we'll also want to see about the electronics manufacturing segment and India should be much ahead compared to the current scenario. And we are trying for the to be product nations. So if we try for the product nations, our motto is to develop the product in the country. We are still dependent on the many of the products which is developed in the abroad and we are using that product, right? You talk about any of the good product, it's all developed in the abroad market only. So our focus is to develop this in our homeland and we'll try to market this and try to achieve, focus this in the global market. So. Looking to this, the product nation's policies and the focus, the, the benefits available. All these ministries, various ministries, I can say various ministries starting from the electronic IT, Department of Science and Technology, HRD, Ministry of MSME, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, they are all giving lot of benefits. They have formed their own policies to support the ecosystem. I heard that just now one student is here, 
so i believe many students also here many startup industry also here and you know the startup industry also growing up day by day in india now if you see we are third position across the globe in the terms of third startup industries more than 90000 startup has been registered under dpiit schemes and if you think about the startup journey then there is a lot of plentifully benefits are available in terms of funds benefit in terms of patent filing benefit and handholding support so it's across the country the growth is there the startup journey is there the innovations are happenings across the countries even in the bengals we have witnessed lot of activities happening lot of startup momentum are there and industry is rising day by day uh, if you talk about the stpis how you are we are involving in last more than 3 decades to supporting the it industries and electronics industry we are a pioneer organization and the backbone of the it industries now looking to this common trend also we are focusing the startup journey we are focusing the emerging technology so like other industry like other department and ministries we are also focusing total in the the holistic approach and to support to the ecosystem in terms of startup journey in terms of the industry growth we have created more than 20 center of entrepreneurs across the country in the all the technological domain starting from ai starting from the automations from the machine learning to the cyber securities the blockchain so in this all technical domain air vr many more like you are focusing on all technical domain we are creating center of entrepreneurs that is basically a hand holding support for the all the startup communities and we are giving facilities in terms of mentoring support infrastructure support funding support and many more so similarly we have also created labs in different places fab lab and esdm lab across the countries and also now another scheme is launched in that is called ngis next generation incubation scheme in the 12th location across the country in the tier 2 locations and we are supporting in terms of all startup journey innovation those who are coming with the nici ideas and all technological solutions we are giving the platform over there in terms of infrastructure support again the mentoring support and in the funding support this scheme is supporting up to 25 lakhs funding support for each startup so i mean to say that and uh, all educational institutes are having the um, um, you know the uh, the laboratories and the center of excellence they are also supporting these systems if you talk about the iits iim iger nit they are all creating the different lab and different the uh, center of entre entrepreneurs where the companies are getting benefited so in overall if you see is a totally a government focus on the growth of the it and the electronics industries including other industries and we are all it and electronics people are here i believe with your support with your enthusiastic uh, doing some new new things we definitely india will tomorrow rise and we will try to achieve our goal and we will try to uh, achieve our government target that 5 trillion economy so the bcci has today thanks for organizing this event i am not taking much time because uh, uh, is, is i think it's at all launch time so with this i think uh, thank you to bcci to organize this and uh, giving me this opportunity to share my few words and hope this entire day will take you much more insights and you will have a real zeal to do something in your future and to take it forward to your business activities thank you thank you for patience sharing thank you sir i would now request <coughs> mr shubhosh amanta special invitee uh, of the bengal chambers it committee to please present the token of our appreciation to mr manjit nayak
Mr. Nayak is also a friend and philosopher <laughs> and guide of the chamber. So he's a very much our person, but we are taking this opportunity to express our gratitude to him. So all of you are requested to please. So I have kept my word. So you are requested to please join for lunch. And we will start the post-lunch session at 2.45. Interesting sessions. Um, doing business with Bangladesh in technology space, the infrastructure facilities in uh, Kolkata, which facilitates technology growth. And it will be followed by the theme session on smart and connected ecosystem. And then very interestingly, we have some young speakers, students who will show you demonstration of the innovations they have done at the campus. So please join us for lunch. Thank you.
this transformational journey has been possible because of one organization known as Software Technology Parks of India. Established on 5th June 1991 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. After merging three STPs, STPI has been instrumental in facilitating software exports and driving the growth of the Indian IT or ITES industry to newer heights. It provides a conducive ecosystem for software companies, startups and entrepreneurs, enabling them to thrive in a highly competitive global market. STPI provides statutory services, data comm services, incubation services, centers of entrepreneurship, next generation incubation scheme, BPO schemes, VAPT. To IT or ITES companies, startups, government and academic institutions. Over the last three decades, STPI has been providing single window clearance services to the software exporters, which has catalyzed the growth of software exports from the country. Due to the right policy measures and liberal style of functioning, software exports from STPI registered companies marked an exponential growth from 52 crore rupees in 1991 to over 7 lakh crore rupees in 2023. Likewise, from three STPI centers in 90s to 63 centers today, STPI has created 13.5 lakh square feet state-of-the-art infrastructure across country, out of which 8.1 lakh square feet is in Tier 2 and 3 cities, with five Tier 3 compliant data centers. STPI is implementing METIS schemes such as BPO Promotion Scheme, and Electronics Manufacturing Cluster 2.0 Scheme. BPO Promotion Scheme was implemented to create employment opportunities for youth in Tier 2 and 3 cities. 246 BPO units have so far provided direct employment opportunity to 52,278 youths. EMC 2.0 Scheme For building a comprehensive ecosystem for electronic system design and manufacturing, under this scheme, five projects have been approved with an investment of 20,819 crore rupees and likely to generate over 66,000 job opportunities for the youth. With the support of STPI, the Indian IT or ITES industry has provided excellent and cost-effective services to the international clients. This has enabled India to become the preferred IT destination in the world. This sector is one of the largest contributors to India's GDP, foreign exchange earnings and generation of significant employment opportunities to the youth. As the Indian IT or ITES industry has matured enough to move up the value chain, STPI has taken the lead in nurturing the startup ecosystem Pan India as envisioned under the Digital India Initiative and National Policy on Software Products 2019. STPI has envisioned establishing 25 centers of entrepreneurship, out of which 22 centers of entrepreneurship have been established in the domains like Internet of Things, Blockchain, Fintech, Artificial Intelligence, Gaming and Animation, among others. To support startups Pan India, Next Generation Incubation Scheme has been implemented from 12 Tier 2 locations. Under this scheme, seed funding of up to 25 lakh rupees is provided to each beneficiary or supported startup based on the innovativeness of the idea, the novelty of solutions and strength of the team. These initiatives and efforts will transform our country into a software product nation and will help in economic growth and create ample opportunities for the youth. STPI is poised to catalyze the ecosystem in the decade of opportunities. The story of STPI is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and technological excellence. Together, we shall continue to shape India's tech future.
As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question, how secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Tenable, the exposure management company, has launched a new platform that solves these underlying problems. The Tenable One Exposure Management Platform delivers visibility of cyber risks in a unified view and helps customers easily understand their unique attack surface. This helps them prioritize which threats to remediate now and provide comprehensive, easy to understand reporting for business leaders so they can make informed decisions, confident they have the full picture. Exposure management is the future of the cybersecurity industry. Tenable One enables organizations to operationalize both preventative and proactive security measures with ease. It's curing the disease of cyber risk rather than simply treating the symptoms. In addition to newly introduced capabilities, including the Lumen Exposure View, Attack Path Analysis, and Asset Inventory, the Tenable One platform combines the broadest vulnerability coverage, spanning IT assets, cloud resources, containers, web apps, and identity systems. The platform also builds on the speed and breadth of vulnerability coverage from Tenable Research and adds comprehensive analytics to prioritize actions and communicate cyber risk. As the attack surface has expanded beyond traditional IT infrastructure to include public and private cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications, identity, and more, our customers are faced with new and expanding challenges that we need to help them solve. Tenable One is that solution. Tenable's best-in-class vulnerability management capabilities make it the natural leader in the exposure management market. Through acquisitions and organic growth, the company has built the platform to help organizations across the globe secure their unique attack surfaces and focus on reducing cyber risk. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force and it gets some speed. Give it purpose, and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change, momentum, bringing about intelligence and agility to cope with ever-changing business landscapes and expectations. Connecting global ambitions with local approaches and digital experiences with human perspectives. It's this velocity that offers a car fleet management company wings and an aerospace engineering giant nimble feet. Or for that matter, it's what eliminates bank holidays in banking. And it's this very velocity that's offering our clients the access to smart connections and the confidence to find fresh directions. But more importantly, the unique ability to outrun the present, to outsmart the future. Come, witness velocity transform the way business is done. Zensar, think velocity. Salt Lake Sector 5, or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital, is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of three kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Think Tank. 
which was one of the very first intelligent IT-empowered workspace in Sector 5 that revolutionized the landscape of the area and ushered in an era that raised the benchmark of infrastructure and brought in smart integrated business parks all around. A slew of cutting-edge smart green buildings with a futuristic design and robust engineering followed, such as Infinity Benchmark, Godridge Watersite, Infinity IT Lagoon, Martin Byrne Business Park, Merlin Infinite and Advance Infinity. Infinity Business Center is housed in the award-winning Benchmark and Godridge Waterside Building, having state-of-the-art co-working spaces at the heart of Sector 5. Fully furnished plug-and-play model, which is scalable at any point of time, Infinity Business Center will offer every single modern amenity and convenience needed by you to crack that million-dollar deal. India, a land of innovation and technology, has witnessed a remarkable journey in the field of software development and IT services. And this transformational journey has been possible because of one organization known as Software Technology Parks of India, established on 5th June 1991 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. After merging three STPs, STPI has been instrumental in facilitating software exports and driving the growth of the Indian IT or ITES industry to newer heights. It provides a conducive ecosystem for software companies, startups and entrepreneurs, enabling them to thrive in a highly competitive global market. STPI provides statutory services, data comm services, incubation services, centers of entrepreneurship, next generation incubation scheme, BPO schemes, VAPT. To IT or ITES companies, startups, government and academic institutions. Over the last three decades, STPI has been providing single window clearance services to the software exporters which has catalyzed the growth of software exports from the country. Due to the right policy measures and liberal style of functioning, software exports from STPI registered companies marked an exponential growth from 52 crore rupees in 1991 to over 7 lakh crore rupees in 2023. Likewise, from 3 STPI centers in 90s to 63 centers today, STPI has created 
13.5 lakh square feet state-of-the-art infrastructure across country, out of which 8.1 lakh square feet is in Tier 2 and 3 cities, with 5 Tier 3 compliant data centers. SDPI is implementing METI's schemes such as BPU Promotion Scheme and Electronics Manufacturing Cluster 2.0 Scheme. BPU Promotion Scheme was implemented to create employment opportunities for youth in Tier 2 and 3 cities. 246 BPU units have so far provided direct employment opportunity to 52,278 youths. EMC 2.0 Scheme for building a comprehensive ecosystem for electronic system design and manufacturing. Under this scheme, five projects have been approved with an investment of 20,819 crore rupees and likely to generate over 66,000 job opportunities for the youth. With the support of STPI, the Indian IT or ITES industry has provided excellent and cost-effective services to the international clients. This has enabled India to become the preferred IT destination in the world. This sector is one of the largest contributors to India's GDP, foreign exchange earnings and generation of significant employment opportunities to the youth as the Indian IT or ITES industry has matured enough to move up the value chain. STPI has taken the lead in nurturing the startup ecosystem Pan India as envisioned under the Digital India Initiative and National Policy on Software Products 2019. STPI has envisioned establishing 25 centers of entrepreneurship out of which 22 centers of entrepreneurship have been established in the domains like Internet of Things, Blockchain, Fintech, Artificial Intelligence, Gaming and Animation, among others. To support startups Pan India, Next Generation Incubation Scheme has been implemented from 12 Tier 2 locations. Under this scheme, Seed funding of up to 25 lakh rupees is provided to each beneficiary or supported startup based on the innovativeness of the idea, the novelty of solutions and strength of the team. These initiatives and efforts will transform our country into a software product nation and will help in economic growth and create ample opportunities for the youth. STPI is poised to catalyze the ecosystem in the decade of opportunities. The story of STPI is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and technological excellence. Together, we shall continue to shape India's tech future.
As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question, how secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Tenable, the exposure management company, has launched a new platform that solves these underlying problems. The Tenable One Exposure Management Platform delivers visibility of cyber risks in a unified view and helps customers easily understand their unique attack surface. This helps them prioritize which threats to remediate now and provide comprehensive, easy to understand reporting for business leaders so they can make informed decisions, confident they have the full picture. Exposure management is the future of the cybersecurity industry. Tenable One enables organizations to operationalize both preventative and proactive security measures with ease. It's curing the disease of cyber risk rather than simply treating the symptoms. In addition to newly introduced capabilities, including the Lumen Exposure View, Attack Path Analysis, and Asset Inventory, the Tenable One platform combines the broadest vulnerability coverage, spanning IT assets, cloud resources, containers, web apps, and identity systems. The platform also builds on the speed and breadth of vulnerability coverage from Tenable Research and adds comprehensive analytics to prioritize actions and communicate cyber risk. As the attack surface has expanded beyond traditional IT infrastructure to include public and private cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications, identity, and more, our customers are faced with new and expanding challenges that we need to help them solve. Tenable One is that solution. Tenable's best-in-class vulnerability management capabilities make it the natural leader in the exposure management market. Through acquisitions and organic growth, the company has built the platform to help organizations across the globe secure their unique attack surfaces and focus on reducing cyber risk. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force and it gets some speed. Give it purpose, and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change, momentum, bringing about intelligence and agility to cope with ever-changing business landscapes and expectations. Connecting global ambitions with local approaches and digital experiences with human perspectives. It's this velocity that offers a car fleet management company wings and an aerospace engineering giant nimble feet. Or for that matter, it's what eliminates bank holidays in banking. And it's this very velocity that's offering our clients the access to smart connections and the confidence to find fresh directions. But more importantly, the unique ability to outrun the present, to outsmart the future. Come, witness velocity transform the way business is done. Zensar, think velocity. Salt Lake Sector 5, or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital, is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades, with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of three kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Think Tank, 
which was one of the very first intelligent IT-empowered workspace in Sector 5 that revolutionized the landscape of the area and ushered in an era that raised the benchmark of infrastructure and brought in smart integrated business parks all around. A slew of cutting-edge smart green buildings with a futuristic design and robust engineering followed, such as Infinity Benchmark, Godridge Watersite, Infinity IT Lagoon, Martin Byrne Business Park, Merlin Infinite, and Advance Infinity. Infinity Business Center is housed in the award-winning Benchmark and Godridge Waterside Building, having state-of-the-art co-working spaces at the heart of Sector 5. Fully furnished plug-and-play model, which is scalable at any point of time, Infinity Business Center will offer every single modern amenity and convenience needed by you to crack that million-dollar deal. India, a land of innovation and technology, has witnessed a remarkable journey in the field of software development and IT services. And this transformational journey has been possible because of one organization known as Software Technology Parks of India, established on 5th June 1991 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. After merging three STPs, STPI has been instrumental in facilitating software exports and driving the growth of the Indian IT or ITES industry to newer heights. It provides a conducive ecosystem for software companies, startups and entrepreneurs, enabling them to thrive in a highly competitive global market. STPI provides statutory services, data comm services, Incubation Services, Centers of Entrepreneurship, Next Generation Incubation Scheme, BPO Schemes, VAPT. To IT or ITES companies, startups, government and academic institutions. Over the last three decades, STPI has been providing single window clearance services to the software exporters which has catalyzed the growth of software exports from the country. Due to the right policy measures and liberal style of functioning, software exports from STPI registered companies marked an exponential growth from 52 crore rupees in 1991 to over 7 lakh crore rupees in 2023. Likewise, from three STPI centers in 90s to 63 centers today, STPI has created 13.5 lakh square feet 
state-of-the-art infrastructure across country, out of which 8.1 lakh square feet is in Tier 2 and 3 cities, with 5 Tier 3 compliant data centers. STPI is implementing METI's schemes, such as BPO Promotion Scheme and Electronics Manufacturing Cluster 2.0 Scheme. BPO Promotion Scheme was implemented to create employment opportunities for youth in Tier 2 and 3 cities. 246 BPO units have so far provided direct employment opportunity to 52,278 youths. EMC 2.0 Scheme for building a comprehensive ecosystem for electronic system design and manufacturing. Under this scheme, five projects have been approved with an investment of 20,819 crore rupees and likely to generate over 66,000 job opportunities for the youth. With the support of STPI, the Indian IT or ITES industry has provided excellent and cost-effective services to the international clients. This has enabled India to become the preferred IT destination in the world. This sector is one of the largest contributors to India's GDP, foreign exchange earnings and generation of significant employment opportunities to the youth. As the Indian IT or ITES industry has matured enough to move up the value chain, STPI has taken the lead in nurturing the startup ecosystem Pan India as envisioned under the Digital India Initiative and National Policy on Software Products 2019. STPI has envisioned establishing 25 centers of entrepreneurship, out of which 22 centers of entrepreneurship have been established in the domains like Internet of Things, Blockchain, Fintech, artificial intelligence, gaming and animation, among others. To support startups Pan India, Next Generation Incubation Scheme has been implemented from 12 Tier 2 locations. Under this scheme, seed funding of up to 25 lakh rupees is provided to each beneficiary or supported startup based on the innovativeness of the idea, the novelty of solutions and strength of the team. These initiatives and efforts will transform our country into a software product nation and will help in economic growth and create ample opportunities for the youth. STPI is poised to catalyze the ecosystem in the decade of opportunities. The story of STPI is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and technological excellence. Together, we shall continue to shape India's tech future.
As organizations continue to expand their operations online and add devices and applications to cloud environments, the modern attack surface is getting infinitely broader. Cybersecurity teams are under siege with new risks and challenges. Multiple point solutions producing various reports across security silos, mixed with a lack of context about which threats to tackle first, make it extremely difficult for companies and governments to answer the question, how secure are we? In many instances, it's not until a breach occurs that a vulnerable asset is even discovered. Organizations are searching for proactive and preventative cybersecurity programs that enable them to visualize weak spots in their defenses and find vulnerabilities and risks to the business before attacks happen. Tenable, the exposure management company, has launched a new platform that solves these underlying problems. The Tenable One Exposure Management Platform delivers visibility of cyber risks in a unified view and helps customers easily understand their unique attack surface. This helps them prioritize which threats to remediate now and provide comprehensive, easy to understand reporting for business leaders so they can make informed decisions, confident they have the full picture. Exposure management is the future of the cybersecurity industry. Tenable One enables organizations to operationalize both preventative and proactive security measures with ease. It's curing the disease of cyber risk rather than simply treating the symptoms. In addition to newly introduced capabilities, including the Lumen Exposure View, Attack Path Analysis, and Asset Inventory, the Tenable One platform combines the broadest vulnerability coverage, spanning IT assets, cloud resources, containers, web apps, and identity systems. The platform also builds on the speed and breadth of vulnerability coverage from Tenable Research and adds comprehensive analytics to prioritize actions and communicate cyber risk. As the attack surface has expanded beyond traditional IT infrastructure to include public and private cloud infrastructure, cloud native applications, identity, and more, our customers are faced with new and expanding challenges that we need to help them solve. Tenable One is that solution. Tenable's best-in-class vulnerability management capabilities make it the natural leader in the exposure management market. Through acquisitions and organic growth, the company has built the platform to help organizations across the globe secure their unique attack surfaces and focus on reducing cyber risk. This thing right here, it's something amazing. Give it little force and it gets some speed. Give it purpose and it gathers velocity. The thing we create to propel businesses forward, to give them the ability to take new shape, adapt to everything, time, human nature, mother nature. Today, an energy company. Tomorrow, one that channels all its energy in selling flowers. Powered by the precision of data and disruptive engineering, Velocity provides change, momentum, bringing about intelligence and agility to cope with ever-changing business landscapes and expectations. Connecting global ambitions with local approaches and digital experiences with human perspectives. It's this velocity that offers a car fleet management company wings and an aerospace engineering giant nimble feet. Or for that matter, it's what eliminates bank holidays in banking. And it's this very velocity that's offering our clients the access to smart connections and the confidence to find fresh directions. But more importantly, the unique ability to outrun the present, to outsmart the future. Come, witness velocity transform the way business is done. Zensar, think velocity. Salt Lake Sector 5, or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital, is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades, with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of three kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Think Tank, 
which was one of the very first intelligent IT-empowered workspace in Sector 5 that revolutionized the landscape of the area and ushered in an era that raised the benchmark of infrastructure and brought in smart integrated business parks all around. A slew of cutting-edge smart green buildings with a futuristic design and robust engineering followed, such as Infinity Benchmark, Godridge Watersite, Infinity IT Lagoon, Martin Byrne Business Park, Merlin Infinite, and Advance Infinity. Infinity Business Center is housed in the award-winning Benchmark and Godridge Waterside Building, having state-of-the-art co-working spaces at the heart of Sector 5. Fully furnished plug-and-play model, which is scalable at any point of time, Infinity Business Center will offer every single modern amenity and convenience needed by you to crack that million-dollar deal. So five minutes to go, we will... Five minutes to go, we will start our post-lunch session with the first session on opportunities, business opportunities with Bangladesh in technology space. So I would request my colleagues to please inform uh, the delegates who are outside to join us, at least to inform them that we are starting the session. So while we are waiting, we will have a look at the short video of STPI, Software Technology Parks of India, on the schemes of Government of India. Innovation and technology has witnessed a remarkable journey in the field of software development and IT services. And this transformational journey has been possible because of one organization known as Software Technology Parks of India. Established on 5th June 1991 by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. After merging three STPs, STPI has been instrumental in facilitating software exports and driving the growth of the Indian IT or ITES industry to newer heights. It provides a conducive ecosystem for software companies, startups and entrepreneurs, enabling them to thrive in a highly competitive global market. STPI provides statutory services, data comm services, incubation services, centers of entrepreneurship, next generation incubation scheme, BPO schemes, VAPT. To IT or ITES companies, startups 
government and academic institutions. Over the last three decades, STPI has been providing single window clearance services to the software exporters, which has catalyzed the growth of software exports from the country. Due to the right policy measures and liberal style of functioning, software exports from STPI registered companies marked an exponential growth from 52 crore rupees in 1991 to over 7 lakh crore rupees in 2023. Likewise, from three STPI centers in 90s to 63 centers today, STPI has created 13.5 lakh square feet state-of-the-art infrastructure across country, out of which 8.1 lakh square feet is in Tier 2 and 3 cities, with five Tier 3 compliant data centers. STPI is implementing METIS schemes such as BPO promotion scheme, and Electronics Manufacturing Cluster 2.0 Scheme. BPO Promotion Scheme was implemented to create employment opportunities for youth in Tier 2 and 3 cities. 246 BPO units have so far provided direct employment opportunity to 52,278 youths. EMC 2.0 Scheme for building a comprehensive ecosystem for electronic system design and manufacturing. Under this scheme, five projects have been approved with an investment of 20,819 crore rupees and likely to generate over 66,000 job opportunities for the youth. So, good afternoon. Welcome you back. So, the, this first session post lunch is, as I mentioned, on business opportunities with Bangladesh in technology space. Now, there's a background for this session. Few few months back in February, Bengal Chamber took a business delegation to Bangladesh, and we had very good meetings in Dhaka and Chittagong. And in Dhaka, you know, it was a multi-sectoral delegation, and we had representation from from technology, uh, a very sizable and significant representation. And we had meeting with Basis, uh, which is uh, Bangladesh Association for Software and Information Services, and uh, we understood that uh, there's a lot of scope of doing business with Bangladesh and uh, uh, of course Mr. Uh, Mustafir Rahman Sohel, director of BASIS who is with us, he has very kindly accepted our invitation and travelled from Dhaka and uh, this is our effort to facilitate uh, the B2Bs who are interested in doing business in this technology space with Bangladesh. So with this I would request uh, Mr. Mustafizur Rahman Sohel, Director Basis, Ms. Bhanu Kumar, Director Commercial MSTC Limited, and Dr. Chiranjib Bhattacharya, Co-Chairperson IT Committee and Chairperson IT Entrepreneurship and E-Commerce Committee of the Bengal Chamber and CEO Director Visa Tech Informatics Private Limited to join us on the dais. And with this, I would request Dr. Bhattacharya to please take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angana. A very good afternoon to all of you. Our sincere gratitude to two very senior industry leaders, Mr. Mustafizur Rahman Sohel, Director of Basis, and uh, Mrs. Bhanu Kumar, Director Commercial of MSTC. <coughs> we are sincerely grateful to them for joining us today. Since we have uh, very limited time anyways, uh, I will quickly move on. <coughs> so, I'll, I'll start with uh, Sohel Bhai. Sohel Bhai, thank you so much. Uh, can we start by a quick introduction on your rich experience in uh, the ICT industry and then a brief introduction about uh, basis to the audience. And then I'll come, come back to you with three, four quick questions. Thank you, Dada. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So, uh, I mean, good afternoon to everyone. So, this is Mustafa Zirman Sohel. And uh, me, as an IT professional, it's almost uh, 23 years I have already passed. So, I did my study in Singapore. I mean, higher studies in Singapore. Then, once I uh, completed my higher studies, I went back to my country to do something, uh, you know, I mean, on my own. Then, I started my own software companies. So, now we have around a few software companies who are 
doing software development in private sector, in government sector, and also for uh, international market. And besides uh, doing this, uh, I am a director at BASIS, and also I am a director at uh, CCBL, that is a Central Counterparty Bangladesh Limited, which is a, a central uh, uh, clearing uh, partner of the capital market. So this is a project that has been coming up soon. So Bangladesh capital market will be operated on this uh, you know, CCP platform. Uh, so uh, it is about me. And besides, I am pretty much active in an uh, association that is called BASIS, that is the apex body for software and information services in Bangladesh. It was uh, established in, back in 1998 uh, so with uh, only 18 members. So now we have around 2,200 members. So BASIS, as a, an apex body of the software and asset industry in Bangladesh, do all sort of activities for business development, for local market, for international market. But the most important thing that BASIS does, that is uh, to, you know, I mean, negotiate with government in terms of policy, in terms of doing all sort of, you know, I mean, uh, ICT policy, be it ICT policy or uh, digital commerce policy or anything. So we are closely working with government. So this is pretty much about basis and myself, Dada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you have been uh, mentoring several people now mm -hmm. over decades, possibly, mm -hmm. at Bangladesh. What are the current uh, challenges that you see, which today's uh, youth is facing mostly? Thank you. Thank you, Dada. So I mean, uh, see, this is one of my passionate areas that working or uh, mentoring with youth. Uh, so what I have seen that, you know, I mean, at this moment, the uh, plenty or I would say most of the youths are quite confused about their, you know, I mean, root of their uh, career path. So where they should go. So that is pretty much common, I believe, in almost everywhere because a lot of, uh, you know, undergrad students I have seen, they are doing major probably in one area, but they are not quite sure whether they will be sticking to, to that major or they will be switching uh, that one to another, uh, you know, I mean, uh, flashy things like robotics, this, that. So that makes these youth pretty much confused. So that is why we from the industry, uh, almost uh, every month we go to universities, talk to the youths, so that they can have the right direction for their career path. Dada. Thank you so much, Bhai. Uh, you have been an integral part of the ICT revolution in Bangladesh. How is the industry evolving currently, as of now, with, I mean, from the perspective of AI adoption, digital transformation, from once upon a time offline IT estate to such an advanced uh, stage? Can you kindly let yeah, us know? Yeah, thank you. Revolution? So, uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty much, uh, you know, I mean, fortunate to have seen it all, uh, as you have mentioned that, you know, I mean, non-IT sort of thing to graduation of uh, you know, IT infrastructure and this, that. So uh, today, uh, in 2023, I must say that after our government has taken that initiative called Digital Bangladesh, so uh, ICT has really boomed up in Bangladesh. So now today, being a country where we have fantastic infrastructure in terms of IT, so now our youths and a lot of companies are, you know, shifting towards frontier technologies. I think around uh, 50 to 60 members of BASIS who are, who are actively working with Frontier Technologies and they are providing solutions for, you know, I mean, Concord, they are uh, doing all sort of high-end technological products sitting down in Bangladesh. So today, I must say that we are on the right track, but uh, this, you know, I mean, uh, this going forward needs more interaction with the right direction. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, you have been into policy making as well with the government for a long time. So how is uh, the government, uh, what kind of actions the government is taking as far as incubating startups are concerned or building something like a talent factory at uh, Bangladesh? If you can kindly let us ah, know. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I, again, I must say that our government is pretty much uh, pro-industry in terms of IT and ITES. So government has, uh, you know, I mean, invited us with open arms so that we can have dialogues with them, we can make them understand why they need IT, why they need, you know, accurate policies so that they can be pretty much relevant on the, you know, industry. 
so in terms of uh, startup thing, so uh, we have been working with government, but now we are at a, at a stage that government has taken an initiative to do many things like incubation, these then for startups. But the recent challenge that we are facing with startups that the definition of startups that has created a big issue in our place. So maybe for that, we'll be seeking your support in some cases. Why I'm uh, telling about this uh, confusion? Because, you know, I mean, different agencies are, you know, defining this startup thing in different ways. So that is creating the confusion. For an example, I mean, banks, according to them, startup has a different definition. To government entities, to them, that has a different, you know, description of startups and to the startups themselves or to the industry we have a different definition which is quite you know relevant to the international definition so that is where i believe we can work hand in hand in terms of knowledge sharing in terms of you know uh, knowing each other so that we can make our startups more you know i mean viable to be staying afloat in the industry thank you Adam. Thank you so much, bhai. See, basis has been a catalyst in building talent in Bangladesh always. Uh, how, how do you think uh, your basis can collaborate with the Bengal Chamber of Commerce to build a robust ecosystem and a resilient marketplace and also exchange of skills, which is very, very important. So how do you like to collaborate with BCCI if you can? Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, BASIS, as I have already mentioned, BASIS is pretty much active developing the ecosystem in terms, be it a lo for local market, be it for international market. We have been around the world. We are into USA, in Europe market. But for India, I, from my personal experience, we can say that, you know, I mean, there are plenty of gaps around that we hardly know what you are doing in your many areas and you also hardly know about our strengths or weakness in many areas. So we are, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we are neighboring countries, but there are still plenty of gaps. So that is why we started talking with uh, the Bengal Chamber. They visited us in February. So I can see there are a lot of potential and opportunities to work together so that we can work hand in hand. We can, you know, I mean, be benefited in either way. Uh, and we can, you know, exchange our views, we can uh, get your support where you are way superior than us and vice versa. So I take this, uh, you know, I mean, initiative to work with uh, the Bengal Chamber in, you know, more pragmatic way. So I'd be looking forward to the authorities of Bengal Chamber so that we can, you know, define our areas of working and we can uh, work hand in hand in future. In fact, uh, by one personal observation which I had, <coughs> uh, my company has been working for quite some time at Bangladesh, is that there are a lot of advanced products which are there across segments, mm -hmm. BFSI, Enterprise, SMB, all across all segments, there are advanced products in IT infrastructure, IT networks, data centers, database, middleware, analytics, ERP, of course, you are an ERP expert yourself. Uh, Possibly, <coughs> there is a lot of requirement for skills to implement them successfully and manage them successfully. Now, so that is one area where uh, companies here, including MSMEs, can have some opportunities to work there. At the same time, uh, you would also have some plan to build skills which can be utilized here. I mean, that if, if some kind of a plan can be worked out, then I think from the chamber we can definitely facilitated that if we know clearly which are the skills that are available as of now. Exactly. Because, I mean, it will be the same here also. A lot of products, but a lot of implementation, deployment gaps may be there. Right. The other thing is, uh, at what stage uh, of cloud maturity is uh, Bangladesh currently and what would be basis's role as far as cloud implementation, cloud deployment at uh, Bangladesh ICT. Okay, thank you. So this is one area that is very close to my heart because I was uh, quite vocal, I think, uh, from the industry itself back in uh, 2008, 2009 to, you know, I mean, make people understand that cloud will be the future. So from basis, we have taken initiatives primarily to make people realize why cl cloud is necessary, be it at the client end, be it at the you know, government end, or be it 
for the software companies as well. So basis is pretty much active for this, you know, I mean, cloud thing. And today, I must say, we have, uh, you know, I mean, taken uh, uh, quite a few steps forward, but still there are plenty to be done. And, and uh, in this particular segment also, we can work together to, you know, I mean, make it more viable for both of us. So a cloud, as we all know, is the future. And we are now working towards the future. So from basis, we are always open for this particular segment, as you have mentioned, Dada, for, you know, I mean, doing something for the cloud and everything. Because uh, for me, one of the main challenges for making cloud thing viable for government sector and also for the private sector is the knowledge gap between the you know industry and these uh, and the people so we can you know i mean uh, have your ideas or we can get your expertise to minimize the gap of this knowledge that you know i mean the the, the fear that uh, uh, you know the industry or the government has today regarding the cloud thing so we definitely look up to you to have this you know i mean expertise so that we can minimize the gap and we can embrace the cloud as it is supposed to be thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank so you much bhai. madam thank you once again for joining us here so <clears throat> many of us here are aware of the significant contributions which uh, mstc is making towards government as well as industry in terms of usage of natural resources, usage of technology. Uh, if you kindly elaborate on the transparency and the implementation methodologies of MSTC and how you have contributed for the benefit of all. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the Bengal Chamber of Commerce for giving us this opportunity to speak on behalf of the company and talk about what we have done uh, for the government and the industry in uh, India. Uh, as you all know, uh, the government of India has been pushing hard for digitizing almost all the transactions, especially from the government sector. And uh, uh, we have been uh, really fortunate to be the preferred service partner for this. Uh, in the last decade or so, most of the natural resources of the country, uh, they have gone through a digital process, the allocation or the auctioning part of it. We have provided the platform. Uh, so far, there have not been any finger pointing. So that talks uh, very loudly about our credentials and the kind of transparency that we have brought into the system. Uh, the second uh, main uh, factor is the uh, digital infrastructure that our comp country has as on today. today. The penetration has been very good. When we started off with uh, AE auctions way back in 2002, uh, the, the penetration of uh, internet or the infrastructure was not so much. And in fact, you'll be surprised to know that uh, e-auctions were first introduced for selling scrap, where you know the uneducated and uh, probably the lowest rate of society actually deal with such transactions. But then uh, making it a success from that level, uh, it, is, it has been a very complex journey for us. And off late, uh, as you know, uh, the latest uh, the feather in our cap is the spectrum auctions, the way it has been carried out, and the 5G infrastructure that is being built on that edifice. Uh, that is something very commendable that we are doing. So uh, today's session is more about business opportunities in Bangladesh. Now, having done uh, some amount of work, we have the necessary exposure, experience in digitizing transactions not just for the government, but also for the industry. So I see a huge potential in Bangladesh, uh, and uh, definitely we would like to be a part of that journey uh, for uh, Bangladesh. And uh, we can be not just the implementing agency, we can be even a consultancy. We can give you the necessary inputs for that. And uh, I'm sure this kind of uh, interaction is probably the starting point for a good partnership with the government of Bangladesh. Uh, apart from this, I would also like to say that uh, for doing this, you need to have good infrastructure, skilled manpower. For towards that end also, if at all you need any help from our side, definitely we are there to give some inputs in that area. Uh, secondly, the uh, we have done a lot of good work in Southeast Asia. See. Uh, today, as we all know, we have India has emerged as an IT superpower. 
So even if uh, there are developed countries around us, like say Singapore, they are also loot, uh, using a lot of our digital platforms, like our own you know, oil sector companies that are there in Singapore. They are using our platform to do their export, import, and that kind of processes. We are selling some forest produce, red sanders, and all the export is happening to China. Now the Chinese bidders are taking part in our auction. So any kind of trade, any kind of government scheme, digitizing that has been our forte. And that definitely gives us the confidence to do it for any government. So we look forward to this kind of an opportunity from uh, government of Bangladesh. And this is probably just the starting point. Thank you so much. That, that gives us a lot of confidence as well. So, Sohel uh, before concluding this session, uh, do you think that we can initiate this kind of a discussion uh, on behalf of MSTC with uh, the Bangladesh government through basis? Then the Bengal Chamber can facilitate that next level of discussion. Yes, we definitely do. I mean, just before this session, uh, during lunch break, okay. I was having discussion with uh, her regarding this thing. So I believe uh, with the help of uh, Bengal Chamber and, uh, you know, I mean, three of these entities can work together and we can have a serious, in, you know, in, inroads with our governments so that we can, you know, uh, show them your products, consultancy ideas and presentations because it's a journey and the roadmap needs to be you know presented to our right authorities so we from basis can take that initiative and you are there uh, the bengal chamber and you are there so these three can work as a team and definitely we can do a lot of things but uh, having said that for doing that we n we need to more about your products your services so as we, we were discussing so post this uh, you know i mean uh, session or post this event we will be keeping touch among ourselves, we'll be knowing each other more and we'll be having a you know, roadmap way forward. Thank you and so much, we'll, sir. We'd like to, yeah, thank you. We'd like to have the Bengal Chamber with us also. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, bhai, and thank you so much, madam. Uh, since uh, time is again <laughs> very limited, we are about to conclude this session. But maybe two key takeaways we can move forward with. One is understanding the skill gaps at both ends and see how to meet the skill gaps from Bangladesh and from India. That is one part, on the ICT part. The second thing is a, a proper structured initiative along with MSTC to uh, talk to ACS and Bangladesh government to take this forward. Yeah. The chamber can certainly facilitate both so, initiatives. Okay, so uh, this is not the conclusion, this is probably just the beginning of yeah, our mutual yeah, relationship. True. So we look forward to this association. Yeah. So, so are we. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sohel Thank, Thank you, you so Samia. much, madam. Thank you for listening us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bhanu Kumar and Mr. Mustafizur Rahman Sohel. I'm not separately mentioning to Dr. <laughs> so I would request Dr. Bhattacharya to please present token of our, to tokens of our appreciation to Ms. Manu Kumar and Mr. Mustafizur Rahman Sohel. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, man. So we are moving on to the next session, that is infra infrastructure facilitating technology growth in Kolkata. We will take a couple of minutes or a bit more to change over for the next session. And we can stop the live and we can start again. So uh, this session, infrastructure facilitating technology growth in Kolkata, I must mention that we share a very uh, cordial and uh, very, very long-term relationship with uh, Infinity Group. And this thought or this ideation was uh, from the Infinity Group that we must showcase the infrastructure 
facilities of Kolkata to support technology growth. And as a Chamber of Commerce, while you know, facilitating large IT players on their decision of this destination, we, we, we have found that infrastructure and talent are the major decision-making areas. So I'm really happy that we are being able to uh, you know, curate this session and present to you today. So I would request a video of Infinity Group and we will move on to the session. Salt Lake Sector 5 or the nerve center of Eastern India's human capital is home to more than 900 companies with more than 100,000 professionals employed directly. This is where Infinity Group has acted as the harbinger of IT revolution over the past decades with numerous green buildings that total over 5 million square feet of green infrastructure scattered within an area of 3 kilometers. A home of smart thinkers is a marvel called the Infinity Think Tank which was one of the very first intelligent IT empowered workspace in Sector 5 that revolutionized the landscape of the area and ushered in an era that raised the benchmark of infrastructure and brought in smart integrated business parks all around. A slew of cutting-edge smart green buildings with a futuristic design and robust engineering followed such as Infinity Benchmark, Godridge Watersite, Infinity IT Lagoon, Martin Byrne Business Park, Merlin Infinite and Advance Infinity. Infinity Business Center is housed in the award-winning Benchmark and Godridge Waterside building, having state-of-the-art co-working spaces at the heart of Sector 5. Fully furnished plug-and-play model, which is scalable at any point of time, Infinity Business Center will offer every single modern amenity and convenience needed by you to crack that million-dollar deal. Ready for real life? Thank you. So, welcome back to the session on infrastructure facilitating technology growth in Kolkata uh, of the 14th uh, BITC, Business IT Conclave of the Bengal Chamber. So, we have with us Mr. Onindo Dash, Vice President Marketing of Infinity Group, moderating this session. And as panelists, we have Mr. Onirban Gupta, Managing Director, Colliers East India. Mr. Pratik Mehta, Director and Head, Office Occupier Services, Advisory and Transactions, East India, at CBRE India, Kolkata. Mr. Joydeep Paul, Senior Associate Director, East India, Leasing, TAG, Koshman, and Wakefield, India, Kolkata. Mr. Shantanu Ghosh, Head, Office Leasing and Retail at JL JLL, India, Kolkata. So I would request the panelists and the moderator to take their seats on the dais. And just an announcement as the panelists and moderators settle in. Uh, we have the next session is the theme session on uh, smart and connected ecosystem. And then we have a brief demonstration by young students, or I would say, not, you know, young IT enthusiasts on their innovations at their campus, following which we'll have the evening networking. So look forward to us having you for the rest of the day and the evening. Over to Anindo. Thank you. Thank you, Angona. Um, I mean, uh, Bengal Chamber air program Banglai kichu bokto boda ki. Apna na jara jara pechone boshe achi nekto egi ashun. Ya to boarding session hole haben. Apna na shobai to egi ashun. Shamne dikhe o seat achi, ya to pechone pechone na hole. 
একটু এগিয়ে আসলে সুবিধা হয় এটা বেসিক্যালি আমরা এটা মানে এটা গল্প করব বাঙালিটা গল্প করতে খুব ভালোবাসে আমি সকাল থেকে দেখছি প্রচন্ড অনিন্দকে অ্যাড করে বলছি আমরা রিয়েল এস্টেট কম কথা বলবো হ্যাঁ মানে আমরা একটুখানি গল্প করতে ভালোবাসি বাঙালি তো বাট ইংরেজিতে করব বাট ঠিক আছে বেঙ্গল চেম্বারে হচ্ছে বাংলাদেশ থেকেও আমাদের বন্ধুরা আছেন খুব ধন্যবাদ সবাইকে বেঙ্গল চেম্বারকে জানাই এরকম একটা প্রোগ্রাম কিউরেট করার জন্য আমি আইটি কমিটির পার্টে আছি আমরা ভাবলাম যে এরকম ফার্স্ট টাইম এরকম আইটি কনক্লেভে যদি হয় সো আই হ্যাভ সাম এক্সটিংগুইসড স্পিকার্স উইথ মি দে আর দি মানে আমরা সবাই শুনতে পাই বেঙ্গলে যে লড অফ বিগ থিংস আর হ্যাপেনিং মাইন্ড ফ্রি আসছে আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড ইয়াং রোহিত এখানে আছে কে পি এম জিজ অ্যান্ড অল বাট বেসিক্যালি যারা যারা এগুলোতে ইনস্ট্রুমেন্টাল রোল প্লে করে Uh, the people who are playing uh, real instrumental role are this people you know uh, you name it uh, they are the ones who have been associated to bring those companies in kolkata and um, uh, in kolkata for the last i think couple of years uh, things have drastically changed uh, and it's very good you know and post covid we have seen some bigger transformation at least in infinity um, in the last two years we have closed almost like around 5 6 lakh square feet which is like in kolkata it's a huge thing um the, so i thought that let me bring on the stage those people who has that pulse who understands the market who will tell you the story of the pan india story and where kolkata is standing what are the things we can do as a uh, as a you know as an organization as a team as an ecosystem to take kolkata to the next level so that's the intention will uh, you know um, uh, so I'll, i'll 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 first start with um, uh, mr anirban gupto he is the managing director of colliers uh, so anirban if you can share the pan india picture uh, you know um, and uh, where kolkata is standing uh, then the audience will get some uh, info thank you thank you anindo and thank you to uh, bengal chamber of commerce to infinity group and all others uh, respected uh, audience who are there uh to start with uh i'll just start with a small story uh the story of uh me uh being in this market for last 20 years so i started my real estate career in 2002 and this 2022 is my 20th year in real estate in calcutta i got immense number of opportunities to move out of calcutta sometimes in bombay sometimes delhi bangalore um but you know i had a belief uh, you know that this Uh, this region this city this market has got everything uh, to go to that level and compete with india level on different different aspects and different uh, uh, dimensions or criteria that we take uh, so this is what you know my belief that is still continuing and you know this belief is an inspiration you know which i got from oscar will I read somewhere he said that you know if a person you know if anyone you know in career uh, becomes what he or she decides at the first go like uh, some people want to become a doctor some people want to become a lawyer engineer and you just go for it and you achieve it so if you if you if you have it in the first go uh, it's a punishment for you but if you don't have it in the first go you are an artist and you can create magic and this is what bengal will create in the next few years and that's what the great part that we are all a part of it uh, so coming to onindo uh, the india picture you know india picture we did a couple of researches you know from colliers and you know i will just project two picture you know on a india platform the first thing is india will be a superpower by 2030 so india is actually overtaking to be a superpower by 2030 and there are many many reasons lot of reasons which are there lot of uh, researches that happen i just i just point out top 3 to 4 reasons you know why we say that india will be a superpower by 2030 the first point i'll say is definitely the digitalization which is taking to the next level in india we all know Uh, the second point i'll say about the population of india overtaking china 1.41 billion china was 1.39 billion so we overtook china that's the second point we have that advantage of man us third point which i'll say is india's working population the median age today is 28.4 years 
which was actually China in 2007. So in 2007, China's med median age of population was 28.4 years, and look at where China is standing today. By 2030, India's mid-age population will go to 31.7 years, which is still a very, very young working population India will give to the world. My, my fourth point is India will contribute 97 million of working population to the world by 2030. 97 million will contribute, 22% of the working population India will contribute to the world, which is again a big reason for that. And then we go on adding different, different reasons. But one more reason, the, my last reason I'll say that if you go to Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Index, which is called GEM, it says that India is actually four it ranks fourth out of 51 countries where they give a entrepreneurial ecosystem which is best to work for and india is creating entrepreneurs so there's a concept which has also come which is called solopreneurs this, this i said in one of my conferences where it says that there are individuals who can become business owners and that is happening in india so this is basically one of the points I'd like to highlight. Now I'll come to the, the, the market basically. Uh, India overall office market is six approximately. My numbers may be wrong somewhere, but I'll give an approximate idea. We are at 667 billion uh, million square feet India. It has got office spaces. Again, 667 million square feet is India's number. And if I again if I again go on a global comparison, Tokyo is 1 billion square feet, New York is 5 billion square feet. So we have a lot to catch up with. So that is what, the, what we are doing. Definitely in India, Bangalore rules is 180 million uh, square feet approximately it has. In 2022, last year, uh, uh, how much uh, absorption happened, what we say, how much office spaces got consumed, it's India is about 50 million square feet. And uh, again, you know, we have Bangalore ruling, which is 16 million square feet. Calcutta also touched 2 million square feet, which is a great, great number. So if I say the positive part of it, Calcutta made more than 100% progression. So over 2021, 22 was a 100% growth, which is a real, real good picture for the city. Uh, my next point, uh, which is saying the up upcoming stocks, if I compare the upcoming stocks of the country, 174 million square feet, and, uh, and uh, you know, this is a big, big uh, improvement because demand is generating for that amount. So 174 million square feet is coming up uh, in India till 2025. Uh, if I go on to the average rental, my next point, which is average rental is... Uh, uh, Mumbai is highest in India, which is 140 rupees per square feet, and uh, uh, you know followed by NCR and Bangalore, which are 90 rupees per square feet. Pune and Hyderabad is around 75 rupees a square feet, and Calcutta will be around 45 rupees a square feet. So it's clearly one of the competitive market where we can have a price advantage, and we have a huge talent, which my other panelists will also share. Uh, uh, who are taking, if I say tech companies, they have a 34% market share, Flex have a 14% market share, and manufacturing and engineering has a 10% market share. Uh, my last point, what is uh, going on in Indian market, is basically a concept which is called RITS, R-E-I-T-S, which is basically the next best and big thing in India, which we will talk in the due course of time. So that's it from my side, Orindo. Thank you. Great, great. I think uh, a, round, or a round of applause for India at least. The growth of India, the growth of Kolkata which is happening. I think Anirban has uh, uh, stated the stats and uh, so nice to hear that you know everything is growing. I'll come to uh, you know uh, to uh, Pratik um, Mehta uh, from CBRE. He has been handling some of the uh, very big clients uh, and uh, has helped uh, to bring them in. Uh, Kolkata. So Pratik, what are the, like if you can tell us, like what are the key things, you know, uh, this, uh, these MNCs are looking for when they are choosing Kolkata? You know, uh, some of the factors which you encounter, um, if you can uh, share with us, uh, that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Ananda. First of all, uh, a very big thank you to BCCI Infinity Group for giving us this platform to speak about the growth story of Calcutta. Uh, my esteemed industry colleague Anirban just mentioned about 
uh, what has been the growth story of India. He presented a fantastic picture uh, with stats on what has been the trajectory of this growth. Uh, I will deep dive further into the Calcutta growth story. Uh, in the post-pandemic area, uh, uh, we have seen a good quantum of companies who were presently uh, not in the city uh, exploring the opportunity of setting up shop here. And when I say that, uh, almost 1.36 million square feet of office space was absorbed in the city in the last year, uh, which is one of the highest in the cities that, uh, that has ever seen. Uh, and that's not the only point. The silver lining is the quantum of the pipeline that all of us have together uh, does speak volumes about the potential of the city. So we not only are looking to sustain this momentum which has been gained in the post-pandemic area uh, 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 time, and but, but also to capitalize on that. So coming back to your point on what are some of the things that these corporates are exploring uh, when they are uh, trying to set up you know, offices in Calcutta. So, so obviously there are a host of points, but if I have to jot it down and, 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 and make it succinct for the audience here, uh, then location, infrastructure, cost, uh, compatibility, connectivity, flexibility, the developer community, which is very, very conscious about uh, the uh, needs of the client. Uh, I, would, I, I must appreciate that the developer community has really handled some of these bigger clients that we have been talking about and making their entry into the city a much, much smoother process. And that has given them the confidence that this is a city uh, wherein the ecosystem is already there, the infrastructure is already present, and we have a set of developers uh, and a community of developers in the city who are ready to understand the needs of a modern workplace and to give them the well-being and the, uh, uh, no, the overall atmosphere that the new age employee is seeking for. Uh, so that's my point, Aninda. I think these are some of the key criteria that the companies are actually looking okay. at. Okay. Okay. And, and I must say, you know, the market is insane. Like we are, uh, uh, the, some of the top ones are now looking into uh, Kolkata market and you know, our next, I think, before Pujo, persistent technologies will be inaugurating their office also. Uh, we have now a good amount of queries which are coming every day, 30,000, 50,000, 1 lakh. And, uh, you know, uh, we are, um, you know, there's a, there's a shortage of supply which is there now coming up in the market. Uh, but a lot of things has changed, you know, post-COVID. Uh, post-COVID, the way it was before COVID and before uh, post-COVID, things have changed. There's a huge change in the models, in the hu huge change in the, uh, you know, business models. And I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll request um, uh, Mr. Shantanu Ghosh uh, to, you know, uh, from JLL uh, to share. Uh, he has been there in the industry for a long time, and uh, he can share his uh, views. Uh, what's had been the change, uh, you know, post COVID? Thank you, Aninda. Thanks for giving us uh, this opportunity to speak our mind. In fact, uh, you know, you made a great beginning when you started in Bangalore, and I have never seen anywhere like, you know, it, it was music to our ears. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, Anidwan will agree with me. <laughs> anyway, so the first thing first, like, you know, uh, the city always had that underlying potential. I mean, the people will be amazed to know that East, as a whole, as a region, accounts for more than 25% of, you know, overall workforce across all industry. Yet, we actually started realizing our potential post-COVID. I mean, we coined a term that is river, reverse migration. My team makes fun out of me for coining <laughs> such term, but having said that, you know, that is the reality. And you know, that was the time like, you know, people came back home and they were not willing to return to work, right? And overall, like, you know, my experience is when I spoke to a lot of, you know, companies, whether we accept or not, overall the service quality has been impacted. So the companies want the employees to come back and that is not happening. So, you know, what is the option we are left with? That was the time like, you know, the companies started expanding their footprint to Calcutta. And as a result, what happened? It's like, you know, earlier, we are seeing like, you know, the average ticket size of absorption was about, you know, five to 7,000, correct? And that too was very much confined in and around CBD. But with such reverse migration, 
you know, things have changed drastically. The overall ticket size have gone up to about, you know, 20,000 square feet. And you will see, like, you know, overall absorption has also surged towards this area between Sector 5 and Rajarhat. And you know that, you know, which are companies we are in dialogue with. And uh, right now, Calcutta has taken off. That much I can assure you. Great, great. Great, and, and uh, taking cue from, uh, you know, Shantanunda, and I think, um, and, and some of the, you won't believe some of the, um, uh, you know, unknown companies. We never thought about this type of companies. It's a company called Rentley. It's a New York-based company based out of from Coimbatore. They have moved to Sek Kolkata, first office, you know, first uh, year 100 seats, and then they have planned for another, uh, you know, incremental way, another 100, uh, m maybe in the next two to three years, 300 seats, they are inaugurating their office on 6th. It's an infinity uh, think tank. So, you know, um, it's not just the biggies, a lot of, uh, flexible uh, players have also entered in the market uh, where a lot of companies are getting a comfort. Um, and to talk about the flexi operators and how they are uh, creating a lot of value in the market, I'll request uh, my friend um, uh, Joydeep uh, um, to, from Kushman uh, to share his views on the flexible market scenario sure. in Kolkata. Thank you. Thank you, Aninda. Thank you, BCCI, for having us here and uh, all the respect uh, uh, and the prestigious sponsors we have here. So uh, to sum up and to add on to uh, what uh, my friends out here in this panel, is, they have mentioned, Pratik, Anirbanda, Shantanuda. So combined of all these reasons comes the reason why the flex is on an expansion mode, why, why this is coming to play. And in the, we live, a, live in a, a world of outsourcing right now. We need to eat. So Zomat and Swiggy is there. We need to commute. Uber and Ola is there. We need an office. A lot of operators are there. There are many operators. There are many listed small, big, local operators walking out in the east, in Pan-India. So coming to the reason why, why uh, all the corporates uh, on also multiple small companies, startup companies, they're opting for this kind of a model is the first thing which is the asset light model. No investment, no capex, scalability, headache-free solution. The companies, the corporates, they don't want to bang their head now, you know, what will my office designs and how to maintain things, what will the admin resources and, and how to run the office. Just they are outsourcing everything. Single check solution, no hidden charges. Like for an example, like the micro market, your, your buildings are there, your prestigious buildings are there. Like, you know, there are multiple aspects in the commercials, like the stacks, the stacks, the stacks. It's, it gives a one composite solution. I don't know what is the CAM. I don't know what is the AC. I don't know what is the property tax. I don't know what is the Weber tax. I know only one com component, what is rent. And for every corporate, that contributes as an outflow. And they need to know that outflow. And, and there is no hidden charges in that. And that gives uh, a, a very, very uh, important aspect for their decision making. Also, the scalability ap aspect. I mean, say supposedly, uh, I will also like to mention here's, here, there's big, big corporates, like a couple of our clients, I mean, you know, they're having clients of all of us here in this panel. They are interestingly moving to a new concept which is, uh, which is called the core flex model. In this core flex model, they are retaining their uh, original office space Plus, whatever expansions they are doing, they are doing in the flex arena. Like Pratik, you have a couple of clients like this who have expanded recently. I have done uh, Shandunda uh, or uh, Onirbanda. So, to name a few, Ansang Young, uh, uh, KPMG. So, uh, we have done Vialto Partners and we have done CG as well. So, these are the clients who are now they are taking interest in this model. Not only for Calcutta, I will say this is happening for entire East. When I say East, Bhuvaneshwar is also achieving quite rapidly here. So this is something which is going to stay. And also to the facts and numbers, uh, which uh, uh, Onirbanda has been saying about, I will also like to say here that last year, we have seen a grossly around uh, one and a half to two million square foot of leasing activity in the year 2022 in the city. After that, uh, approximately around 25 to 26 percentage of contribution has came from this flex operators 
which is a significantly huge number. Although in a pan-India basis, I mean, it's, it's around a 50 million square foot market. As of now, it's around one and a half million for, for the operators who are occupying, but yeah, this will be growing steadily. We know there are inventories which is coming, which are upcoming. Uh, Sector 5 Newtown alone holds around 75% inventory of the city. And there will be another around uh, of a half a million square feet of inventory getting added by another couple of years. So these are operators who are eyeing these kind of assets, uh, which, are, uh, which are obviously green building, new buildings, uh, and su sustainable also, which will attract clients like this, like the clients which I've just mentioned to expand their portfolio and their op operations. And this is something which is going to stay. And this will be the one of the newest interesting that our country will be witnessing. Great, great. Uh, and so in the, sorry, uh, yeah, just please. wanted to add a, a small story to what you and Joydeep just said. So I was speaking to one of our clients and uh, to add to what you just said that you were speaking to a client from Coimbatore and you haven't heard about them and they were willing to come to Calcutta. And uh, on top of it, he talked about the flexible workspace. So I was speaking to one of the clients, and he coined a very interesting term, which I would like to share with the audience. He said that what the flexible workspace ecosystem has done is that even for companies who were previously uh, a bit more conservative in their expansion plans, they have given these companies the idea of what he termed as dipping the toe. So what he said that my management now is much more flexible uh, uh, to explore newer territories, to see what kind of talent pool is available, and then to expand further into the city. Uh, fortunately for us, we have been visible, uh, we have visibility to such transactions which have happened in the city. And uh, let me tell you that all these clients who have come and started off with 20, 25 workstations have expanded further into the city. One example, obviously, I can't name the client, but they started off with 20 odd workstations, and today their portfolio in the city stands at more than a, uh, almost one lakh square feet. So these are some of the uh, things which have uh, actually come up uh, in the era of flexible workspace now. And these stories will keep on coming more and more. Yeah. Great, so, great. Um, you know, we are almost coming to the end, but uh, one question I have for all. Like, uh, you know, uh, we're talking a lot about in India, you know, to make uh, India the GCC hub, you know, a lot of um, uh, research work is going on, even JLL has published reports on that. Like, if you have to make Kolkata the hub of the global capability centers, you know, what are the things we should do, you know, maybe can be a recommendation or a suggestion to Bengal Chamber also can take this forward, uh, starting from Onirban. I, so I can say about uh, the major three to four points. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about is rates, definitely. You know, I talked about it earlier also. So we cover about 74.4 million square feet under, re under rates in India right now, where we have a market of 667 million square feet. So it only covers 11% of the national market. Now, this has a potential to go up to around 55%. If that comes up, the rate contribution of Kolkata right now is 4% only, which is the Brookfield asset, which is there in Rajarhat. So if that 4% that we have can be increased and, uh, you know, sky's the limit, uh, I'll tell a very interesting thing of rates, how India is in advantage. If you go around the rates of the world, you know, so we have done a, we have done a small study where we have put India, USA, Singapore, and UK. India, I'll just say the summary of it, the market cap for India is only 7 billion USD. So India's exposure to rates is only 7 billion USD. USA is 1220 billion USD, Singapore is 70 billion USD, and UK is 72 billion USD. So we have, we are sitting at 7 billion USD where we have a potential to go at a really, really high level for the next few years. So I think that's my first point which uh, we, should, we should do. My second point that I'll say is, this is an example, you know, because um, a Collier's office is in BKC, and just behind our office, you know, there is, a, there is a, there's a developer who is from Japan, Tokyo. It's called Sumitomo. Sumitomo has taken two land parcels. They have taken from uh, MRDA at 2067 crores valuation, and they're doing two beautiful office buildings there. Uh, when we went back and understood how is the company, they have done more than 150 office buildings grade A in Tokyo right now. So if these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll say, um, you know, 
institutions or developers more they get inclined to Calcutta, I think that will value add to the market of Calcutta and to the level of delivery of Calcutta also. So that's my, uh, that's my second point. And the uh, rest is, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just talk of uh, one more point, you know, uh, what is to be done. And because we are all doing a great job, you know, we are creating a good building. Uh, you know, we are actually increasing the supply. But this point is uh, definitely the supply part, which my colleagues will also talk of the supply part, how we increase the supply part and take it to the next level. I think that's all from my side. Ainda. So uh, as far as GCC is concerned, it's a very much, you know, human resource intensive affair, right? So there are only two things we need. One is talent. So uh, the state produces one million graduates every year. It's a homeland to three eyes, ISI, IAM, and IIT. Has about you know, 300 educational institutes with 61 engineering colleges, right? Yet, we have not been able to retain talent because of reasons beyond our control. But the problem is, it's not about like, it's, it's not darkness all around, right? We have got a story, we, we already have got a story, and we have to sell this story, like, you know, the, um, that uh, Silicon Valley initiative, or as a matter of fact, that, you know, the FinTech Hub initiative, wherein we have been able to rope in all the bigots. Now the question is, like, you know, how many people outside Bengal knows about the stories? They don't know, because collectively, it's not about like, you know, we four are sitting here and as a firm, we have, we are connected with who's who in the world at national level and also international level. But instead of kind of, you know, cutting into each other's transaction, there has not been a consolidated effort to kind of, you know, sell Bengal in tandem with industry bodies like you or also like, you know, Credai. So, you know, this growth story, this, this success story, we have never been able to inculcate in biggest mind. It's all about the perception. Correct? So, and number two, it's the infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, it's just that, you know, uh, you were one of the pioneers in creating like that sustainable building, right? In sector five and race followed. But the question is, have we paid enough effort to get institutional developers on board? What is the advantage? Because these institutional developers like cater to all the biggest in the world. Even if they are pushed, like again, this perception problem, we have never tried to change the perception. For them also, like, you know, like acquisition is a problem. How many times, like, you know, they have approached government through us because, again, we have not tried to change the perception. We have more often than not reacted to the requirement coming in our way instead of trying to create a requirement for the city. So that is something, like, you know, we need to work on. So... Very good, One very, point. very good points, very good points and I must say at this juncture that Bengal Chamber will come back, come to you ma'am, that Bengal Chamber is trying, you know, from the IT committee, uh, Onindoda is also here, Mr. Radhakrishnan is there, we are trying to uh, do some, uh, you know, focused uh, technology uh, driven uh, events in some pockets of India. The first event will be in Bangalore. First time, uh, you know, uh, such a program will be done in Bangalore. Shombit is here. You can talk to him offline on uh, in the first week of August. We are planning to do it. But it's so important, uh, Shantarunda, that, that that is what we want to do. And I think uh, a very important uh, suggestion we have. Ma'am, I'll come back to you. Let my friend uh, share his yeah. views. And we'll get, get back to the audience also for their views. Because that is something which we want to note it down. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Arinda, again. What Shantanuda said, uh, it's, it's remarkable. It touches our heart. We, the people out here in this panel, we, the people in this room, we need to go out. We need to sell ourselves to the world. 
we need to stop saying things which demotivates. We need to start and say things which promotes us, ourselves. We have everything. We have the infrastructure. I mean, we know what is the history of the city. We, have, we know what is what Calcutta has been. Let's bring it back. It's our duty. It's our city. And, and we will have to do it because uh, infrastructure-wise, talent pool-wise, academics-wise, Calcutta still has one of the best schools, institutions in the country. We can definitely be proud of that. Tourism, tell me a state which has hills, which has a sea, which has forest to it. We need to promote it. That's us, we the people. Adding to that, the government has been really helpful. Uh, we are seeing some wonderful progress. In Newtown, we have seen the, the new flyover which has came up connecting Sector 5 to Newtown. And people have already started availing it, easing the traffic movements. The people who are coming from the northern and the southern fringes of the city. 2,800,000 kil kilometers of highway is getting uh, con constructed connecting Calcutta, Shiliguri, Kohati, Myanmar, Bangkok, Thailand. Can you imagine what kind of boost that will bring to the state and the entire east and far east states of the country? This is an opportunity which, has, which we have got because of the look east policy or because of the focus on tier two city policies or because of whatever pre post COVID thing, people did not want to go back to their workplaces again because uh, unfortunately we have seen a lot of brain drain from the state. Thankfully those brains are here back again. Let's retain them. This is us, we need to do it. Pratik? Aninda, you spoke about the chamber taking it up no, nationally, uh, trying to promote the city, uh, and which is absolutely critical to the growth story of Calcutta. But I think all of us present here uh, who are from the city or who are working in the city also have a responsibility to internally market the city uh, no, to the relevant stakeholders within the company or within the peer groups. I think uh, that is something which we probably might underestimate, but it will definitely result into a lot of positivity around the city. Uh, uh, see, Rajarhat, Newtown, no, it's a living and visible example of uh, a robust, uh, dynamic business district. We don't need anything else. So I, for example, always make it a point that whenever there is a client, not only we are showing him the properties or the ecosystem of the city, but also, also making a point to take him to certain uh, uh, places which speaks about the culture of the city, which speaks about the fabric of the city. And I think in Calcutta, uh, uh, we have a city which has got the most cosmopolitan fabric. And that is very, very important for the IT to grow. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the audience, uh, we'll open this uh, thing five minutes for the audience for any questions, suggestions. Um, if you have, uh, if somebody can give the mic to uh, ma'am over there. I have the mic here. Can I ask the first question? Yes, please. Yeah, fair I enough. can't see you. Yeah, here. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I am aware that the government is interested in starting another new town sector five kind of a thing somewhere in Alipur. Now, one of the primary challenges for that happens to be that the airport is out here. And though there are a lot of people working in Kolkata today, they are mostly not decision takers. Decision takers come from outside. They take the decisions and go back, which is why all the five-star hotels are always full. Now, the point is we have a, a small airport kind of near Behala. Is there any talks of starting that thing from Dom Dom to over there, and then that area can also become a you know development hub or something like that? Which which place you're talking about? Alipur. Make, Alipur. Uh, I, I'm not aware whether I'll, I'll, I'll answer uh -huh. your question, sir. Uh, I'll answer a question not exactly to Alipur. Uh, I'll answer a question that there is, again, you know, uh, pan-India-wise, there's been a drive taken. Like, that's one of the measures which Onindo asked, that how we improve Kolkata to the next level. The pan-India-wise, there's been a drive taken to revive the old CBDs. So that's happening everywhere. The top six cities, uh, they calculated about 120 million square feet to be recovered and revived, and the CBD coming back to the old form. So that drive is also planning to happen in Kolkata also. Uh, and you know, there will be a, uh, definitely a price difference, but that's not the only factor. 
So if that drive happens, then we can see those uh, central business districts popping up in all over the city, and definitely there will be a focus on the infrastructure later on also. But the primary challenge happens to be travel, at least for the, from the IT sector, because the people, decision takers True. come from outside. True. Until and unless that airport or that area, something happens such that people can travel to that side fast, I don't think nothing I will think happen. I think that's a point taken. Uh, we can put it up to the chamber to take this forward. Uh, uh, I think uh, even Rohit is there. Rohit has been uh, an influencer. You know, he's a YouTube influencer, has been doing a lot of... He's, a, he's an actor by profession, but he has been promoting Bengal. He must be... He's very famous uh, in, in the digital world. So, yes, Rohit. Uh, yeah, th thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, Ami Eta Jigesh Kurtaja, I want to ask one thing that are we looking for, to bring mind space in Kolkata or some big players like Embassy Group to Kolkata for making uh, such big tech parks? Or is Infinity Group looking for uh, some uh, making some good big uh, tech parks like in 50 acres or 100 acres in Newtown area? So, yes, uh, my answer is yes, and uh, it's a matter of time. So, uh, so we have got three right now, Mindspace, Embassy and Brookfield. Brookfield is already here. Uh, there will be some eight, nine more players getting into the same Ritz uh, uh, portfolios. And yes, we hope to expand it to a very big number. Okay. So Thank you so much. Drawing, Sir, uh, drawing reference to what Anirban said, it's like REIT is bound to catch up in India. It's just a matter of time. Probably we are two, two and a half years away, right? But having said that, we need institutional developer. I mean, that should be our focus. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, correct. Thank so you, I'll, I'll add on to what Shantanu said. We in India right now, the exposure to the institutional investment in India is in the tune of, uh, if I'm not wrong, I may be wrong a little bit on the figure, approximately 5 million USD. That's what you know, India's exposure is. Worldwide is one trillion USD spent every year by these institutional investors. New York itself takes 40 billion USD. So we are just 0 0.5% of the institutional investment in India overall to the, to the world picture. So there's a lot to come and it should come the way it's looking. Sir, recently we have seen that uh, Hyderabad's IT export have um, um, rose to 31%. So, are we targeting something like that, that Kolkata's IT export uh, for yes, so yes. something like that? So, Hyderabad has gone a little bit far ahead. 2007, uh, I remember, you know, we, uh, I mean, you know, Kolkata and Hyderabad, we were absorption-wise, square feet absorption-wise, we were same. Hyderabad will add on 19% to RITS next year. So, that Hyderabad is the next best thing which is growing. Uh, so, they have, they have gone up a little bit ahead of us, but uh, I think, you know, we hope to catch up also in, in due course of time. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think, okay. yes. Um, hi, all. Uh, my name is Tulika. I'm uh, leading the talent acquisition for LTI Mindtree in Kolkata. So uh, there's no question. I'm just uh, stating my experience. So when we started over here, we were very small uh, when Mindtree started over here. And uh, as a talent acquisition person, I really want to thank you, Anindya, for your posts on LinkedIn, okay? Whenever a new company comes to Calcutta, I get the information from your posts, <laughs> okay, that these are the companies which are coming. So for me, um, uh, motivating a candidate who's an outstation candidate, a non-Bengali candidate, to relocate to Calcutta, it helps me to actually refer to your posts and tell them that these are the other companies. So come to Calcutta, join us. <laughs> you have other options in eventually in two, three years' time. So that has really helped a lot. Your post has helped. Thank you so much. The kind of buildings you all make, the sustainable buildings. There was a time, the day we inaugurated the Mindtree office in Calcutta, you were also there. And uh, Debashi's Chatterjee, DC, I hope everybody knows about him. So we were in a room and he was saying that, Ato shundor building ache, log jon ashbeto. I just looked at him and I said, yeah, they'll come, okay? And um, just two, three months back, I was in the office and I was like, I just lifted my head and I saw each and every workstation was full. There were days when we had to actually uh, use the meeting rooms uh, to accommodate people who had not done the seat booking. And uh, when um, people from outside, I mean, when somebody from Chennai or Bangalore comes, they are amazed to look at the office that, oh my God, so many people are coming to office. We are struggling to get people back to office. And here, Calcutta office is full of people. 
because the kind of infrastructure that you've built, people feel, feel very comfortable coming to office and working. The kind of uh, buildings, the kind of facilities that are there, it's completely at, this, at par with the standards that people get in Bangalore and Pune. So thank you so much for all that you've done for the city. Your posts, I continue to, I will be referring to them for any hiring in Kolkata. There was a time when we were finding it difficult to attract talent for Calcutta, and now the time, I mean, it's completely changed. Calcutta has taken off. Great, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think somebody has a couple of hands. Puran is there. Uh, uh, Puran, just one sec, I think. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Arunashish again. Uh, as I heard from a talent manager, uh, I think one of the strategies which we need to uh, utilize in Bengal and which we've been missing out uh, very severely is how do we attract the senior level leadership from this city of Calcutta to come back and invest whether it's 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 DC whether it's you look at all organization and you can you can look at it it is primarily it's a leadership initiative to start something in your own hometown or somewhere close by I think that's a big missing link and that is where platform like BCCI can help and bridge that, you know. Uh, not only we are talking about builder, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure company, service providers, IT organization, but the leaderships, you know, which, which, which we can come and do that. And we require a talent pool, we require educational background that we have institutions. We also need to build in a strong ecosystem of startups, innovators, entrepreneurs, who will build solutions on which organizations will grow. So rather than a question, it's a suggestion, you know, for a BCCI. Great, great. Thank you, know, which you so you can much for the suggestion. For the leadership. Great. So I'll, uh, I'll add on, sir, to uh, one point, you know, which I have experienced in my life to your question, that, you know, on, on all national platforms, uh, so uh, personally, you know, I, uh, I had the business for Colliers for East India. That's what we say, basically, a zone. Uh, so in all India, mo uh, I mean, a lot of uh, pan-India platforms, you know, where people ask me about this thing, you know, I say the potential of this region is, uh, uh, as a breakup, I'll say, we have, uh, we have got 13 states, basically, if you add on the seven sisters, and if you add on Orissa, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and West Bengal, we have got, technically, we have got 13 states, and we have got two countries, which is Bangladesh, which is also controlled from your business of Bangladesh, and we can add on some time Bhutan uh, if it's becoming a business destination. So technically, you know, a person who is sitting here, any leader who is sitting here, the leadership control is 50% of India. India has got 28 states. So what more, you know, a leadership wants? What Absolutely. more potential a leader wants, actually? Absolutely. I think that's the way forward. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you so much. Puran? Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. It's really great to see such great minds coming together on one stage. And since you all are industry veterans, you are leading an industry, so my question might sound a little IPC or developer-centric, but we spoke largely about how flex operators are scaling up in an immense way. We are looking at a 0.8 million square feet of uh, holdings by the most recognizable national co-working operators. My question is, when we look at these co-working operators taking up clients that the IPCs provide, is it fair to say that in the times to come, these flex operators are going to transform as a threat to us and our industry? Because ultimately, it's the developer and the operator who continue the relationship and the IPC is then <laughs> taken a little so, back. Uh, so, you know, Puran, you know, when pandemic started, you know, the share of the uh, online uh, business, which were basically the warehousing business, was on single digits. Uh, post that, uh, you know, when people become used to Amazons and Flipkarts, you know, their market share doubled, basically. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the offline business, which is the retail business, improvised, and they also came up to the competition, and today you see both being omnipresent. So this is what we have. So there's been some beautiful concepts how Flex actually uh, mixes with the traditional offices, because what a young uh, working uh, professional wants, that's very important, you know. And if both of them can come together and build that, you know, so we say that, you know, in corporate world, there are three T's basically that they want, time, trust, 
and uh, team. So there are three T's they say they want. So if you can build that basically, you know, then why not? Both will coexist. You know, there are advantages of both the models. There are disadvantages of both. And Onindo is the best judge. And I've got Shantanu and Pratik and Joydeep also can speak about it. In so, fact, uh, then, yes, there are sir. two reasons why they will never turn out to be our competitor. Number one, our mandate will continue to remain, right? So they cannot, you know, get into our mandate, right? So in that case, but we have to treat them as our friend because they are giving us that end-to-end -end solution, correct? And number two, they happen to be our client, right? Mm -hmm. I think last... I will, I will just question. add to what, okay. what he was saying. Uh, see, um, in the mankind, in the human history, we have seen evolution of various types, right? This is another kind of evolution which we are witnessing in the commercial real estate industry. When Shandonda just mentioned about the mandates and our clients and all, the service delivery, the buildings and everything is the same. I mean, what I offer, or Pratik offers, or Nirmanda offers, the same. It's a trust and it's drawing the clear picture in front of the clients. So say for an example, say if you are the client, you call up four or five operators, they give you proposals and okay, fine, we are here, they are there. They are just giving their real estate portfolio, they are not giving the real estate solution. We, the IPCs, we're here to give them the real estate solution. So we will exist, we'll thrive. <laughs> Don't worry about that, yeah. Dada Apni. Uh, good afternoon. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm th 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 my name is Shubhashish Dhar. Uh, I'm speaking to you as a user. I go to office in sector five and I have a complaint in terms of the facilities that are there in parking of the vehicles, you know, it's terrible. I mean, when we go there, every time you have to worry, you know, how do you get a parking space? I think this is a problem you need to solve because, you know, there are hundreds of people like me who are suffering every day. And I think, until I that think, is I there, think, I will never speak good of Calcutta Sector 5. No, I, I, I totally agree. Parking is an issue. We are, you know, there's a huge crunch of parking, but it's better than CBD areas. At least things are moving. I was, I was this, just... I, have, I also traveled to Bangalore. I don't find that much of a problem no, in the I understand. CBD area no, of Bangalore. No, and because of that, I think we have Mr. Radhakrishnan, who is the board of uh, Navudiganto. They have built up, uh, you know, uh, government is also setting up uh, parking yeah, This uh, is a spaces. feedback. I'm not expecting you to give me an answer just now. I think you should look into it and try Absolutely. to solve the problem in some point, manner. Point taken, sir. Parking is a... Uh, is a, should be a solution, you know. Also, there is sure a parking solution coming up in uh, Newtown Rajat as well. See, and yes, it should be reasonable. See, uh, Newtown, they have imposed a 500 rupees fine for parking in Sir, the area outside of, you know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a simple, a I'll tell you a simple answer. Why do you have to sector 5 in sector 5? That's the parking air problem. But point, point taken, sir. I think, ah, ma'am, yes. I have a, a simple question. I was traveling in Bangalore and uh, they were showing me parts and somebody said that in Calcutta we have one sector five. In Bangalore, every area is a sector five. So why is it that we are concentrating on sector 5 is a good concept, but because it has become a single concept, that is why I think this issues like he raised about parking and all that come in. Why is it that the IT industry, the young generation has to be concentrated in sector 5 and Newtown and the rest of Calcutta can remain as it is? Why can't we expand this whole model to the rest I of think, Calcutta? I think the recommendation taken, Anguna will take it forward, <laughs> uh, you know, and present it. I, yeah. I think uh, point taken, we should be more inclusive and I think... Um, <laughs> I am happy to do Garment that. Has, uh, I am Alokananda Rao. I have been involved with all of you many years. Any help, please let you. me know. And one more question I would like to answer to somebody who mentioned that the airport, uh, it's very difficult to travel from the airport to any part of Calcutta. Well, if any of you have traveled from Bangalore airport to any <laughs> part no. of Bangalore, I don't think no. you will mention this. I think we'll end the session. Um, we have uh, another session coming up. Thank you so much. You people are the brand ambassadors. A round of applause for yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you, Angona. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anindo, for uh, guiding us. And not only, actually, he has curated this session. So, you know, the, you know he deserves all the appreciation. Uh, we have just facilitated. So, I would request Onindo to please present tokens of our appreciation to the panelists on the dais.
and I would now request our very own Kali Da, Mr. K.K. Mohapatro, to please come to the dais and present a token of our appreciation to Onindo. Again, a disclaimer, Onindo is very much Bengal chamber, but Onindo, thank you. So we will take just a couple of minutes to change over for the next session. So you can close the line. Hmm. And so we have the theme session, which will be followed by a brief demonstration by young, young IT enthusiast, which will be further followed by the evening networking session over, over beer and kebab. So I hope that you have enjoyed till this much and will also enjoy the upcoming sessions too and the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, you are requested to please take your seats so that we can start the next session seamlessly. Uh, AV, if you are ready, you can. Uh, so we are live. So this is a theme session, smart and connected ecosystem. And in the same session, the, the, the setting, the agenda would be by Ms. Suparna Datta, Global Industry 4.0 Head, LTI Mind Tree. And this would be moderated by Mr. Dev Kumar Mojumda. It will be further joined by Dr. D.K. Pratihar, Institute Chair Professor, Mechanical Engineering Department, IIT KGP, that is IIT Kharagpur. Mr. Takuji Hasui, Manager, Global Business Division, Fujisoft Incorporated. He will be joining from Japan. Mr. Otonu Pramanik, CEO and VP IT, RPSG Ventures Limited. Mr. Indronil Choudhury, Chief of Procurement Services, M Junction Services Limited. So we have Shuparna online, Ms. Shuparna Dotto. She is joining us from Mumbai. So before we we'll start this session with a brief video of our gold sponsor, LTI Mindtree. I must mention that this is a very, very enthusiastic, very Joshila video. <laughs> I asked the AV team here to put the music a little higher. We were enjoying it actually. So with this, over to uh, Mr. Uh, Dev Kumar Mojumdar, who is, who is moderating uh, this session.
Yeah. Okay. Good evening on a Friday evening. Uh, and this is the time where I think we are going to discuss some of the most interesting things that are happening around us. Uh, anywhere that you go, everyone talks about AI, analytics, robotics, automation, connected systems. So in this next uh, nearly about one and a half hours, we'll have an esteemed panel of speakers who will share their experiences, their concepts, and their ideas. There are some very interesting stuff, and I hope you will find this very interesting. Uh, but without much delay, what I will do is um, hand it over to Shuparna for her to conduct her session. And since we have both an in-person and a, a, a virtual mode, we'll try our best to optimize the discussions in the best possible way it happens. Over to you, Shuparna. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mojumda. I am re really missing the chance to be there in person. I would have loved that, uh, but can't help it. So uh, may I share my screen? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Let me know when it is visible. Yes, we can see. Visible? OK. So uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, sitting among so many manufacturing gurus, I'm really feeling humbled and privileged to talk on the journey of Connected Universe. Uh, do feel free to ask questions, but I think for the flow of the session, if we keep it at the end, it will be helpful. So, what is the enterprise looking for today? What is their priority? We see that the enterprise priority as a common priority across industry today, due to the fierce competition, is to come up with new business models and at the same time sustain the revenue growth. I'll take an example. Liu is not selling barrels of uh, oil today, but selling number of hours. They are committing the life of their lubricants. So that is the change uh, we are seeing in the market. Earlier, product development was the first step, and it used to end at the sale in the market. But now product design has taken center stage, and every Everyone is connected to it 360 degree. Now to transform customer and employee experience, mastering the next generation efficient operation is mandatory. Connected enterprise is the answer to it. So we see that there are certain driving forces for the connected enterprise. Today, consumers are the market deciders. They are defining the market. Those days are gone when you launch a product and customer will accept it. Now you need to make it uh, completely customer centric with focus mainly on the user experience and not only that, offer it through connected point of sense on your mobile, preferably. Even the chemical industries, they are also now thinking about the look and feel when they are uh, selling to their customers. Now, secondly, if we see uh, that uh, we should know the market feedback and take it to the design stage and make the product a value-added new variant, which is uh, aligned with the market. At the same time, we cannot miss the early entrance advantage you need to come up uh, with your variant well before your competitor can capture the market sector. Manufacturing line for this need not be only lean, but also it has to be agile, adaptable to cope up with the quicker reach to the market. Third one, if I see that capital investment is definitely needed if you want to modernize. Uh, your legacy plants, but business demands OPEX to be reduced in such a way that it balances the cost pressure because cost definitely cannot increase. <clears throat> this can also be possible when we increase the efficiency, do the scrap reduction, optimize the fuel and energy. 
next if you see the market acquisition is also happening in a very hostile way i'll take an example elevator industry uh, the manufacturer of elevators for them manufacturing and selling the uh, elevator is 40% of the business 30 to 40% whereas amc and custom services give them 60 to 70% of the revenue now this is possible only when connected environment of all the elevator instances are available and the mobile field services team are connected to it they know each of the instance performance behavior health and take action accordingly another important factor is the technology impact technology is changing as we all know uh, getting obsolete in six months time so we need to choose cautiously what technology we need to adopt and we can keep upgrading it at least for three years and it can be supported internally by our own people and at the same time the vendor and partner network so that we can be relevant to the market so these are the driving forces we see uh, in, which is defining the connected enterprise now how we can create these uh, connected enterprise i segregate uh, i see that industry is getting segregated on the connected uh, three parameters uh, which are the three segments first is connected supply chain all the plants the systems the subsystems the suppliers the sales outlets the labs the warehouse all of them <clears throat> connected to the ecosystem of the connected enterprise now this we have realized so badly uh, during the covid time that when the chief short shortage happened uh, so connected ecosystem of manufacturing plant and the supply network along with the supplier uh, sales outlet is mandatory to have the production flowing and the demand to match the supply Second will be the connected product and services uh, where we see that how the product is performing in the market, how additional revenue earnings can be done from the value added services from them. And thirdly, in the connected R&D where uh, I already talked about the building your product pipeline has to be responsive to the market chain. Now, if we look at these three areas, there will be 100 to 200 use cases. Do I implement all? That is neither practical nor feasible. So what we need to do here is we need to prioritize based on our business appetite, our specific industry demand, and where we can get the quick ROI. So how will it look like? If I look at the connected enterprise, normally there will be many use cases we see the connecting vehicles connecting consumer products all of these are well-known use cases uh, when we look at the uh, chemical industry again we saw that uh, they were manufacturing specialty uh, parameters which they call uh, performance engineering they were educating their customers how to best use their product under what kind of process parameters, process conditions, and taking the customers in multiple cycles, customers, customer event, they were trying to train so that the product is optimized and used perfectly. So this is the connected chemical we required here. Now I'm sure 60 to 70% of you and your family never go to a market to buy consumable uh, product, rather book them completely online based on your selected features. As customer, uh, you get the choice through your mobile point of sale. If I look at the contrast side, the connected construction, where through mobile equipment, as in, used in, by my parent company, l &T, they are connecting all the equipments across sites to make the optimal usage of these construction uh, uh, equipments because they are very costly they are very uh, heavy equipment so they have to optimize the usage to keep their cost low 
and at the same time manage the aggressive time plan most of the cases it is government products uh, the government construction projects so they the time pressure is unlimited so if i look at it at the core we see the production planning and the execution of the production scheduling is city how you align your production line with market demand requires not only lean manufacturing and uh, it also needs to go to the agile level but that is only possible using digital services so we need to have a connected support system where instead of shutting down the machine the machine will tell you about their health that they are going back they will use the prediction by ai technologies using the health data uh, of the machine connected through the iot system today reliability and energy efficiency centric maintenance strategy cannot be avoided because we are the age of sustainability product uh, goes through multiple uh, stage and at different uh, end of uh, product different production lines from raw material to semi finished goods to finished goods now quality check cannot be possible to be done in a separate end it needs to be in line quality check so that the variable factors which are impacting the process and the quality is real time adjusted bad quality and rejection has to be minimized so the two extreme ends of this visualization we see the product design and the uh, and the integrated uh, supply chain i mean rather the outward supply chain i would say where the logistics and the uh, distribution is happening these two are continuously connected to the central production system so if you launch a say product prototype and paste it in different difficult terrain because you need to, now today those kind of results to validate your product you need to get the data back to the system immediately you can't wait for weeks to get the reports so that's how the connected enterprise need to be virtualized and uh, <clears throat> we we need to do it real time so if i look at it real time collaboration is mandatory for the connected uh, enterprise now we were developing dashboards for last 15 years what is beyond analytics is experience and collaboration single source of truth which is used to common view for all shareholders across the board you see here basically how the technology is enabling the connected enterprise iot analytics for real time digital twin for the agile manufacturing uh, air vr technologies uh, for your uh, work instructions or your even uh, the uh, uh, remote assistance uh, for the from the experts to you know guide you in commissioning or even for the you know, purpose of uh, solving a problem all of these agvs robotics Uh, which is uh, moving around in the shop floor as well as in the factory premise okay so all of these technologies are enabling uh, the connected in enterprise and having collaborated in the common platform so which has a virtual commons command center now what, these type of technologies were all existing there is nothing so new but what i'm trying to put forth here is the connected enterprise is the place where all these technologies and the people are collaborated together what will happen is when the production line manager he is trying to look at the dashboards he is also doing a daily check of what is happening in his uh, production planning his shop floor and trying to find out the bottlenecks where what the problem is he should also have the equipment to uh, take the remote experts help or approve the pos or even push the work orders wherever is required to clear that bottleneck that happens immediately so that's where the enterprise is connecting 
I'll give you uh, one example which we are seeing from inside, being in LTI Mindtree as part of the LNT group. We are seeing LNT is taking the connected enterprise journey through technology interventions day to day basis. LNT, as you know, is into engineering, construction, they are building. Airport, uh, building dams, buildings, bridges, metro rails, what not. I mean, uh, uh, spaceship even. They are into engineer, energy transmission business, solar power generation business, and di different type of business. So there are different type of projects executed in different terrain, in aggressive timeline. So AI, computer vision, leader technologies, or IoT, additive manufacturing, all of these are connected together to continuously monitor the project progress, monitor the material consumption, availability of workers or even workers' health. We are connecting 12,000 plus plant and machineries, 250,000 plus workers and 7,000 odd uh, digitally tagged vehicles to the system to continuously monitor so many projects, not only across the nation, but nowadays across multiple countries. So drones are used in energy transformation business where monitoring the tower structure quality. We are using air VR on training and inspection across all the industries. And uh, trust me, our uh, um, CEO is having a project execution board at his cabin where he is monitoring all these different projects progress on a daily basis on a second to second changes. So that's how technology intervention is changing the world. Now I'll take some external examples and uh, specifically I have chosen this particular uh, battery manufacturer because uh, this battery manufacturer was looking for how they can improve their operational excellence by connecting the machinery. So they first started with the plant reporting, which helped them to assess the loopholes uh, at the asset level, at the process level, and also at the worker skill level. At the same time, they wanted to tie the manufacturing quality check with the performance of the battery at the market that is they connected the batteries on the trucks on the run and connected battery is sending the health data of the battery to the central system so that the design and process of manufacturing can be altered now this journey cannot be taken in one day so what we have done is step by step approach where every small step was giving them the return on investment on that particular area and then we move forward. So that's how a journey is taken by a company. So this is one uh, battery manufacturer example. I'll take the next example, which is from a pump manufacturer, basically pump OEM. Now, I mentioned earlier that the enterprise are looking into how to generate revenue in aftermarket different services. This is an OEM who is manufacturing pump and they wanted to give special value added services to their customer beyond the contract selling or selling the pumps or even the space. Now, since the products are connected, all the products in the uh, uh, market are connected, they can now advise the customer on how they need to operate, what is the right SOP, so that the product gives the right performance, how the pump is performing, how maintenance strategy can be carved out so that they do not need to carry additional uh, inventory of the parts. Now here, you are getting the goodwill of the customer, definitely, and you are charging the premium value for these premium services, and also, uh, you are all giving them special services like how energy can be optimized. Every customer today now report these sustainability parameters to SEBI. So this is how you can win the customer confidence uh, by 
and also at the same time increase your own business okay so the third example i'll take and then i'll stop uh, pause for questions uh, third example is from the life science industry pharma industry is the front runner in adopting the digitization especially after covid time when many other manufacturing <coughs> companies were shut down the pharma companies had to run and they were heavily loaded uh, to supply all these essential drugs now they learned it very hard way in this situation their factories had that been connected uh, in a better manner they could operate remotely with a handful people in the shop floor. now that is the learning and they are adopting the connected enterprise technologies uh, connected uh, platform of uh, iot they are connecting all their machineries their lab testing equipments and the workers continuously after this episode so they these highly regulated products are also getting delivered in a connected manner what is happening is that first step is that everything getting connected we can also get it the productivity of the people we can also get it, get the reliability of the line as a next step when the automated lab process are now rolling into the plants different different plants so this particular case what we started with is we started with multiple uh, different small small use cases but uh, defined their lab process and take that standard templatized lab process to multiple plants across the globe 60 plus plants it is taken or we have included the quality checks in line we have taken many other uh, steps by which this complete process equipment people everything is connected root cause analysis are uh, happening uh, in line and process disturbance and rejections are at the minimum now i'll pause here and ask you if you have any questions hello uh thank you suparna uh, very very interesting stuff for all of us and before i open it up to the audience while they think of a question i have a question for you uh can you briefly touch upon the security aspects that needs to be considered when you are talking about connected systems very interesting question actually uh, when we talk about this kind of connection obviously security takes um, I mean, there is a possibility that security can take hit, but connected enterprise bring many participants in terms of age, air via system, and uh, many other things which we all talked about in a connected manner. So you know your asset, ITOT inventory. Now, what we can do is that before inducting. these itot inventory to the system you do the security compliance segregate the itot network all together and it do, you do not expose your machinery to the it network you keep it completely secluded it network your company website will be residing so we will create a dmz layer between the it and the ot before sharing the ot data so ot data can be shared i'm not saying that it will not be shared but it will be restricted sharing we can uh, have the dmz layer to maintain the security prevent any right function so it will be one way outflow barring few control commands so that's how we can secure your ot network heavily i hope i answered your question Yeah, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Shubhana would still be online. Uh, we can come back to her after all the sessions. Any questions? Any hands? Okay. So thank you, Shubhana. I hope you will be online and you are you are able to hear us clearly. Uh, so again, uh, we heard a lot of concepts. I think now I will invite uh, Professor uh, to demystify all these terminologies for us in layman's word.
that is that I ah, so this is this is Okay. Good afternoon to everybody. I am grateful to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas. Now, as time is short, what I am going to do is, I am just going to hit the fundamentals. The fundamentals means like, what do you mean by intelligence? How can you define artificial intelligence? How does it differ from human intelligence? That has to be understood. Then I am just going to hit, why do you need automation? What is the role of robotics in automation? And how can AI help to develop the intelligent and autonomous robots? And in turn, how can AI help to establish the automation in industries? Now, let me start with the very definition of your intelligence. Now, the term intelligence that was introduced long back, like the Greek civilization, Egyptian civilization, Aristotle, Rene Descartes, Thomas Bayes. And this artificial intelligence that became very popular in the year 1956, when the DARPA project was actually sanctioned, got sanctioned. Now, this DARPA project is Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And the aim of that particular project is to develop the intelligent and autonomous robots. But suddenly, there was a drop in the interest of AI. And once again, AI has become today's AI with the introduction of deep learning neural network. Now, what I am going to tell you is what is AI and how does it differ from the human intelligence. Let me take a very simple example. The example is very hypothetical. Now, supposing that one unexpected incident has come, one, there was a murder case. So, what will happen? There will be investigation and the policeman will be asked to investigate. Now, supposing that the policeman could not find out the possible murderer, what could be the next step? The policeman is going to take the help of one sniffer dog. And might be the sniffer dog will be able to find out the possible murderer. Now, you see, the policeman could not solve the problem, but the sniffer dog could solve it. So, how can you train a sniffer dog? That human policeman is going to train that particular dog to perform this particular task. The artificial intelligence which is in the head of that sniffer dog could beat the human intelligence that is the policeman to find out who could be the possible murderer. So, this AI has beaten the human intelligence. Now, I am taking another example. Take a very small, very simple arithmetic, 2 plus 3 equals to how much? You ask the policeman, within a fraction of a second, he will say it is 5. You ask the sniffer dog, it will not be able to answer. So, your AI will fail, but the human intelligence is going to win. So, what the conclusion I am going to draw, do not compare AI with HI. So, they are complementary. They are helping one another and to solve the real world problem, try to take the help of either HI or AI or a combination. And our aim is to solve the real world problem. 
Now, this real world problem like your the automation, if you want to survive in dynamic and competitive market, what are the things you need? You need increased productivity, improved product quality, reduced cost. Now, you see some of these particular objectives are contradicting, they are fighting with each other. So, how to get all? If you want to get all three, increased productivity, improved product quality, reduced cost, there is no way out, but you will have to go for automation. And this automation, it could be hard automation, it could be flexible automation. All of us we know the mass production, batch production and piece production. For the mass production, we will have to go for hard automation. For batch production, it is the flexible automation. And for job production, piece production, we should not go for automation. Now, robotics is an example of flexible automation. And that is why the robots or the robotics have become so much popular in today's industry to incorporate the concept of automation so that the industry could be in competition in the dynamic and competitive market. Now, how to use, how to develop the intelligent robot, autonomous robot, emotional robot. And truly speaking, there is a difference between intelligent robot, autonomous robot and emotional robot. I am just going to tell you in short the difference. A robot is called intelligent if it can take the decision as the situation demand. It is called autonomous if it is, has got the permission to act in an intelligent way. And emotion, the robot should have emotion because we human being, whenever we take any decision, it is a combination of intelligence and emotion. So, our action is a combination of intelligence and emotion. So, if you want to replace human being by a robot, by copying his head, copying his hand, copying his heart, so, you will have to go for designing and developing intelligent, autonomous and emotional robot. And that is actually the trend we are moving towards. And how to make the robot intelligent, how to make it autonomous, how to make it emotional? It is with the help of AI only, you can get all three. Now, I am just going to tell you how to use AI to make the robot intelligent, autonomous and your emotional. So, what I can do is, supposing that I am just going to take a very simple example, I am just going to develop one robotic soldier, which I am, we are doing in fact, I am the main person, Diardo is developing the robotic soldier. So, what you will have to do, the robotic soldier is going to fight in a very hostile environment, there will be ups and downs, st uh, the staircases sort of thing, ups and downs, a very rough terrain. Now, this humanoid robot is going to perform its task by maintaining the dynamic balance. Di maintaining dynamic balance is very difficult for a humanoid robot. And the energy consumption should be as minimum as possible. So, I will have to find out one optimal design for the robot. So, how to find out the optimal design of the robot? So, you will have to go for the nature inspired optimization tool. I am also a proposer of very new and very recent uh, nature inspired optimization tool for which I have got the copyright also in uh, 2022. That is might be the best in the world as on today. That is called the Bonobo optimizer. So, using this nature inspired optimization tool, we can find out a very optimal design for the robot, which can perform the task by consuming the minimum energy after maintaining the dynamic balance. So, for getting the optimal design, we can use AI tools, that is the nature inspired optimization tools. We will have to find out the information of the environment. How to find out? With the help of our eyes, we collect information of the environment information goes to our brain. There is lot of processing, same type of processing robot has to do. 
So robot is going to collect information with the help of camera. The data is full of error, lot of imprecision, uncertainty, and that data are to be analyzed to find out the information of the environment. Now supposing that the robot has got the information of the environment, now in the brain, the planning has to be done. That is nothing but the motion planning. For example, there is a staircase, I have to make the plan, I have to make the, the gate plan. The sequence of the leg movement with respect to the other part of the body, that has to be planned according to the, the surface of the ground. And that planning is supported by the gate planning and once this motion plan, gate plan has been done using the AI tools, for example, fuzzy reasoning tool, neural networks, nowadays we people are using deep neural network very frequently, okay? And once you have done that particular thing, now you'll have to make it emotional. How to make the robot emotional? Once again, we can take the help of reasoning tool, fuzzy reasoning tool. Our brain most of the time works based on neural networks, based on the fuzzy logic. And we get some training with the help of some nature inspired optimization tool. So what you'll have to do, you'll have to artificially model the human brain so that it becomes intelligent, autonomous, and emotional. Exactly the same thing you'll have to inject to the head of a robot. And it is only with the help of AI we can go for that. So, to be in short, like we need intelligence, we need autonomy, we need emotion planning, and it is the AI tools which are required to get that particular, the, the intelligent, autonomous, and emotional robot. Here I'm just very quickly, I'm just going to show you a few robots and products which we have developed at IIT Kharagpur uh, in my lab, Center for Robotics, IIT Kharagpur. So this is one robot. This is used in steel plant. You can see that, say, in a molten bath, there is molten metal. And at the top of the molten metal, there is a slag. You'll have to remove the slag manually. So we are using a manual lever. So in one of the steel plant, they're told we are facing a lot of problem because human operator do not want to go there. So there we can use, we develop this particular robot the six-legged robot, and there is a serial manipulator mounted at the top. Now here I can just keep one equipment with the help of how much? Two minutes? So, so that we can remove that particular slag. This is one agriculture robot which has been designed and developed by us, and we have filed the patent also. So this robot can go to the field, collect information of the plants, decide whether it is suffering from disease A or B or C, accordingly select the pesticide and spray it in the field. So as time is short, I'm just going to show you only a few. So this is one railway track inspecting robot. There is a crack on the railway, okay? And this particular robot is going to take the snap, do image analysis. The moment it finds a crack, it will just stop with the help of GPS, it is going to go to the location. You go and see there could be a crack there. So this type of robot which we have developed, and now we are going, we have also filed patent for that. This is a drone, this is a conventional drone, but now we are working on self-morphing drone. Depending on the requirement, it is going to squeeze and it is going to expand. Okay, it's a very unique type of drone which we are developing now. This is orthotic device. Disabled people cannot stand, cannot walk. This type of orthotic device. This is a prosthetic device. So artificial limb amputed. So there we can use this type of your, the, the artificial limb. In all the products, we are using the principle of AI. Okay, so without AI, we cannot proceed further. So to come to the conclusion that modern industries must include intelligent robots, and to develop this intelligent, autonomous, and emotional robot, the use of AI is a must. In the form of optimization tool, in the form of input-output modeling tool, either in the form of fuzzy logic, 
or in the form of your neural networks. So, these are the books which I have written. You can see this is the textbook on robotics written by me. This is artificial intelligence. This has been translated in Chinese language also and it was published from India and UK. Uh, there are so many such uh, uh, this your reference books which I have edited and PhD thesis a large number of PhD 25 PhDs I have guided and now 12 are working. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much professor. What we will do is at the end we will take questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, very interesting session. We started from how a sniffer dog is taught in terms of looking for the murderer and then getting into intelligent, autonomous and uh, emotional uh, components of robotics and how AI plays into it. So, the next speaker would be um, Hasui's son. I think he will be over video. Is, uh, is he on? Good evening, Hasui san. I hope you can hear us. Hi. Good evening. Okay, can you my, hear us? My voice is clear. My voice is clear. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And I will hand it over to you for the next 10, 12 minutes. Uh, can you see my screen? No. Yeah, now we can see. Just a sec. Can I stop? Okay, thank you. Oh, Namaskar Bengal. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the today's presentation. Hello? Okay. This is Takuji Hasui, and I work for Fujisoft Incorporated Japan. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about robotics and automation, including our experiences and what we are doing now in Bengal. Automation is robotics are two distinct technologies, but the terms are often used interchangeably. Together, they have transformed the manufacturing space. Formerly time consuming duties are now fully automated with minimum operator input, and robots are taking over more labor intensive and hazardous tasks from humans. More manufacturers, more manufacturers than ever before are turning to automation and implementing robotics to remain competitive in the global market. Small businesses and large companies alike are now increasingly relying on robotics and automation to free human laborers' uh, rep repetitive tasks and boost uh, uh, productivity. With affordable industrial robotics uh, that are safe, safe to work alongside humans integrated with computer vision, utilized machine learning, and equipped with soft touch grippers, the many benefits of robotics and automation are, are growing every day. Some of the benefits are increasing in, increased efficiency, increased safety, cost saving over a period of time, more data driven, reduced waste, and freeing workers from uh, tedious and menial jobs. Thousands of companies are looking for methods to uh, employ robotics and automation to better their business model, whether it's because of the COVID-19 pandemic, labor shortage or supply chain issues. Everything from uh, how people move to how their favorite things are made is affected by automation and robotics. In the coming years, they will embark on some 
uh, intriguing new ventures with some of the most cutting edge applications in healthcare, manufacturing, uh, construction, agriculture, customer service, e-commerce, and many more sectors. The field of robotics is transforming multiple sectors at a rapid pace. However, it's still not advancing at pace, uh, expert imagines. This slow growth in the field of robotics can be attributed to the challenges the industry faces. Some of the challenges we all know are programming, the cost, uh, limited flexibility, employee resistance, better power sources, and repair and maintenance. However, uh, having said that researchers across the world are changing how to overcome these limitations and challenges. The use of several modern technology combinations to create highly flexible uh, self-adapting manufacturing capacity known as the smart factory. For instance, businesses like uh, manufacturing and distribution will develop greater intelligence as robots do. Assembly lines will benefit from industrial robots and automated solutions, and smart factory will become the norm. According to the report from McKinsey, automation and machine will see a shift in the way we work. They predict that across Europe, workers may need different uh, skills to find work. Their model shows that activities that require mainly physical and manual skills will decline by 18% by 2030. Uh, while those requiring best cognitive skills will decline by 28%. We may also see robots as a more integral part of our daily routine. In our homes, many simple tasks such as cooking and cleaning may be totally automated. Uh, similarly, uh, with robots that can use computer vision and natural language processing, we may see machines that can uh, interact with the world more, such as self-driving cars and digital assistants. Let me give you a brief introduction about our experience of robot and automation. The Paro project started in the early 20, uh, 2000s when we decided to demonstrate our technical capacities through a robot. Today, we are very proud that Paro is playing an playing active role in the society and is one of the most sought after robots in, in the senior care. He has 36 different neutral, uh, neural components like uh, motion sensing, voice recognition, face recognition, speed synthesis, uh, moving detection, and so on. These are uh, some, of the, uh, some of the use cases of our power in the Japanese market. I'll also explain what we are doing now in Bengal. Level food stuff to butter, center of excellence industry Industry 4.0, or COE, an initiative of the government of West Bengal, which has been set up by the Department of IT&E and Department of MSMNT through its nodal agency level, West Bengal. The COE aims to foster skill building, academic excellence, and future-ready talent development in the area of data science, cyber security, 3D manufacturing, and embedded systems, IoT. The objective of the COE is to provide students, professionals, 
and new age entrepreneurs with high quality education on emerging technologies to upscale their uh, competitiveness and develop uh, industrially highly skilled professionals and technopreneurs. It has set up with several global organizations and leading technology companies, Intel, NVIDIA, uh, Data Source Systems, Stratasys, Trend Micro, Fortinet, IMR Israel, Think Cyber Israel, Boston Training Academy, and Boston IT Solutions, to name a few. The COE provides a complete ecosystem for developing talent. The courses entail case studies, a real project, as well as capstone project brought by the corporates. Also, the course is uh, industry certified in order to ensure they are meeting, with, uh, meeting the uh, requirements of the market and enhancing employability. Training is offered in various formats, uh, which include on-premises and online courses. However, we stress doing 70% hands-on hands -on learning and work, our, uh, work on our labs. We would like to invite the companies participating in this event today to use this offering from the COE to work together for future fit talent. Uh, lastly, on behalf of the COE, I would like to invite everyone attending today's event to join for this forthcoming free workshop on ISO 27001. Please do visit our booth for spot registration. Thank you for your time and patience. For any queries, my colleague, Mr. Debas Masvidal, who is the country head from Fusov, will be at the COE booth to answer your queries. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asui san. I think uh, one of the key areas for in today's world of AI, robotics, connected systems, is that everyone wants to do that, but there is a serious dearth of talent in the market. And it was great to see the approach that you and your organization have taken in terms of building through the COE the capability and mm -hmm. the skills in this part of the world. So thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So with that, uh, can we move to Mr. Pramanik, please, into the interesting world of smart utility services. Good afternoon, everyone. So today, the topic given to me is uh, smart utility services. Now, I know, I think we everyone knows about what we talk about or what we mean by smart utilities, right? Smart utilities are those which we use on our, or which we take services for our daily usage, like gas, like water, like telecommunication, like waste treatment, and so is also power. So today I'll kind of take you through a few areas where the smart utility services are being utilized for uh, power sector. I represent I RPSG group, specifically the power group companies. But again, not necessarily that whatever I'm trying to talk about here is done for CSC or at RPSG. It is an overall generic view that I'm trying to uh, give it here. So basically, over the years, the power businesses thrive on two different inputs. One, if it is in the residential areas like rural or urban, it is on how you basically 
improvise your input costs and how you provide a better or more improved customer services and on the other side the real growth is seen when you have or when you are covering industrial areas so as to say so today i'll try to cover some of the areas where either we are working king in basically the residential come i mean that may be either rural or or urban areas the areas that we are working is basically to reduce cost or the loss i would say and hence the operating cost is around transmission and distribution losses lowering them obviously the faster and smoother customer experience be it around uh, new connections be it around any uh, service disruptions that you get be it around commercials like billing or be it around any additional services that you might require and obviously on the upstream side the industry is also trying to automate the preventive maintenance specifically by reducing the cycle time of the maintenance to touch upon the areas of improved customer service i'll take couple of example areas to make it easier to uh, comprehend is in yesterday's or even in the current world let's say you need a new connection and you apply for a new connection to a power utilities organization so for them there are certain regulatory checks that they need to do at a minimum level now if you are doing that over ages using manual methods of checking simply let's say you have to check whether the application from where it has come for new connection does that premises or does that building have got any other connection is there another connection in the same name today we verify that with any authentication method be it aadhar or anything what kind of connection does it have and a few other things now it takes if you do it manually few hours over few days while the elapsed time could be few days actual effective time could be few hours now if you introduce simple automation methods of robotic process automation for a repetitive work like this you can possibly do this over a few minutes if the data that you want is available with you that's a matter of few minutes that you can authorize a new connection and even such data let's say in a center in a manual you have come to a center and you are applying a physical paper so when you take a token in the queue let's say let's say there are 10 people be before you you are 11th now when you get in the center and you key in what you want for it's a new connection and you get a token by the time your number turns up at the back end the information system retrieves all the required data based on your application which you might have already keyed in and is ready for a decision when you reach the counter obviously taking into the upstream and the downstream sides of it there are introductions of smart metering systems which allows the organizations or the operators to keep a close tab on the usage pattern of the consumer on the other side the consumer can also see what is his or her usage pattern over the day over the night or over the month or over the year 
by introduction of smart meters the process of remediation or let's say disconnection of a, a location movement or non payment of bills or reconnection in case of payment of arrears all are done sitting in the office so these are huge benefit in terms of the time effort savings and also for the customer if let's say for some reason you had been out and you didn't pay your line got disconnected if we can introduce smart meters your line can be connected or reconnected in a matter of seconds within india multiple discoms have already introduced that and internationally it's a norm practically obviously multiple data collection and its usage i mean data collection obviously through sensors through iot platforms and its usage to optimize the operating parameters is a norm now it is nothing special or specific for utilities it is a norm now possibly for any manufacturing or industrial unit we heard mrs das earlier that uh, that uh, sorry i'm sorry uh, that what lnt is doing today so it is nothing abnormal that any organization today which has got any moving parts will introduce sensors and pick up data for improvisation of the operating parameters specific to power what a few things are happening today is every country and so is india is in a national grid infrastructure what does that mean is any generating power generating unit from any source thermal power that is coal hydel power or renewable energy it adds up to the national grid and depending on your capacity to buy if you are not a generating unit if you are only a distribution authority you can buy power from the national grid and distribute amongst your consumers right this happens under a tremendously highly regulated platform managed by respective governments government i mean local state governments as well as central government as well as multiple regulatory authorities are involved in it so the combination of the grid modernization and automation and management is an integral part how the current power utility organizations are managing their operations so these are the certain areas where in today's world the automation is happening in the power utility sector and some of the benefits that we can see are increased operational efficiency improved reliability and outage management obviously enhanced customer satisfaction cost savings through optimized resource allocation and obviously environmental sustainability let's say i give another example of uh, customer satisfaction in specifically specifically in any utility sector when you want to reach out to the organization earlier there was only probably you have to go to the office and report anything that you want is not working today there are six or seven or more than seven channels that i can talk of which any such organization is today utilizing today you can have a website you can have a whatsapp you can have sms you can have email you can have chatbot you can have mobile app you can have voice bot and gradually those channels are increasing so this not only kind of takes 
the consumer and the organization closer, but it reduces the time and further improves the customer satisfaction to an extent whenever you are trying to reach out to, the, to your operator, right? So these are a few areas where currently the organizations are working and just a quick touch on some of the areas where mostly the Western world and in some areas here in India also some works are being done is the introduction of AI, I mean professor has spoken about that and ML in predictive maintenance specifically and in anomaly detection. We all need data today and I'm, I don't need to talk about data is the new oil or so, of, I mean, so and so forth. Obviously the security is a huge concern in any of these initiatives so as to say because ultimately it makes you connected more and more closer to everything that you do, electronically connected. And the moment you get electronically connected and you use data for any of such improvisation, any of such analytics, you have to have much higher level of information security or cyber security around those. Today we are also allowing consumers, be it domestic consumers or commercial consumers, to have their own generation, specifically solar, right? And that integration is also happening in a big way in the industry today that as an individual consumer, if you put a small solar cell on your rooftop or let's say our airports or let's say our factories where there are redundant space, redundant field, everyone today is deploying Solar, uh, solar cells, right? Now, how do you utilize those? That's again, on one side is regulated. On the other side is the integration of the smart grid and the up and down, the upload and download of that power to make it a seamless experience of even the individual consumer. The tariff can calculations are different, the way you can give to the grid and take back from the grid is different. So that calls for a pretty seamless, I would say integration techniques and applications around. The term that be, is being used is called net metering. Obviously the power utility sector is being impacted by the electric vehicles while there are different discussions about the longevity or the real technology behind the vehicles. I'm not going to touch that, the lithium batteries or the, today, even not even one battery is being manufactured in India. We all are importing every single battery which is there in the electric cars, cars today, right? The disposal arrangement of those batteries, those are different techniques. But overall, how do you charge those electric vehicles? is having an impact again on the way that today the power utility organizations are working. Their tariffs are differently calculated. The way that you can connect to the grid to charge your electric vehicle is different, separate or from your uh, personal individual residential consumption. As a technology, blockchain is also coming in a big Mr. way in- Mr. Pramani. In, in this uh, utility sector. Because of this multiple interactions between individual generators or generating organizations, the residential generations like solar cells or anything, the corporates around it, it's ultimately transaction. And we know that blockchain is a system that allows you a very legitimate but unrevertible transaction. So blockchain is coming in a big way in uh, and, and making it a transparent in the energy transaction that is happening today. Basically these all are very highly uh, under work, work in progress I would say in multiple 
Western countries and some of them are also in India. So I just wanted to touch upon whatever is being uh, done in this industry. Thanks. Uh, if there are any questions, I can post Thank you very much, and I'm sorry to rush you at, at the end. Uh, I think if you look at the four speakers that we had, I think the first three speakers spoke about the overarching concepts of AI, analytics, robotics, automation. Professor spoke about the fundamentals of AI and robotics. Uh, we had Mr. Pramanik spoke, speak about a particular industry vertical, and the realms of possibility are significant in any vertical that you go through. The utility industry in India is still very regulated, but think of a day when this becomes unregulated. Mr. Pramanik will have more information about us, what we do, what time we come out, what house we've sold, whether we are moving to a new home. You have a phenomenal amount of data for us. So we spoke about a vertical and how can we not uh, end the session with an interesting topic on the, on the platform. Anything that we do today is a platform. So a flexible platform concept. Uh, I, I will hand it over to you, Indrarin. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Is it on? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, for the last 45 minutes or so, uh, there were some engaging discussions that we've all been hearing. And a few words, and I was capturing a few words, okay. Now, as I'm going to talk about flexible platforms, words like connected systems, data, automation, I think all of these words, uh, even AI, these all resonate with uh, platforms. And, and we really can't talk about platforms which are not flexible, okay? So I was thinking over the, of spending over the next 10 minutes or 12 minutes over uh, the domain of electronic procurement, right? So electronic procurement, as we all know, uh, started about more than two decades back in India. And uh, at that point of time, it was more of transparency and efficiency that we were talking about. But today, if we look at e-procurement, it's not just an electronic procurement or an e-tendering application. It's more than that. So people who use platforms, they look forward to not only do transactions, but also derive values in terms of the needs that they have. So the first, um, let me, okay. Does it work or does it not work? Okay. So the first uh, part of the story is that we have, uh, let's say, an e-procurement platform on the cloud, a SaaS-based cloud-hosted platform which in M Junction, we have got a platform which is named MJ Pro. So looking at it at the center, if we look at the connected ecosystem, the procurement ecosystem, we have got the buyers or the buyer community at the center. Apart from that, there's a huge data, I mean, there's a huge group of suppliers who are connected. So we have got a supplier base who gets connected to the platform. And then the suppliers who are getting connected they need to transact with the buyers, not only on their desktops, but also through their mobile devices. So the point of mobile app comes into play. Now, when, whenever we talk about data, there's a lot of action on analytics. So which means, how do we mine the data properly, or how do we mine the data effectively to generate meaningful insights? I think that's one of the core areas where any user or a stakeholder of an electronic procurement system would look forward to. And there, data sanitization becomes very important. So once you have data, 
it is not only important to use the data effectively, but it is also more important to have sanitized data at hand. Today, if a platform works, if any organization uses a platform, it is not only one platform which works, right? So, it is there are legacy systems, there are certain platforms or certain systems which have been developed in house, there are certain system software which get bought out. So, at the end of the day, when let us say let me take an example, in a shop floor when a product is required or a requirement comes up, then typically an indent is created in the ERP which could be any ERP, I am not taking names, but it could be any ERP in the system. And when an indent gets created, it is very important for the indent to flow into the purchasing system where tenders get you know created and issued to the suppliers. Now, in towards that as the suppliers come back with a quotation or the suppliers come back with a response, it becomes very important for the data which got generated at the shop floor you know, to get transferred seamlessly from one system to the other in terms of the back end ERP to their legacy systems to the e-procurement platform to the suppliers and then back. And here integration becomes very important. So, as far as integration is concerned, the supplier network is concerned, the buyer group is concerned, it is a connected place where people transact to create value or to add value to their businesses. And now to support this, it is not only IT. Okay, so, uh, I mean there was one statement which the professor had made that there is a difference between AI and HI. Okay. Similarly, you know all the all the actions cannot be totally driven by IT alone. IT can complement the human actions. So, when a lot of IT systems are in place, transactions are in place, data is in place, there has to be a supporting infrastructure which would actually empower the users to use the IT platform in terms of a help desk, in terms of a training system, etc. So, in a, in, a, in a way the smart and connected products actually when we say that they, they allow the data to get exchanged, analyzed and, and create meaningful insights, analytics becomes very important. So, this is just a snapshot of an analytics, I will I'll just spend uh, less than a minute on this slide. So, typically whenever any organization procures uh, equipment, raw material for their uh, produce, end produce, it is very important for the leadership team to manage the spend in terms of how are they performing. And when we have a lot of transactional data all organized in a seamless fashion in terms of isolated boxes. I would use, term, use the term boxes. And if we have a very, very flexible and agile platform to cull out that data and get meaningful insights, it really brings up a lot of decision taking uh, 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 inputs. For example, which are my high spend areas? Is there any fraud going on? You know, what sort of an ABC analysis can I do with my product? So, all of these can be used, I mean can be effectively used. Uh, through analytics dashboard which actually is there in MJ Pro. And since I am talking about flexibility, it is very important that platforms are flexible. I will talk about two stories, very short stories, it is not like a story, two small uh, I mean use cases I would say where the point of flexibility uh, becomes very prominent. So, today when we talk about flexibility, it is not about uh, customization. Okay. So, where there is a platform and gone are the days where you know we used to we, I mean people used to deploy people resources to identify each and every process and customize an application for a particular organization. So, gone are those days because nowadays people look at flexible platforms which are configurable maybe at the UI layer. Okay. So, flexibility and configurability is something which is very very important and in fact I have myself experience this while implementing MJ Pro as an e-procurement application in different organizations that how important it is to have a platform which is configurable. Okay. And that gives you personalization. So, it is not customization, it is more of personalization which means you configure your flexible platform and personalize it to the extent that each of your organizations or customers would like it to be. 
So, how, how am I doing on time? So, we, I still have 5 minutes, good, thanks. And when I talk about, let me then you know delve a bit deeper into flexibility. So, an organization procures different types of items, okay. It could be goods, services, it could be a mix of both, it could even be complicated project buys. So, when I go or when we go and implement an e-procurement application for any organization which is having complexities in project procurement, the first thing which comes to our mind is that how do we address the processes which are applied for each type of buy. Okay. For example, somebody who is importing certain things from abroad may have a particular template or a, or, or a way of uh, accepting the prices or the terms from the bidders which could be vastly different from somebody who is buying something internally from, from the country or which could even be different in terms of evaluation. The way I evaluate a product when I am buying a product commercially and technically could be very different from the way uh, that I would evaluate a services buy. Okay. And it could even be very different from the way that I buy different projects components when I, when I am implementing projects uh, or buying some project items. And all of these have to be uh, accommodated I would say in one single e-procurement platform and that is something where flexibility kicks in. So, if the platform is not flexible, the system will not work. And when we talk about flexibility, we also talk about convenience, we talk about coverage. When I say convenience, which means how easy is for a user to use the platform. If I talk about coverage, it is how flexible is my platform so that 100 percent of all my buys that I, that I purchase throughout the year can be accommodated and bought on the platform. So, this is one, uh, uh, one of uh, one, one case study of just it is a very interesting piece. Uh, so, we had uh, implemented an e-procurement application for the Ministry of Defense. So, if you have to look at the scale, you know the scale is there right at the box uh, left, uh, the top left box in blue. 41 units production factories, 5000 you know buying executives, 15 to 18000 suppliers and the number of orders that they were issuing per year is close to 8000. So, that is the uh, that is the span that is the extent of the application that we had implemented and all of a sudden the pandemic started. So, the ministry of defense having 41 production units manufacturing arms and ammunition for the for the Indian armed forces. They were faced with a sudden need and the need was very, very, very urgent. The turnaround time was very less. So, they had faced with a sudden need to shift their gears from manufacturing arms to manufacturing equipment to support the Indian fight towards the pandemic, okay, in terms of making protective equipment, masks, sanitizers and what not fumigation equipment etc. Now, let us try to understand is it is very easy you know to, to say that a group of factories which were manufacturing arms and ammunition are manufacturing uh, impact I mean the products which are required to fight the pandemic. But let us also try to understand and appreciate that all the processes which were in force to get the raw materials in while manufacturing arms had to be changed immediately in terms of adapting itself or adapting the processes to buying the raw material needed to manufacture these items in terms of emergency. The entire supplier base got changed. The template in which the products were the, the RFQs were made got changed. The templates in which the quotations were submitted by the vendors got changed the entire set of buyers and suppliers were new, they were used to be trained. So, all of these had to be get accommodated on the platform in terms of flexibility and as I was, I was talking about a bit earlier in terms of support, the help desk support to empower the stakeholders to work on the new environment. So, that was a very you know very uh, uh, an example which I thought of sharing with you and one final one. 
It is also something which has got to do with flexibility and adapting uh, to the changed environment. So there was a huge implementation that was being made, e-procurement in the government of Bihar. Uh, 110 state governments, 2,500 buyers, 26,000 suppliers. So you, you can see the extent and the span of, uh, uh, of the implementation. The same thing happened right at the time of pandemic, the implementation suffered. And the entire uh, way in which the implementation of the platform happened, every module, uh, starting from implementing each functionality, everything got changed in terms of uh, having the implementation mode shifted from a face-to-face -face one to a remote one. So I think, and, and, and the, whatever I've written in terms of un, uninterrupted uh, implementation, I think these are the IT enablers. I need not read them out. So uh, I'm sorry if I'd been a bit fast, but I think I end here in terms of talking about flexibility. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. Much. Choudhury. Uh, I know we have just overshot our time by about three, four minutes. Is there any question? One question? Yes, please. Can On behalf of this uh, audience, this is an appreciation for the, all the organi organizing committee members and all the speakers who maintain time schedule of 30 speakers speaking in such a short time and, and elaborately explaining so many things. It is a lesson for us. I have been in, in doing this type of jobs in earlier occasions in my earlier days, but not so pre preciously, so meticulously. I thank the uh, BCC, BCCI and uh, all the speakers here uh, for keeping their time schedule. I, I appreciate this lady also for you and uh, all your stuff. Thank you very much. Okay. So it's not my feeling, you. feeling of others also. I, I'm not speaking as Kundu only. I'm speaking on behalf of other participants. So thank you very much. So with that, uh, I, I personally would like to thank BCCI for giving me this opportunity to moderate this extremely, extremely uh, wonderful session with and privilege to be in the company of some August speakers, both present with me on the dais and uh, and uh, and Shuparna and Hasui San in over the virtual mode. Uh, you got a glimpse into the worlds of uh, connected ecosystem, AI, robotics. Uh, there, there, the realms of possibility are huge. Every day there is new things that are coming up. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, thank you, BCI, for having us here. Uh, and, and thank you, audience, for, for hearing uh, all our speakers so intently. So after this, we'll have a brief demonstration by, as I mentioned, students, young IT enthusiasts on their innovations, following which you were invited to the evening networking. But before we close this, I would request Mr. Mojumda to please present tokens of our appreciation on the, to the speakers on the dais. To Ms. Datta, we will connect with her. And also thank you, Mr. Takuji Hasui, who has joined us from Japan. And I would request Mr. Onindo Chatterjee, co-chairperson of our IT Entrepreneurs and E-Commerce Committee, to please present token of our appreciation to Mr. Dev Kumar Mojumdar. Mr. Mojumdar is also a member of our IT committee. So we are closing this session here. You let me know before it goes real life. Before you are, I mean, when you are ready for the real life. So while we'll be changing over for the next session, uh, it is the demonstration on smart and connect products and services ecosystem. We will have a short video of Bevel Fujisoft Vara.
I don't know how many of you have been to this center. To me, it was an eye-opener. It was very thrill to know a center like this is here in Kolkata. They have some, uh, you know, their uh, 3D printed products at their stall, at their table space outside. You may have a look. So are we ready for the next session? So welcome back to the concluding session of the 14th BITC of the Bengal Chamber. So this is a demonstration by the students of Narula Institute of Technology. The session would be moderated by Mr. Shomnath Nak, Vice President, Marketing, CalSoft Inc. He has traveled from Bangalore to join us today. He's also a member of our IT committee, but he has made the effort of traveling from Bengaluru and joining us here. And uh, the demonstration would be by Mr. Shoikot Choudhury. He's the team leader of this team who will be presenting here today. He's a second year student in the Electronics and Communication Engineering Department of Narula Institute of Technology. Mr. Obhik Dotto, second year student in Electronics and Communication, Department, uh, Communication Engineering Department. Mr. Obhinavo Roy, second year student in Electronics and Communication Engineering Depart Department. And their mentor is Mr. Obhijit Ghosh, assistant professor in the same department. So I would request them to be on dais and over to Mr. Shomnath Nag. I would request the guests to please take their seats. And in case you would like to catch up, this room, um, this, the annex room is available. You may please have your discussions there. And otherwise, you may please take your seats. Good evening. I hope I am audible. Uh, thanks for staying back till late for the last session for today here. Uh, so I think we last few last sessions that we have gone through today, there are a few interesting things where we are all talking about connected, connected ecosystem, right? Now here, I think the students of NIT, they are going to demonstrate us something which is, is a real connected thing that we need to think about. So we heard from today morning uh, about a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. We have heard about connected ecosystems, robotics, right? Now, I'm not saying they are going to do everything, but I think what they're bringing to here to show us something uh, which is a connected vehicle and which is more from a technology perspective is called telemetry. Use the data to, I, okay, I will not really get into the things. What I'm saying is that what they are doing, uh, which is very uh, useful for uh, some of the car or most of the cars and most of the car drivers in future. I think I will just tell that and hand it over to them if they, for their presentation. Hello. Potholes. After hearing this word, this kind of picture pops in our mind. Potholes are those annoying road defects which caused lots of troubles, including damages, accidents, even accidents and deaths. Okay, so uh, we are team Potholder. Uh, we use technology to fight against these potholes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is our introduction. Uh, firstly, we have uh, developed an um, an connected system. Basically, it uh, consists of hardware and software. Both connects together via a cloud, and it detects potholes 
and other types of uh, road defects such as humps like uh, there are a lot of accidents happens due to unmarked humps and then there are some uh, roads which are not maintained properly so there are like uh, a long road with uh, like lot of stones and everything so we fight against that so this is our team i am saika choudhury the team lead i am avik datta i am the hard hat enthusiast of the pothole team i am abhinav roy i am i have mainly focused on the data analysis part of this project we all are from narula institute of technologies electronics and communication department and let's meet our mentor she is professor dr shonda patnaik ma'am and he is uh, professor obhijit ghosh sir without them this project uh, shouldn't be alive and uh, today we would be wouldn't be here for presenting okay so let's have the overview of our system first our system works on four stages firstly we have a specialized hardware which identify the uh, road irregularities like if there is pothole or if there is some uh, humps unmarked humps then uh, it also gets the location of the car then it marks that location uh, along with the severity of the defect in our server then onboard users and upcoming users uh, can able to see those data in the app and they get alerted like we have to drive with caution because uh, the ahead road is damaged or there is some issue in the ahead road and then uh, it also displays uh, our alternate routes and currently we are working on it now let's come to the controller logic flow and system overview of our project firstly let's come to the system overview These are the three main hardwares we have used in our project: IMU sensor, vision sensor, and GPS. And all of them are connected to a MPU or microprocessor unit, and then it is connected to our cloud server through a communication gateway. Now let's come to a brief description of the hardwares we have used. Firstly, we have used IMU or inertial measurement unit. This is basically to measure the amount of jerk a vehicle has encountered while traveling. Okay. this will help us detecting the potholes and bumpers or uh, some damaged roads it has encountered on its way and this is specially useful when the vision sensor is blocked due to darkness or uh, due to foggy weather or um, sometimes when the pothole is covered with water in the season of monsoon or while it is raining now let's come to the another hardware that is vision sensor this is basically a camera here we will identify potholes and bumpers with the help of vision sensing or uh, object identification from the live camera feed and now the last hardware that is gps this is basically to locate or mark the potholes and uh, bumpers on the map through our app let's come to the hardware part we basically use only the four components that is a uh, mcu that is the microcontroller microcontroller unit I am using the initial measurement unit, a camera, and a GPS only. Now let's come to the mobile app. These are some pages of user interface on our app. <coughs> Now, when you turn on the app, you will see this kind of page. Now here you can see it is uh, showing good. That is because the surrounding road condition is good. as it can detect the your location so it will say uh, according to the surrounding road condition and uh, when the there is a uh, many potholes or bumpers or uh, damaged roads around you then it will uh, definitely show a different comment now under that you can see report uh, oh sorry before that uh, you can see in the photo that there are different location marks of different colors uh, the red one detects the pothole and the purples are for detecting bumps and uh, there is one more thing uh, we are still working on it that is uh, we are trying to mark the roads with uh, damaged roads basically uh, with the uh, colored poly lines according to the severity of damage of the roads now here in this page uh, under the good you can see a uh, option report condition now when you click on the report condition you will get two options that is trip and spot trip is for uh, while you are starting a trip then click on the trip option and this kind of page will appear here you can see different parameters like trip duration speed and uh, potholes detected coordinates etc and uh, here this is basically to detect potholes and bumps when you are traveling and after trip you can end that 
and after ending your trip you will uh, see this kind of page this is basically gives you the summary of your whole trip that is a uh, trip duration the distance traveled number of potholes you have encountered etc now let's come to the another option that is spot suppose you are not driving or uh, you are not traveling you are just roaming on an area and you have seen a few potholes or bumps then what will you do you will just capture a photo of that in our app and uh, will upload that after capturing and uh, you will see this kind of page which will also detect the location of that area okay and uh, we will also uh, add this location to our map so that upcoming drivers or users when uh, they will go through that area they will also be able to see this uh, pothole or bumper whatever let's come to the development phase there is some glimpse of our development phase that we uh, are, are working on it now let's come to the data visualization here you can see a graph this is uh, graph is basically made with the data we have got from the imu sensor now here we will uh, try to explain that how we will identify potholes and bumps with the help of imu sensor data here you can see that uh, when the bump when the graph is just rising and then falling that is basically when you will encounter a bump because uh, when you encounter a bump you see that our car firstly rises then it falls so when uh, you can see that his hand he is holding the sensor imu sensor that he, when his hand was this like this yes that's like this this uh, shows the uh, bumper and uh, you can see in this graph the graph is firstly falling then it is rising this occurs in case of potholes you can see that a uh, car firstly go down and then it rises so this helps in uh, detecting potholes and after that uh, if the imu sensor continuously detect amount uh, matlab continuously detect the jerk then uh, we will uh, encounter uh, then we will detect that as a bad road or damaged road on our map okay now we have also done uh, image processing like uh, object identification because see always we will not purposefully go through a pothole or bumper right so sometimes we try to escape it right so in that case that feed will not get recorded so we will place one uh, camera in the dashboard it will um, check about the head road how much uh, we can capture like field of view is maximum of like uh, maybe around uh, 10 to 20 meters with our current setup uh, we are um, thinking to expand it in future so see there is normal road that's why it's uh, showing normal and whenever pothole is detected it will show pothole and this everything will be done on live like uh, live uh, uh, object recognition will be performed on the car Let's go to the test phase. Uh, we test our uh, uh, hardware in the barrack position in uh, bike. You can see the hardware of our hardware. It's plugged in the smart guard of the bike. And uh, this test was uh, made on a two-wheeler and then we also performed the same test on a four-wheeler and as you can see we are getting live data then we compared with our uh, like real-time situation then we are uh, constantly training our model currently we are not using any machine learning algorithm currently we are using simple threshold values but we are currently learning about the machine learning part like how we can implement this data because uh, false triggers might occur right so we are trying to integrate the whole thing with the machine learning model so uh, this is the review while we uh, perform the test on car and as you can see that uh, mpu sorry imu sensor was placed on the dashboard okay so uh, i know majority of you are from business background so let me come to the business side of our project okay so uh, we have main three mode of revenue generation the first is from sales of our hardware we are uh, designing a hardware we have already developed the first stage of our hardware and we are constantly trying to make it better 
then we can uh, get a portion of revenue from the subscription like in app subscription then the third thing is partnership we can um, collaborate with different companies with our project right so from that we can uh, earn a revenue let's have a detailed lookup of our uh, revenue generation model firstly subscription see uh, who use our app they can able to see normal surrounding portholes uh, for free but if somebody wants like um, uh, some customized uh, suggested routes like uh, it will be based on the vehicle's driver profile okay suppose if you're having a four wheeler it will suggest a different route if you're having a two wheeler it will suggest a different route based on your preferences so uh, that would be included in our subscription then the second is data licensing uh, the cars who are uh, using our hardware the pupils who are using our app we will get constant data from them we can license those data to third party companies like suppose i'm having a road condition data and uh, somebody wants to uh, do some development on the road so we can uh, license those data to those uh, third party companies and we can obviously earn a good amount of revenue from that then third is partnership uh, we can have partnership with different logistic companies or delivery agents like Zomato, Swiggy, or we can have a uh, partnership with logistics companies like uh, DTDC, Blue Dirt or something. Because see, those drivers drive cars for transportation, right? And they obviously need to have a good idea about a head road. And especially in night when they can't able to see and they are uh, going through NH or something, maybe there is some issues. So how they can able to know that? So our app will help them to drive with caution. Then the third is government tie-up. Uh, sorry, fourth is government tie-up. Uh, we can have tie-up with governments, like when governments want to do development and maintenance, we can share the analytics data to them, which is obtained from our system. Then uh, we integrated prime features. This is just an add-on feature. Uh, this is not our main focus. This is just a side thing for getting little extra money. So uh, what we included on the prime features, that is like personalized alerts. Like suppose you want to uh, go into a particular area and you want to get notified. So you can do that. Then one of my friends suggested me to add that historic facts. He loves to travel through different places and he always curious to know the history of that place. So we thought, okay, after a certain stage, we can integrate that. So somebody who paid for that feature, they can able to see the historical glimpses of that place while navigating, right? Then our hardware also can be connected with other systems, like suppose uh, you want your uh, car suspension to be an active suspension, like while it's encountering a pothole, you want, to, uh, you want your car to automatically adjust the height of the suspension and uh, minimize the vibration. So in that case, our hardware can be integrated with um, any other like suspension or active braking system, which is obviously done by higher end car like BMW and all, they always use active suspension. So any existing user who are having normal cars, they obviously can integrate. So that's it. Once again, we are Team Potholder, a small step to make your journey safe. We are open to all the questions and suggestions. Thank you so much. Thank you. But uh, just few points I would like to ask you all that uh, you have, what you have said that you have primarily made your trials, primarily on two-wheeler, but four-wheeler, what I under understood, number of trials are uh, not, uh, not in that much of number. Exactly. And have you considered the different axles and traction for, say, four-wheeler or eight-wheelers, uh, six, sixteen-wheelers for trucks and buses? Exactly. We need... Uh uh, to get a proper stab stabilized prediction, we need obviously a lot of data. So currently we are doing experiments, we are doing experiments with different cars because uh, see, uh, our data always depends on the car, uh, the vehicle's suspension also. Suppose a car having good suspension, obviously in that case, we will get less vibration data. So constantly we are working like uh, of uh, placing the hardware where the hardware can be placed to get the maximum smoothest data we can obtain. And then we are like doing other experiments also with different cars and we are just currently uh, getting the data and doing experiments. 
it's not been completed that's why i i don't have enough specific numbers that that's why i can't able to show you right now yeah great and another point uh, in your financial model you have practically uh, shown all the possible options with uh, government tie up and the subscription and everything but uh, have you thought of any uh, app, uh, have you uh, been have you thought of any uh, tie up or have you uh, thought of approaching the car manufacturers yeah we thought it in second stage because uh, firstly we want a lot of data and we need a stable system then only we can approach to car manufacturers right because if they see our system doesn't have enough data points or it can't able to predict that so they might not accept us so we thought firstly we will do uh, like little testing maybe with our own test vehicles we will get enough data points enough roads explored then we can head towards uh, collaborating with car manufacturers yeah but uh, uh, before you approach government because government only uh, they will recognize once this is vetted by the car manufacturers because today there are uh, for the particularly for uh, vehicles or private usage there are a lot of safety features are al already integrated so your feature can be a boost for them as well the oems and manufacturers so sure. you can harness uh, that option also in, a, in a parallel route surely and uh, again i am repeating that your uh, concept is uh, excellent and you must uh, be thinking of uh, going for patent through yeah. your uh, institution exactly it it this concept uh, must be patented exactly firstly we need to uh, develop algorithm like we are currently working on it so we might file a provisional patent in uh, within few months then we will after developing development is completed then we will go for the final patent and what is the development cost of the entire app uh, app actually as we are enthusiast we developed it ourselves so currently we didn't face any development cost except that uh, hosting cost of our cloud server we have used here google firebase so it's uh, currently we are using the free version but it might cost around 5000 rupees for up to 1000 uh, users or 5000 users yeah 1000 users basically 5000 rupees for 1000 users for one year and the hardware cost hardware currently we are working on it see our um, we will like to show you our prototype okay. show the prototype this is the basic prototype okay so can you zoom okay so this is the basically prototype and uh, obik just show the external attachment Just wait a second. And uh, this is the IMU sensor. As you can see, this is the IMU sensor. This is just a one inch by one inch size module. It can be placed anywhere in the car and mainly preferred is dashboard. And this is basically the hardware. Okay. So these two are the hardware. So for this, per, uh, the, what, the thing which we have developed, it costed around 2,500 rupees. But uh, it having some limitations like that camera can't proceed higher FPS images. So it would be a bit difficult while the car is moving very fast. That's why we are thinking to upgrade the camera system. And uh, we're having an approximation that our final hardware will cost around uh, 8,000 rupees like that because it need to do uh, live processing on the board that's what thank you thank you so much any other questions i have a question um, are you processing the uh, images live as we uh, go on the road exactly we are processing the image live if that is the case then you would need a very high availability of internet in even rural roads or any road uh, is that possible uh, uh, could you please repeat the question once like again? If you are processing the images live, then you would need high availability of internet even in uh, rural roads, right? Uh, exactly. So what we are doing, we have just currently uh, did one TensorFlow light model which can process offline. Uh, we have trained the model. It can get the data. It will process. If 
it got like uh, pothole got detected it will fetch the um, coordinates like gps coordinates then it will send it to our server and for that processing we currently we are uh, we don't need any active internet connection and suppose you can say like i went through a road where uh, there was many potholes but there were no internet connection so those datas will be saved and as soon as you uh, connect to the internet back again it will be updated in our server uh, what? Uh, yeah, currently, currently we did on uh, laptop, and we are uh, trying to do on the ESP32 CAM, but it is quite uh, like it's can't able to process the whole thing because of limited hardware capability. So we are constantly working on that to optimize the whole thing. I had for another question, rather. I, I think thanks for all the questions, but. Unfortunately, we have to stop here, but you can always talk to them uh, offline. Uh, but uh, one thing I would like to really mention with my, you know, probably 27 years of experience with uh, working with the leading product companies in the world, both startups and the large, uh, it is really heartening to see the few people from this, uh, in an engineering college coming out with this kind of idea, which is not just very simple. I think they need a big hand. And I would, I, I really also appreciate the kind of questions that have come up because that will help them to really think forward because, you know, product development is just not a, such a simple thing. It's much complex than an application development. So product development perspective, I think the questions and the suggestions I would suggest that if any one of you have any other questions, please, you know, work with uh, Angana and the team, send it to them, any guidance, any suggestions, any idea on the business model, that will help them, motivate them to stay focused and they do things. So, uh, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. I Thank think you, you guys have done a great job. Stay focused, but as I was telling you the other day, find one reason why people will use your system. Not five reasons, one reason. And Obvious. then your product will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks sir. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Uh, we are really happy that we have been able to I mean, conclude this year's BITC with such a promising session. And um, I would request Mr. Shomnath Nag to please present tokens of your appreciation to our uh, speakers and their mentor on the dais. I would request Mr. Onindo Dash, VP Marketing Infinity Group and uh, member of Bengal Chambers IT Committee to please come to the dais and present token of our appreciation to Mr. Shomnath Nag. But as I mentioned, Shomnath is also our IT Committee member and we are really very, uh, we really appreciate that he has come all the way from Bangalore and join us here. So this is our expression of gratitude to Shomnath. So please enjoy the, uh, the evening, um, beer and kebab. I think it is, already, it is already on. And please have your interaction with the speakers, with, this, with the students of NIT and also the other speakers offline. Thank you.